Madrid. Civilization here is almost as old as the game of chess. Some claim the queen was given her powers to honor Queen Isabella. That, my friends, is a chess legacy. Passion for chess continues to thrive in Madrid. For the first time in 30 years, Spain's capital plays host to the candidates, the most important tournament in chess. At the Palace of Santona, the stakes are high. Eight of the world's best players competing for the right to challenge for the most coveted title in chess, the World Chess Championship. The candidates is grueling. The winner requires mental endurance and unbreakable focus. There are those familiar with the biggest stages in chess, yet still chasing unfinished business. And others from the next wave of stars with little patience for yielding to those before them. Mis amigos, the next challenger to the world champion of chess must come through Madrid. Like Queen Isabella before them, the candidates is all about leaving a legacy. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Madrid. Here we see the beautiful Palacio de Santonia. This is day two of the 2022 B-Day Candidates, Chess.com's exclusive coverage. We'll continue, of course, throughout all three weeks. And the uh, paintings inside the palace are about as hot as the weather outside. Different type of hot. The chess was hot yesterday. We get our first view of the playing hall. Players, of course, will be filling in momentarily. And we will, we will be here and watching them take their seats when that action happens. But right now, we're going to welcome you to the seats we have. Of course, we start all the way on my left here. The one and only Grandmaster, Jan Ludwig Hammer from Norway. The one and only Almira Skripchenko, International Master. And we are here to bring you our coverage, starting with you, Hammer. How, how are you feeling today for day two? Actually, I'm not feeling that great, Danny. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, a, a little <laughs> hot. Uh, in this uh, Madrid weather. It, it's 40 degrees outside. Have you noticed, Danny? I could not. I, I have not stopped sweating all day. Okay. I don't know what that's in freedom numbers, but it's caused <laughs> some serious problems for me. So I'm, I'm just hoping to it, get through this day. It's a lot of freedom numbers, and it's muggy. Yeah, Almira, but how, how are you dealing with the heat? Well, I think that I started to tame the heat a little bit. Okay. I'm feeling a little bit better, but I'm feeling more like a chess player now, you know? I will tell you a small story. How, how does it go? Uh, I think everyone will relate to it, especially it's so hot, so you are waking up during the night and you want to drink some water, so yeah. I was trying to find it, you know? And I tried to go through my mirror. Literally, it was like oh. going through the, like, uh, like Alice, you know? It was one of my favorite books, so I was like... <laughs> As someone who has run full steam into a glass door more times in his life than he's comfortable admitting on camera, I know the pain of that. It hurts when you <laughs> fully go through something that you think is clear. So, so I was going through the looking glass, yeah. yes. <laughs> All right, well, uh, looking in a mirror, here we're looking at the faces again. These gentlemen don't mind looking at a mirror when they see that beautiful face looking back at them. For those who may be just tuning in, where were you on day one? But meet our participants once again. Eight amazing players from around the world. Two from America. We see they faced off yesterday with Fabiana Karwana getting a win. Jan Nepomnishi of Russia got the victory with the black pieces over Ding Li Ren. Hammer, looking at, at the, uh, the faces here, what, what, uh, what's one of the things you can say about just how strong this field is, how incredible these eight players are? I mean, this is the, the top tournament in chess. We're, we're trying to find a challenger. Yeah. And I think one of the best ways of illustrating how crazy good this field is, is by also mentioning some of the players who didn't qualify here to yeah. Madrid. Who would, who, who's on the top of your list of players that you feel deserves to be here? Maybe, deserve is a hard word, but who are some names you, you think you know are watching this event? Hi, hi at home. Right, I'm wishing they're here. <laughs> well, from the top of my head, uh, Levon Aronian, okay. uh, Maxime Vachelagraf. I should also mention Anish Giri. Uh, okay, should well, I? <laughs> fun fact, she didn't mention Anish Giri in the rehearsal, and I was going to call you out for that, Anish. So shout out to you, Anish. But I called him Amir out. All right, let's we talk about the eight players uh, and, and, and saw them. Now let's look at where they stand in the standings. Yanda Pomnishi and Fabiana Caruana, of course, the only two victors from day one. 
four players sitting at half a point as those two boards were drawn respectively, giving all four players the point five. Dingley Ren and Hikaru Nakamura, of course, we know both both suffered tough defeats. We'll see how they bounce back today. Uh, Hammer, your your thoughts on the biggest takeaway from day one? Well, I mean, I, I it has to be Jan Nepomniachtchi. Yeah. Uh, the challenger who failed, uh, but now he's back. And in the first round, with the black pieces, he beats the highest rated player in Dingley Ren. What a start for him. Amir, your biggest. Well, of course, this is a huge surprise. First of all, Dingley Ren almost never loses with white. So yeah. it's a huge achievement. Uh, but I have to... Um, well, I have to say that Fabio won a very fine strategical game against uh, Hikaru Nakamura. It was a very complicated game, and it seemed that, you know, uh, at some point Hikaru could even play for, yeah. for an advantage. But at the end, you know, uh, it was a very fine technical win for Fabio. Well, speaking of that fine technical performance by Fabio Nakarawana, our own Dina, Dina Belenkaya caught up with Fabio after his victory. No. You and Hikaru have the most head-to-head matchups amongst any of other two players here. Is that true that familiarity breeds contempt? <laughs> I didn't expect that question. Um, yeah, I, I was actually surprised. I saw the, the statistics and we played, what was it, 33 draws and uh, 13 decisive games. Uh, so I, yeah, it's, it's quite, <laughs> quite a lot of, of chess, but we haven't played too often recently, um, partially because of the pandemic and after 2020, over the board tournament stopped a bit and Hikaru became a bit less active. Uh, and we started playing a lot of rapid and blitz chess, on, especially online, but uh, it almost doesn't feel familiar to play over the board chess against Hikaru. Well, in the past, uh, every tournament we would play uh, one game. Getting back to the game, uh, where was the point that you realized that you were actually playing for two results and were pretty safe? Well, I, I was very pleased when he castled short because I thought if he tries to put his king on, on the queen side either by king d7 or maybe by a waiting move like h4, then it's a very complicated position and it's not, in, it's not entirely safe for white. Although I, I didn't think I was ever any worse. But after castle short, I just have a very pleasant small advantage, uh, maybe even more than a small advantage. And it seemed like the advantage grew and grew. And then at some point I was worried that I was again uh, you know, going to screw up a one game because I, I had this clean win right before the time control. I moved 40 with queen f4, and I didn't see it. And then after the time control, I saw it, but I tried to get back to it. But uh, of course, Hikaru avoided it by playing bishop d7. And then it was super tough again to, uh, to try to win this. And uh, let's say, when was the point that you knew that you were going to win anyway? Um, well, I, I was just kind of shocked by queen h6. Uh, that was the moment when I, I was sure that white should be winning. I thought black could play queen g4, and then I was going to play queen e1 to keep the queens on. Um, and I thought it should be winning, but it's not, still not easy. And after queen h6, I thought it, it just it looks terrible. Like after rook e1, he probably has to exchange his bishop for the knight, but that, that looks dead lost. Uh, so then I, I felt I was totally winning. Would you have preferred to be facing your only countryman in later rounds, or let's say, was Hikaru a good opponent for round one? Well, I, I can say this with hindsight, <laughs> based on the result. Um, but I, I, I didn't really have any preference before the tournament. I also knew um, that I would play Hikaru. Um, this is the standard, um, the standard system that the players from the same country play in the in the first uh, and the eighth game because of you know. Of course, no, no player in the tournament would do this, but just in case of potential collusion, the countrymen don't, you know, don't ever face in a, in a super critical game. Um, so it wasn't even on my mind whether, you know, Hikaru was a, a preferable opponent for the first game or for later games because... I it's, it's interesting, Amir, that the point that Dina asked Bobby was a point we've been talking a lot about. So uh, now that you've beaten your countrymen, I guess you're not so worried about the pairings. But remind everybody why people from the same country play in the early rounds again. Well, they, they play in the first round or in the earlier rounds because we are trying to avoid collusion. And of course, we had some historical precedents. Right. And just, I think it's just fair to other players. It's right. important, you know. So, uh, well, in, in the, at the end of the tournament, so you wouldn't worry about, well, different results. Yeah. Fisher, on the 50th, the 50th Curacao, anniversary yes. of the Fisher Spassky match, we're speaking of Bobby Fisher, his accusations of uh, collusion against the Russians. How would Fisher do in this field? 
Um, I mean, he would be one of the favorites, probably. Really? Uh, it's a hot take, I think. You think? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people who consider Fisher one of the top three players of all time. Okay. But you don't think he would be able to adjust to modern computers? I think he would be, I guess, with time. Uh, whether he would fit into this group of eight elite is interesting. So just, I thought I'd throw a curveball at you. Speaking of this elite group of eight, let's remind everybody who may just be tuning in how the eight players got here as we watch this video that explains the path each one of them took on their way here to Madrid. It's, it's the most important tournament in chess. Taking place every two years, the candidates qualifies the victor to challenge the reigning world champion in a World Chess Championship title match. The 2022 candidates will feature eight of the world's best chess players. They've all earned their spots through two years of fierce competition. They now head to Madrid, Spain, where everything will be settled over the board. One of those eight spots is always reserved for the previous World Chess Championship challenger. Jan Nepomnishi would love nothing more than a second chance at the throne but he has to get through seven other great players in Madrid first. Two spots went to the top finishers of the most prestigious open chess tournament in the world, the FideChess.com Grand Swiss. Ali Reza Perugia won the Grand Swiss, turned the heads of everyone in doing so, and has become the youngest player in history to cross the 2800 ELO rating barrier. He would become the youngest world chess champion of all time should he win the candidates and ultimately the world chess championship match. Fabiano Caruana joined him, taking the other spot from the Grand Swiss. The U.S. number one and third highest rated player in the history of our game is also the only person to never lose a classical chess game to Magnus Carlsen in a World Chess Championship match. Two of the spots were claimed by the winners of the dramatic 2022 FIDE Grand Prix cycle. Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura is a former world number two, a blitz and bullet chess legend, and the most popular chess streamer in the world. He was joined by GM Richard Rapport. The Hungarian number one is one of the most creative and dangerous minds in the game today, and nobody is looking forward to facing him in Madrid. FIDE awarded one of the eight spots to the wildcard invite Grandmaster Tamor Rajaba. Raja missed the 2021 candidate cycle in consideration of COVID concerns. But as the oldest, most experienced player in the field, he's looking to use that knowledge and punch his ticket to the World Chess Championship title match. And finally, two spots go to the top two finishers of the world's largest knockout tournament, the absolutely grueling FIDE World Cup. Jan Krzysztof Duda, the Polish number one, punched his ticket by ousting none other than world champion Magnus Carlsen in the semifinals of that event. Duda would ultimately defeat Karyakin in the final to win the World Cup. However, Karyakin, due to suspension from play by FIDE, sees his spot go to China's number one, Grandmaster Ding Li Ren. Ding Li Ren takes the spot due to being the highest rated eligible player according to the May 2022 FIDE rating list. So that's how each of our eight competitors earned their bids to Madrid. Inside the Palace of Santona, it's about who can sustain the mental endurance to secure the coveted slot as challenger for the world title. But we're not sure who that will be just yet. We do know this. We'll enjoy watching every minute of the candidates with the chess.com community as we see how the most important tournament in chess plays out together. And that is how our eight players got here to compete in the candidates. Let's remind everybody quickly what the candidates format is. It's a double round robin for those eight players. That means you play each player twice, one with each color. The winner, of course, challenges the world champion, as has been talked about many times. If Carlson were to decline the championship opportunity, the top two finishers in this event would compete. Of course, we'll remind everybody of the context behind that particular point as the day goes on again. It involves maybe, maybe one particular birthday boy we can get into. Uh, we, we have players coming into the hall and so I think uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll tune in with them here and make sure that we, we capture those moments how, how early do you want to get to the hall if you're if you're playing an event like this hammer is it helpful to get the nerves out the earlier you sit down or do you are you a last-minute arrival um, well I, I went the Magnus Carlson school of chess uh, and he likes to get there at the very last moment 
Uh, I would maybe calculate a bit more time, but like five, uh, seven minutes before would be optimal. Okay, Elmira? Well, actually, I think there is a very nice historical example um, given by David Bernstein. You know, he was always coming to his game like 10 minutes in advance, and he sat there silently uh, getting ready for the game. So I really like this approach. And I think that players have their own rituals. They yep. stick to them. It's like whatever it takes, you know, to, to get say, into the playing mode. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think I was an early arrival to get myself in the meditative zone, if you will. But regardless of when you prefer to arrive to the game, we have the games to preview. So let's, let's talk about the particular matchups that we see. By the way, shout out to chat. I saw Tipsy Ton agreeing with me that uh, maybe Fisher would get smoked, but I think most people agreed with you, Hammer, that Fisher would be a favorite in this. So anyway, we'll keep an eye on you, chat, um, and uh, we appreciate you playing along with that Bobby Fisher question. So let's play along with the field. Rapport versus Perugia. Happy birthday to Ali Reza Perugia, Almira. You want to... Did you say you wanted to sing happy birthday? Was that what you said <laughs> or not quite? Well, I wanted first of all, of course, to congratulate the birthday boy. I know how difficult it is to play on your birthday. Yeah. And he's starting the tournament with two blacks. Uh, so this is also a very important test for him. And he's playing against uh, Richard Report, yeah. who is also such a creative player. So like, it would be a big bang today on yeah. the board. I, like, it, I it expect should be a never fight, less. Right? Never less Rapport yes. versus Perugia on his birthday. What about the next matchup of the two oldest players in the field, Nakamura versus Rajab Offhammer? Well, Nakamura has something to avenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, these white games are precious. Yeah. Uh, so he's going to want to uh, put pressure on his opponent. But Rajabov is infamously difficult to beat. Uh, and, and the stats kind of showcase that. That even though Nakamura has the advantage in heads-up play, there are a lot of draws uh, between them. Yeah. Well, of course, we have two other games to, to talk about as well. But before the action kicks off, we want to quickly remind everybody that they can head over to chess.com to cast their vote. Uh, I'm going to do it in real time. I'm actually going to go and predict a victory for the birthday boy with the black pieces in a wild slugfest versus report. I think he, uh, I think he holds on. I'm going to predict that Hikaru Nakamura bounces back, gets a victory with white, Two decisive predictions so far. I'm going to leave this one last. Jan Christoph Duda and Ding Li Ren are going to get a draw. That's my vote. And then lastly, we have Karwana and Jan Nepomnishi. I'm going to shock the world here and also predict a draw. Just kidding. Uh, leaders, leader, I don't think this will be as, as spicy of a game as we want. And I think that the players in the early lead will be happy with a peaceful result. Remember, everybody, you can go to chess.com slash events or just use the command vote. You'll get a direct link in chat no matter where you're watching from. Head over, cast your boat to take your piece in some cash prizes, some premium membership giveaways. We see a lot of people doing it. So far, about 1,300 votes cast. This is your chance. You can vote still up to about move five, I think, allows. So even if the moves are played, don't miss your chance. And uh, go, ahead and go ahead and do it. Here we've got uh, Nepomdashi and Karwana. How many chances do you think he will take with the white pieces, Almira? Well, actually, I disagree with you okay, on, uh, okay, on, I like that. on the result, and uh, if I may. I, I love and, that. I, and I really think that uh, Jan will uh, try to seize the momentum, and he will try to win with white, especially that, uh, well, I've looked at their games. And uh, Fabi uh, has some issues in the opening, so he... So, I'm really curious, uh, first of all, to see uh, what's going to be his opening choice today. Um, Jan Nepomnishi also um, chooses sometimes, like, it could be the Petrov, it could be the Italian game. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very interesting game ahead of us. Okay, Nepomniachi does have a lot of preparation from his World That's, Championship yeah. match against Magnus Carlsen. Now seems the opportune moment. Uh, to use some of the, those uh, weaponry he didn't get to use. You know, that's a, that's a great point, Hammer, and I think that uh, we, we forget sometimes how, how much preparation just never gets used in a match, right? And that you can see players winning games for, for you know, years to come later for preparation from a previous World Championship match. As someone who was a second for Magnus Carlsen in 2013 in Chennai and 2014, how often did you see Magnus use prep in other tournaments that he didn't get to play against Vichy in both those matches? Well, my, my biggest memory of that was when Magnus beat Vladimir Kramnik in the Norway Chess 2016 tournament, yeah. uh, where Magnus used a, a novelty in a very strategic line 
uh, that we had prepared for one of the world championship matches. Yeah. And it just ended in a very clean win for Magnus. And he was so thrilled about it that he went into the Norway Chess Special Confessional booth <laughs> where you can talk about the <laughs> yeah. game while it's going on. Yeah. And Magnus said, this is actually Hammer's idea. And so oh, I, I, was, I was so proud. Remember, everybody, you can vote. Those are the cash prizes. Just last second call out. This is your chance. If it reaches move five, you don't get to vote in this round. So hurry. Go to chess.com. Go.chess.com slash FWC vote. We have E4 played. Notice I, Almira is pointing at me. I, I'm going to give her the mic here because she wants to point out that there was a troll that happened there. Well, of course, first uh, D4 was played. Yeah, that's what I meant, that troll. He said uh, D4 to the person, but he played E4. So, I, and, uh, so he, you see, the psychological war has started. Yeah. And we like we have to mention probably one, our last game, uh, with young Krzysztof Duda, who is playing with the white pieces against yeah. Ding Liren. And I think that, well, he, he's playing his second game with white. It's very important for him to score in this situation, I think, especially that uh, Ding Liren lost yesterday. So uh, the first round is a clear indicator in what kind of form you are. So uh, I'm not sure that Ding is feeling well for the moment. So mm -hmm. he um, he still has to um, well to find the feel of the pieces, if I may say. So and also recently, I think that uh, young Krzysztof Duda became a real like Polish sweetheart, if I may say. Like everyone is uh, following his games, and uh, so everyone is supporting him. Yep. I think the whole country is behind no, him. No, he really. It's not. I don't know if it's quite Carlson Norway comparisons yet, but it really is. I, I can speak that we've we've had many contacts with lots of different major media uh, outlets in, in Poland about about covering young Christoph Duda. And here is our here's our bird's eye view. Just take a take a quick snapshot. These will be the four games we cover in great detail today. Something I instantly observe is that we have two Italians. Uh, the A5 variation employed by Dingli Ren versus young Christoph Duda. We have an A6 approach by Fabi against Jan Nepomishi. Hammer, what else jumps out to you as we look at all four games in progress? Well, that was going to be my comment, Danny. Very interesting to see the same opening on two boards. And then Ding, he chooses to go with the pawn two steps forward, uh, whereas Fabiano Carana settles for just one step. Uh, but the idea in both cases is to create an escape route for the bishop. Yep. Uh, and in fact, that's what Fabiano just did. Yep. Uh, if we go zoom in yeah, on we'll, we'll, uh, his we'll point. dive into that game. Agreed. Let's l keep going, Hammer, not trying to interrupt, because I, I wanted, if you could, to maybe elaborate on the, the differences between Ding Li Ren's A5. Yes, of I course, know. as you said, it frees up a retreat for the bishop, but it also controls a little bit of White's eventual space expansion, whereas A6, a more flexible move, frees up the bishop, but, but doesn't prevent White from doing what uh, he or she would like to do over here. So your thoughts on that? Um, this is a nuance in the Italian opening that is kind of old rage at the moment. People haven't really settled on whether they think pushing the pawn once or twice is the better choice. Yeah. And that's why it's so interesting here to see uh, Carana with the black pieces uh, going for a different variation than Ding Li Ren, because these two are uh, two of the top players in the mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. They are famed for their openings, uh, and they have different opinions uh, on this um, on, on this nuance. Yeah. Your thoughts, Almir, on, you know, we know how well Fabi is prepared in general. We talk a lot about it as white, but he, as black, sitting down against someone who he knows, Fabi's also played a world championship match. He knows Jan is bringing a lot of home cooking to the table, right? Is there some thoughts on why he would choose a more flexible approach with these A6 and H6 to avoid that prep? Well, let's say for me, it's a more classical approach. Okay. It's almost like a, a philosophical way, you know, to choose. Like right. I5, A5, A5. <laughs> I5 is also something you can say. <laughs> it's a chip processor, yeah. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's, it's a modern approach in the Joko Piano. So I, I really like uh, this setup because... So what he, the? Oh, exactly. What the, is going on? That's exactly what I wanted to say because he's, uh, he, it allows you to play H6, G5. Yeah, well, so. and did everyone see the shrug? Like he, like he just went and brushed his shoulder off. Jan's like, all right, I, I, I ain't stressed about it. Although I'm a little surprised that you committed to the most aggressive option 
on the board. And Fabiano, he plays this same G5 move that was Hikaru's downfall yesterday. Yeah. So he's saying kind of also to Hikaru, yeah, this didn't work for you, but when <laughs> I play it, then uh, I'm, I'm going to create an well, attack in a better fashion than, than you manage. Well, and, and let's talk about, there is, it, it is sort of an evolving idea that we have seen more and more modern Italians go this way for black, and, and that one of, the, one of the things about h6, we think about it historically as guarding the g5 square, whether for the bishop or the knight. But the other idea we've seen, but it mostly occurs though, I'm so excited that I can't get the words out of my mouth. It usually occurs after h3, right? Because once the pawn is on h3, you have what's called an anchor. So when you advance g5 and g4, you're going to be forcing open lines. For someone to play g5 when there is no target yet, that's why Jan was surprised by this. And I, I, I don't know officially whether this is a novelty yet. It is not. So it's not a novelty, but clearly at this level, it has taken Jan by surprise because, again, you normally see it only once the pawn has touched the square. Your thoughts on the risks of this, Elira? Well, this is so double-edged, but I'm not sure because I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, some of the uh, young seconds play this. If we, can we click on B4? Because I think, I'm not sure if Peter Swidler or Nikita Vitigov played this game. Uh, how is, uh, do we have access to the database? Night so, H7, maybe? Yeah, we, see, we see you chat, by the way. We love you. That is, it is funny. So, all right, we'll go, go ahead, continue. And I'm not, I just, uh, usually I have my computer, so I, I, I'm not, because yesterday, for example, what happened in the game uh, against Duda and Report, then later on, you know, I cannot sleep, yeah. so I was watching the games, and actually Report played this move, Bishop F4. So it's also very important to know the history, yeah. and if the player plays this variation with both colors, so he knows the nuances very well. And I'm just, I cannot remember uh, Fabiana playing this. So is this a surprise, a uh, real yeah, surprise I, for Jan? And, and what aggression. Yeah. Uh, incredible play from Fabiano. Trying to go for the two out of two score with the black pieces. I mean, we've seen some amazing aggression this tournament. Yep. Yesterday, it was Ali Reza Ferruja and, and, and Richard Rapport. Um, and, and today it just continues. These players are willing to take a risk. Uh, I don't know if it's because they're concerned they're going to, you know, stroke out from the heat or, or whatever. They <laughs> that's just a, that's get... our concern. <laughs> <laughs> i got to get a lead now before I, before I pass out in the back half of the tournament. For, for those wondering, so this has been played before. The main move for white is B4, uh, which has been played the mass majority of the time. Uh, I, I think one of the main points is that if black plays aggressively with g4, yeah, you can, you can bring the knight to this f5 square. So I, I'd be curious to see if b4 is played, whether Fabi goes for the main move that has been played here for kind of allowing a, a rather obvious idea, or whether he has something special in store for Jan. Everyone remembers how he started off the back half of the candidates with well, that huge well, win in novelty course, versus yes. Maxime Bache Le Grave. Okay, b4 is on the board, so we're going to find out very soon what Carwana has planned. So probably he's testing his preparation. Uh, well, I will use the break later on to check like yeah. my analysis as well. But I th also think that also shows, well, how performant Fabi is with white and black pieces. You yeah. know, he is uh, seizing any opportunity, any chance to, well, wow, to win the game. Wow, he plays a, a, a completely new move. Is that right, Danny? Uh, indeed. Was that on the list? It is. Night G4 has never been played before, and now he on really leans back, takes a sip of water, looks up, and says, I'm really glad this water's cold. This is scary for Jan Nepomniachtchi. He could be facing an early defeat here. The line goes rook to e2, and Fabiano is going to sacrifice his knight for that white pawn. Uh, the rook will recapture, and then maybe pawn to g4. And I thought this was the sensible way of playing for uh, Fabiano because the difference between playing that pawn forward earlier yeah. and doing it now is that the white, uh, black queen is controlling the square white's knight wanted to use. Uh, however, uh, the engine is very unhappy with my suggestion, so I will uh, go back and well, I, I, I want to point thinking. out because one of the main ideas is kind of instructive. It's this move d4 because once the rook is unpinned, now it's white who's threatening things like bishop takes f7 and all kinds of just crazy firepower coming out. So, okay, either way, what a fascinating game we are about to have in store, everyone. So if you had other plans on this Saturday, Saturday it's time to change the schedule, as they say, and stick <laughs> with us 
Amir, what was the point you wanted to make right there? Well, I just wanted, uh, I totally agree that sac this sacrifice is in the air, but I wanted to do it. Always the f6 square because at rook e2 or rook f1, I wanted first to play queen f6 mm -hmm. using, uh, first of all, this opportunity because the knight can no longer go to knight c3, knight d5. Usually, you well, you don't have this opportunity very often. And then to sacrifice on f2 and play g4. You know, this sacrifice is, well, is always there. So, and maybe you're not allowing the immediate d4. I don't know, like. I, I like it a lot. Um, and again, Amir's point is, now when the capture happens in g4, it's not just that the knight can't go to h4, as Hammer said, but no matter where the knight goes, there's material being lost. So I, I, I just want to go for the most forcing... Okay, so rook e2. Uh, I don't want to go for the more forcing one. I want to do what Almir mm -hmm. is doing. I want to do queen f6. But um, that's okay, Danny. I won't hold it against you. <laughs> you I, I don't know, Hammer. I love the idea, but I think... You know, you're feeling a little hot here. We know yeah. in Madrid you might be getting a little too hot on the board here. Yeah. Can I try another line just and then we can go to another game? Because I know that this is also a standard procedure, okay. like queen f6. Yeah. You can still go d4, and then I used it in one of my games, and you go e5 if you yeah. take. Is yeah, this yeah. possible? This is a typical kind of thematic way to break open the center when your opponent's king has uh, chosen not to castle. The but main point is that on D takes E, for example. There's, okay, there's all kinds oh. of weird stuff here, but like this is a move. Oh, even this is a move, of course. So there are a lot of tactical possibilities yeah. in this position. So uh, I'm pretty sure that Fabi has it all analyzed. Yeah, and I'm not sure that Jan Nepomniachi does. Yeah. We see him on the camera kind of agonizing right now. If he was very familiar with this position, he would have moved already. Yeah. And, and like he's not going to take that risk to yeah. sacrifice one or even two pawns in the middle of the board when he knows Fabiano is not his opponent right now. Right. Uh, Jan's opponent is the, the chess en engine. Yeah. And, and that is that is terrifying because chess engine's got some game. <laughs> chess engine's got some <laughs> game. I love. It. No, it, it is really important that ever, that we appreciate that Jan is going to really be careful here because, as as uh, Hammer just said, right? You're not just playing the person across, but you're playing their seconds, maybe multiple seconds. You're playing everyone's favorite second these days, which is an Alpha Zero Leela plugged into a super jet engine computer and whatever it pumps out. This is this is a. Uh, this, this is, is very scary. Well, this is a valid hypothesis, but as Jan Ludwig, he loves to say, could this also be a sort of a psychological display? Right. But, well, actually, he knows the variation. He's just trying to remember it. And not playing instantly might actually induce Fabi, you know, to, well, to think that he's on the top. I don't know. I just <laughs> I speculate all the time on things, and I'm often wrong. But no, it's okay. I will say this to your point, right? Obviously, regardless of the hype and the excitement, we see a novelty on the board. We know we're in for a fight. This is what we pay for. White is still fine. Like objectively, the computer says that white should be fine here. And again, probably rook e2 or rook f1 are both playable. This idea of d4 is certainly a thematic way to change the structure and block the bishop. If Jan figures it out, it's not like he's losing here, but. But it's still very scary. But should, like, well, can we try to play d4 immediately? Then? Right away? Well, it certainly probably has more value after queen f6 because the queen is awkwardly placed there. And then we can use the momentum and play d4. But maybe d4 even okay. here and then. We'll look at it. d4, ed. And what? I mean, I, I think it might be a very interesting move. <sighs> it's just that the psychology of the game, there's no way Jan Nepomniachi can can dare right. play such a move right. unless he's prepared to to his teeth. Ah, and yes. right now there are no teeth showing uh, on Jan Nepomniachi. If anything, he s seems compon uh, yeah whatever that word is, um, and and not that uh, spry. Right. Maybe simply take here because you see the diagonal is open. Bishop B two is coming. Maybe we can sacrifice this one. Yeah, I, I kind of like. I mean. Uh, I, I don't even know what's going to happen, but I just want to flip the script and go all in on a gambit. Look at this. I mean, See, this is... But F2 is still hanging. I'm really very F2 scared. F2 is, but of course, F7 and H8 would be hanging for black <gasps> in return. Look at the computer saying this is equal. Oh, my God. I'm... You know what? Go bleep yourself, Stockfish. You know what? This is... I, I, I can't even... This is crazy. I, I, I think you're right, Hammer. I think that regardless of whether he goes for D4 or Rookie 2 or Rook F1, 
He, he probably is not sitting here across from Fabi thinking, you know what, I'm going to go for the sharpest thing I can find. Because he clearly is surprised. He knows that Fabi has prep here. He may not have a choice but to go for something super spicy, it, but I don't think that's, that is his first choice. That's exactly what I wanted to say. Is to say unfortunately, the, uh, like the character of the position uh, does not allow you like, to place something safe. And right. that's ex exactly why Fabi is choosing uh, this variation. Oh, but man. on the other hand, is there a more scary thing than Jan Nepomniachtchi on a winning streak? Like, we've been talking so much about this guy being moody and, and that he, um, uh, he, when he first loses, uh, it often follows another loss. Um, but also, the reason he was the challenger last time yeah. is because when he wins, he wins not just once, but twice right. and three times. Yep. So it's, it's such an interesting choice from Fabiano, putting the maximum pressure. Uh, and yeah, the, the queen to f6 is on the board. And uh, I mean, Nepomniachtchi has to yeah. be nervous right now. This line hasn't been played since the Swedish Open in 1895. Apologies, apologies there. I needed to lean in a little bit to, uh, to read the chat. Um, but yeah, I mean, so shout out to, fe to the feature chat there and the person who did a little research. Uh, of course, everything Hammer just said about Nepo, his style, the things that, uh, things that people know and love about him are his streakiness. And if he can keep on it, what will he be capable of? Let's remind everybody of all the wonderful things about Jan de Pomnesi and his path to Madrid. The defending champion Jan Nepomniachtchi is back at the candidates, affecting his second straight bid to challenge for the World Chess Championship. One of the more experienced players, Nepo brings to Madrid an aggressive style that is both challenging to face and entertaining to watch. Two years ago, Nepo made the most of his debut in the candidates. With a round to spare, he won the event in convincing fashion. That's all he needed. Jan Nepomniachtchi is the 2021 World Chess Championship challenger. That victory led Nepo to a World Championship match with Carlsen and also secured his return to the candidates in Madrid this year. Despite being one of only two players in the field to have won the candidates, the expectations for Nepo are not particularly high this time around. However, his confidence from having won here before in addition to his years of competitive experience may offer him a shot to turn some heads. If Nepo should pull a major upset and face Magnus Carlsen again, the two know each other well. Nepo has competed against Carlsen for decades ever since the two prodigies were 12 years old. And two world under 10 champion ahead of Magnus Carlsen. And that's where that picture was from. For the record, that's right. <laughs> two time Baby Russian pictures. champion, the European champion in 2010, a two time silver medalist. Jan de is, uh, he's got it all in that. Look at the last line former semi pro Dota player. I want to make sure that all of our fans watching, whatever, whatever platform you may be tuning in from, a lot of you might be Dota fans, and, and so is Jan de Pomnichi. Right now, he's uh, not a fan of the fact that he's been surprised by Fabiano Caruana. We see that Almira's, right? Hmm? right? Nice. Almi Almira's queen of six played <laughs> on the board. And uh, Fabi taking another walk, Hammer. Yeah, no, I mean, why would he sit there and use his energy right now? He's in his prep. And, and walking away from the table is also a way for chess players to, you know, establish a bit of dominance. Mm -hmm. He's like, I know you're going to have to think about this. a little bit. Yeah, uh, I don't need to be here. I'll let you sit thinking yeah. here for, for quite some time. And uh, I, I think that's also what we have to expect at this stage. Jan Nepomniachtchi uh, falling into some very scary preparation from Fabiano Caruana. And uh, yeah, he, he's going to... I mean, if I'm Jan Nepomniachtchi here, I'm, I'm already looking for like bailouts, possibilities to just clarify the position to a draw. Because yeah. I won the first round with the black pieces. I'm happy with my current standing. And I don't want to be blown away from the board uh, without Fabiano having to think about a single move. Just I, repeating the uh, engine's uh, suggestions. No, I don't think anybody wants to be blown away from the board. Uh, I no love matter what. this oh, We've visuals. got another featured chat. Incredible. 
Remember how Danny said, expect the game to not be as spicy as everybody wants? Um, indeed. Remember how chat never remembers the rare times I'm right. It always remembers when I'm wrong. <sighs> Elmira, let's change the subject. <laughs> let's change the subject. I think that uh, before Jan uh, finds uh, the most precise continuation in this position, we should just give uh, like an overview. Yeah. Overview of yeah, the let, let's, let's, let's head over to our bird's eye view to make sure, because this game is clearly going to get a lot of attention. We knew it was coming in because it is the matchup between the two early leaders. But there, there are four games in progress. Of course, you can go directly to chess.com, as you should, and just follow all the games and keep our commentary in the background. Again, that Italian with A5 between Duda and Dingley Ren, a completely different looking type of Italian. Um, where do you want to jump to? Well, let's, let's do a quick run through all three of the other games, because I know we're going to be spending a lot of time here. Uh, report Firuja. It's, okay. it's a very report interesting Report the birthday boy. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Was it the bishop B5? I oh, know, it's even queen D4 first. Okay. Those are the openings of my childhood. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to... Have a look at the d4, c4, queen d4. Let's do it. We had a queen d4 Sicilian. That's not an, that's not an early day opening. We don't see that early day at the top level. Bishop to b5, and they change on c6. And again, the typical reason you, have, you normally take with the knight is these are all the mainline Sicilians you would see, putting minor pieces in the center. To control the game is usually what you do. Why? Because the queen tends to get kicked around when she's out there too early playing with the kids. That means white has to part ways with the bishop pair if you want to keep the queen there. Otherwise, you got problems. And you get this very interesting imbalance in this, in this particular line of the Sicilian because white has a big center, a Meroxy bind structure to go with it, clamping down on important central breaks. But white has lost time with the queen and lost the bishop pair in order to get here, Hammer. Do you remember who else had this Maroxy pawn structure, those two white pawns controlling in towards the center? It was the game of Rickard Rapport. Uh, only he had the black pieces. Yeah. I feel like this situation is very similar to what Rapport played yesterday. Now, we no, remember. No, what Duda played yesterday, and then what Rapport played is black. It's the same thing. Oh, no? okay. So I wasn't meaning to correct you, I was just clarifying. Yeah, okay. I love you. Um, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So I'm thinking uh, that, well, Rapport, he wasn't very happy with how the opening went last time. Yep. He got in major trouble yep. uh, against the Polish player. And now he's kind of reversing it and saying, well, I kind of like this way of playing. I liked how the pawns were positioned. Yep. I'm going to play this way myself now that I have some experience from, from yesterday. And I just want to highlight, as a Sicilian player myself, I... I I wanted to highlight the big difference here for black is that once you've committed the e-pawn in a Sicilian, rarely can you fee and kettle that bishop and not regret it later because of what would be weak on d6. So it's an interesting maneuver to not do what you might often see here with the bishop. This knight is trying to get ahead of the game to the king side. One, because you have this pawn on e5, potentially allowing the f4 square to be available, but also because you no longer want g6 anyway. This bishop will be naturally developed to e7, where it defends your only real weak peshka on the open file, and that allows black to be safe, get out of the center, and maybe even play for a move like f5, as you generally want to attack in the direction of your pawn structure. So something like this, if we're just, one, enjoying the coloring on the board, and two, thinking about what exactly is black's plan with the, you always have to highlight whenever someone chooses to make two moves with a piece rather than just one natural looking development move, what exactly it is they're trying to achieve there, Elmira. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that I've played this position numerous times yeah. with white. Okay. So uh, it actually uh, leads to, to positions which are not so easy to understand, like for, especially for the players who, uh, who use the open Sicilian. So I suppose that uh, Richard didn't want to go for the neither, first of all. So it was a very uh, smart move to avoid mm -hmm. also a very sharp line and to bring it to the positions that uh, he feels maybe a bit better. So here, for, well, the first thing that comes to mind that I really want to get to the same structure like yesterday, so I want to play c5. You right. know, if given an opportunity, then if queen f5 doesn't work, then uh, this move is really possible. You right. should con that's the first move you should consider in this position in order to break this structure. So does it work? It's a, it's a really good question. You want to see if it works right now? Yes, I, I it. really want to okay. try it because uh, Jan Ludwig uh, pointed out that, for example, it's Queen A5 didn't work, work yesterday. yesterday because, like, 
you could uh, your pieces were getting so active. I'm not sure it's like maybe night maybe night d two and then night c four. Like I don't like what is the possibility here? Does Wild. this work? Yeah. G six is a threat. Bishop e three mm -hmm. is coming down. And then knight b six maybe, but uh, this should be. Uh, but, but maybe I can just push. Like how one of my, give my pawn back. favorite scientists would say that this requires a delicate piece of analysis. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to just say, and the position is unclear, which is the lazy man's version of saying, I have no idea what's going on here. Position uh, no, remains unclear. You should always uh, stay elegant, you yeah. know, in the way you, <laughs> well, it, you it's, express It's funny because that the unclear symbol itself in chess, for those who read chess notation, is this it, the sideways infinity symbol, right? Kind yes. of the game goes on. Mm -hmm. And there were many famous stories where people would end their analysis with an unclear symbol, even though they knew they knew what it was, but they didn't want to reveal all their analysis in the informant. There were some players who were who were particularly known for doing this, right, for ending the analysis early, even though they had the answer. Okay. So, story. so I'm a bit afraid. Like we were um, highlighting all of the plans in this position. So if you don't seize this uh, moment to play c5, then after if, after knight g6. Yeah. I think um, the position uh, will remain very unclear. Right. So no, it's a great point that this is this is maybe the critical decision that R Rapport is uh, thinking about right now because if we let Black do all those things that I was coloring about and F5 is achieved, mm -hmm. Black is in great shape. Black has the bishop here. The light square bishop that White lacks is is going to lead to great things on the king side. So so probably White has to make something happen to try to undermine this structure sooner rather than later. Okay. Let's let's. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sitting here inside. I just want to get back to the Nepom Nishi Karwana game. So that means let's go back to our bird's eye view and check in with the other four games again, so we can quickly uh, pay off some debt and look at look at. Uh, I want to check in with Hikaru Nakamura and Tamor Rajabov as soon as we can because uh, I'm sure many of the fans want to know that. So we're just going to jump right over there. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is uh, this is funny. Nakamura Rajabov has this. We have this game reversed because uh, Timur Ajabov wanted to play the Berlin defense. Yeah. And Hikaru's and like, no, thank you. Yes, he declined, like uh, Fabiana yesterday. D3 was played. It's uh, exactly the same opening. Bishop yeah. C5, only Hikaru, he didn't uh, go for the structure with Bishop C6. Uh, he went for another line, like Knight BD2, and a very rare continuation, Knight D4. Yeah, this Knight D4 line breaks so many principles. You move a piece twice in the opening, and then you're going to have to move your bishop a couple more times to go with it. But what's what's the main idea? What, how is Black able to justify such a loss of time for his development, Hammer? Um, it's because the the knight on c6, um, before it moved yeah. forward in the center, um, this knight is is one of um, Black's main issues in this Ruy Lopez uh, Spanish opening because White will very often play the move c3. Uh, which effectively shuts down uh, the knight's possibilities uh, forward. Um, and, and that's why when you get the chance to make the trade, you want to do that. Mm. And it's actually connected with some uh, tricky, tricky moves. Uh, because when you play a knight to d5, like Rajabov did, uh, after the trade, Hikaru did have the option here of playing the move knight f3. And this knight move attacks the bishop, trying to win the bishop pair, which is considered an advantage. Uh, and if the bishop runs away, the knight can take the pawn in the middle uh, instead. And then what was discovered about this situation? Uh, okay, apparently I'm wrong again. Uh, apparently queen e7 is a, a stunning move. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is that the position after castles... I just wanted to show the main thing is that if yeah. this happens, black... Has things like d5 and even well, knight g4 queen here. Queen b4 is queen b4. Oh, queen b4 yes. is with the piece. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, LOL. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, apparently that's just brilliant from black. But you can also play. There's a similar line. Yeah. Uh, where you, as black, just sacrifice that pawn in the center yeah. to just get really quick development. Like for instance, if uh, white here castles. Yeah. And then black castles. A white can take the pawn in the middle, but then pawn to d5, yeah. and, and black gets the initiative yeah. uh, by having some, some early threats. 
despite giving away a pump. And, and some awkwardly placed pieces for white, right? There's weird tactics when your pieces are undefended on the fifth rank. You can tell the computer likes a position when it's equal and you're down a pawn. So, yeah, really uh, well said there. Hikaru, as we, as we pointed out, though, did not play knight of three. He played c3 and has now played a very aggressive pawn push himself with the move d4. Uh, all right, we got to dive into what d4 is all about. Real quick, though, we want to give a quick shout out to the team from the other side of the block. The Chess Kid team is live here in Madrid with a, a very large staff. And if you're wondering what hiring a Chess Kid coach would look like, uh, you can wonder no longer. We've hired our own Chess Kid coach, American FIDE master James Canty, to help level up your game this summer. There are free live lessons at uh, chesskid.tv on a regular basis, Fridays at 6 p.m. Eastern. If you're looking to tune in for some more Canty content, a lot of people know the streamer James Canty on chess.com. Maybe you've got kids, nieces, nephews, grandkids, who knows? Tune in at 6 p.m. on Fridays for some Chess Kid free lessons. So, all right, let's get back to this game here. What were you going to say, Hammer, about D4? From yeah, no, the most interesting thing about this position is the fact that Hikaru has spent no time and Rajabo already spending uh, close to half an hour. So uh, Rajabo just uh, looking uh, poorly prepared in this line. I do believe this has all been played many times previously, mm -hmm. uh, which means that a player at, at Rajabov's level, uh, he should not be out of book. He should not be out of his, his openings here. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very surprised by that. Uh, and um, that tells me he's in for a, for a tough game. Okay, so maybe one prediction I made that Hikaru might win and bounce back could be could prove true. Any other yeah, thoughts here on there? Yeah, but you just jinxed it. Well, first of <laughs> all, I, I really like uh, Hikaru's position, and he's using one of like most typical ideas: the breakthrough in the center d4. He sacrifices the pawn, and uh, then e d4, e5 is is for for me is absolutely crushing. Yeah, and we'll just we'll show a little more of queen e7. You castle, you can't take the pawn because you lose the queen. And all kinds of all kinds of very very dangerous tactics. The one back thing there. that I wanted also uh, to share with you is that, uh, of course, when you can sleep, like I was wandering all over the internet, and I saw that Hikaru actually did like quite an extensive analysis of his yesterday's game, which he shared it with his community. Yeah. And I just find it uh, absolutely incredibly. So the player who is uh, playing the candidates uh, takes his time. Uh, probably it also maybe helps him grieve. You know, yeah. and so it's, just it's a start. Process, well, it's yeah. a healthy process, but uh, uh, as a professional chess player, just uh, yeah. it, it, it's I'm really admirative. Yeah, like, so. I'll give an additional shout out to it because you brought it up that Hikaru was also the only player who lost who actually he offered to come onto the show, and uh, we had a, we had a lot going on on day one, and, and we had Bobby coming on, so we we didn't invite Hikaru, but it was also admirable and very mature and like hey like I know I lost but do you guys want me on the show and he ultimately of course not only provided the content for his fans but like you said I think the process is, is healthy to relive the, the, the game that way and so maybe it's why Hikaru is feeling fresh and ready for another fight today so uh, so it's a new day it's, it's a, a new, new day dome. like you said a new tournament all right well there's only one other game we haven't checked on and that is Ding Li Ren and Jan Kristof Duda um, just just quickly Quickly looking at our bird's eye view, reminder, all four games in progress. We know that you will sometimes want to follow a game more closely than we have it. We can't follow all four games at once. So uh, quickly, quickly, we're going to go over here to JKD, the Polish with three names. People say the Frenchman with three names, with MBL, but no one, maybe, maybe JKD sounds too much like Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> no, the Frenchman. The How's your Jean-Claude Van Damme um, impersonation? You have to take me to the airport. I'm not yeah. sure I've watched any of his Okay, have you ever seen Bloodsport? Yeah. Okay, wow, well, we have some educating to do. Um, <laughs> okay, we have a very different looking Italian, black with the bishop pair. And this is, this is the position I feel like we're, we're used to seeing a lot of, right? Whatever happens on the queen side, black has this like long-term potential maybe to do things over here. Uh, I, I feel like I see Grishik play these positions as black and, and as white and, and Caruana as well regularly, but what jumps out to you about this particular battle here, Hammer? Eight pawns for each player. Uh, the more pawns you have on the board, uh, the more c complex the position, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, notice how uh, Jan Christoph Duda, he has chosen 
to give away one of his bishops mm -hmm. for one of the black knights. And we touched upon this yesterday, that um, when uh, there's a trade of knight versus bishop, the two pieces are considered to be about the same value, but they have two very different uh, functionalities on the board. And uh, in general, bishops are worse the more pawns are mm -hmm. on the board, because then pawns will often stand in the way of the bishop's diagonals. Uh, and uh, I think Jan Krzysztof Duda has um, this very long-term strategy yeah. uh, where he feels that he's going to have an advantage uh, just on account of the uh, black bishops uh, being unable to put uh, a real mark on the game. Hmm. I like that. That sets the tone for maybe even some later, later breakdowns of knight versus bishop imbalances. But right now, I want to I wanna draw attention to a different type of breakdown. Do you guys notice anything about this dynamic of JKD versus Dingley Wren not on the board? The chair. Apparently, the, I don't know whether it's just the you know, superstition of having lost in a chair or whether he was just genuinely uncomfortable, but apparently uh, Dingley Wren requested a smaller chair from FIDE and he was granted it. Your thoughts, Almira? Well, first of all, during the second leg of the last candidates, it, it was all about the chairs. Yeah. It seemed that uh, the players have chosen, like, everyone has, uh, has chosen a different chair. Yeah, yeah. So, like, when you were having an image, like, we were... Uh, calling the tournament eight chairs at yeah. the end. So uh, I think once again, you you have to feel as comfortable as you as you can get. Like so, uh, uh, I agree that he needs to. Uh, if he needs a new chair, you know, so that be it. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I, I understand uh, fully wanting to get a different chair, whether it was like no matter what the reasons would be. And it's funny, I. You talk about how the candidates last time had all the all the talk about the chairs. I personally think that gaming and chair companies, not, not just gaming chair companies, but may, you know whatever office brand companies are missing the opportunity. I literally don't understand why they don't go out of their way to put more. I mean, there's a lot of visibility. You get a lot of conversation going, especially if the chair has flair. Hey, that rhymed. I mean, if the chair had flair, people are going to talk about how it looks. So, and I think uh, maybe in the future we'll see more interesting expressions, right, of, of flair via the chairs that the players choose. So, funny. There's Carwana, by the way. By the way, I wanted to ask you, how would you feel playing in such a beautiful hall? Because yeah, I know that, like, how sensitive I am, especially, like, to any form of art. So I literally would be staring at the ceilings all the time. So, you know? I, it would be amazing. I actually think that the, uh, the location has has more than delivered. I've never played, I've played in a lot of hotel ballrooms like every other chess player, right? You get, you get to know those very big, kind of the patterns of the carpet when you're in ballrooms and whatever. But playing in a venue like this where the beautiful things to look at are up and not just some sort of, you know, office, office ceiling or, or, or lighting a chandelier in a hotel that gets old very quickly. Um, I would love it. I, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an ADD like squirrel squirrel, you know, so I would love it. In fact, it might be really bad for my chest, as if I needed more problems. Well, I, I suspect that it would be for mine as well, so, uh, we've, so... We've got a fun little comment here. I prefer to blame the mouse, but I understand how that doesn't work for OTB. Agreed. I, a lot of us like to blame the mouse when, uh, when we make bad moves, but there's no real, no real such thing as a mouse slip over the board. I don't think, anyway. What would be a mouse slip equivalent? Like you put the piece on a wrong square and then when you set it up, you accidentally mm. put it on a different square? No, actually it happened to me several times. Yeah. It, it's uh, when you make a second move of the variation. I would say that uh, if we can drive a parallel, it's like you, you calculate for such a long time and literally you start with the second move. And then you're looking at the position and it's just like... I have, like, I have done that as well, especially in like a capture moment where you're like calculating like multiple like ways to like m ways to recapture and then you just literally mess up the move order. I've done that before too. Yeah, so apparently it can happen. Okay, interesting. All right, well, um, there's a there's the playing hall from a broader and view. Half of the players uh, is missing. <laughs> half of the players are missing. Uh, and on that note, uh, we're going to we're going to take take a cue from our elite 8 players to uh, to take a very very quick break. Our first break, chess.com's coverage of the 2022 FIDE candidates. Round two, live from Madrid, continues when we return.
Want to hold a massive chess tournament with dozens of clubs or hundreds of players? Or maybe a small chess tournament with local but competitive clubs? With Club Arenas, you can. Club Arenas allow for tournaments of any size with any number of clubs and players. Customize the arena with any time control, with standard chess or mini chess variants, and with any starting position you want. Club Arenas are the most flexible tournament format on chess.com. Try one out today. This club is called Amigos del Retiro. Friends of, of the Retiro. The Retiro is a, uh, the most uh, big and important park in, in Madrid. It's a very important park in the city because it's right in the center. If you want to play chess, you don't know the, the place. This is uh, maybe the best one in, in Madrid. Aquí tenemos, eh, viene gente para aprender. Y se hacen muchos torneos a final de mes y los domingos y. Pues es muy común venir aquí y echar unas partidas y sí. Hoy, eh, porque como se juega candidatos aquí, pues queríamos hacer algo especial. Sí, hoy voy a dar la simultánea y a ver qué tal se da, a ver si juego, a ver si juego bien y, y no consigo saltar puntos. In qualifying for the candidates, Hikaru Nakamura ratcheted up the level of interest in what is already considered the most important tournament in chess. With millions of followers as a popular content creator, Hikaru brings along his sizable community while also attracting more casual chess fans. Although once ranked number two in the world, most believed Nakamura's best days competing in classical chess were behind him. That changed when this Japanese-American Grandmaster leaned on his exceptional calculating ability to win the FIDE Grand Prix. The unexpected victory earned him a bid into the candidates for the first time in six years. A five-time U.S. champion, Hikaru has stayed sharp of late by dominating in speed chess formats. Nakamura is currently ranked by FIDE in the top two in both Rapid and Blitz. A chess giant on Twitch and YouTube, Hikaru brings a special buzz to a tournament that already holds the keys to becoming the next world champion. And there are certainly those who have yet to rule out Hikaru from catching lightning in a bottle here in Madrid. Chess Kid is fun. Chess is great for the brain, but it's also fun to play. And Chess Kid makes it easy to have fun. Whether your child is a total beginner or a prodigy, they can hop on and find a well-matched opponent from around the world at any time. Chess Kid is the safe, parent-approved way for your child to play chess online. Chess Kid is educational. To kids, it feels just like playing, but chess is a great way to learn patience, strategy, and critical thinking. Chess Kid features a comprehensive training program that guides kids to level up on their way to mastery. This curriculum is designed to work with Common Core standards and global educational guidelines. There are more than 50,000 chess puzzles and a whole library of entertaining videos that teach strategies, tactics, openings, and end games specifically for kids. Chess Kid is easy. Whether you're a parent helping your child, a coach managing dozens of kids, or a school of hundreds, Chess Kid helps you organize your students and monitor their progress. Each child receives a weekly report card that shows how many lessons, puzzles, and games were completed. You can also organize kids into clubs and send them messages. Chess Kid is the online home of Scholastic Chess for thousands of kids, parents, schools, and coaches. Signing up is free and easy, so what are you waiting for?
Madrid. Civilization here is almost as old as the game of chess. Some claim the queen was given her powers to honor Queen Isabella. That, my friends, is a chess legacy. Passion for chess continues to thrive in Madrid. For the first time in 30 years, Spain's capital plays host to the candidates, the most important tournament in chess. At the Palace of Santona, the stakes are high. Eight of the world's best players competing for the right to challenge for the most coveted title in chess, the World Chess Championship. The candidates is grueling. The winner requires mental endurance and unbreakable focus. There are those familiar with the biggest stages in chess, yet still chasing unfinished business and others from the next wave of stars with little patience for yielding to those before them. Mis amigos, the next challenger to the world champion of chess must come through Madrid. Like Queen Isabella before them, the candidates is all about leaving a legacy. We are back here in Madrid getting a nice, a nice aerial shot, aerial view of young Christophe Duda and Richard Rapport as they play their, their respective matches here in round two of the 2022 FIDE candidates. This is Chess.com's coverage. It's happening live in Madrid. Richard Rapport is focused with me here in studio is of course, Almira and Hammer. And I think, Almira, stop. It's Hammer time. <laughs> What? It's hammer time. Oh, I, you want me up and, and running? Stop. It's hammer time. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to quickly get into the... we got to go back to Yonda Pomnishi and Carwana. But you wanted to show something from Rapport and Perugia. So I'm pulling up that particular game first. We've seen several moves going along. You want to break down this position or you wanted to talk about... Uh, I wanted to talk about something a bit more general. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about why the Sicilian defense is the choice of aggressive so players. Okay. And in order cool. to do that, I'm going to have to step over to our uh, special right. area. Let's go for it. Go for it. It's hammer time. Hammer time. Stop. It's hammer time. No one, I mean, you know, because he's, he's dope on the flow and he's magic on the mic. He's hammer time. Let's go. Okay, so this is the, the Rockport versus uh, Olibresa game, in which Olibresa showcasing his aggression for the second time with the black pieces playing the Sicilian opening. Now, this opening has a reputation for being very, very aggressive and unbalanced. Uh, and I'm going to try to explain why that is. Uh, and it is because uh, as the moves come on the board, the knight developing and the pawn stepping forward uh, once, um, it's really all about the discovery that was made that the only way white can put real intense pressure on black uh, is by playing the move uh, d4, uh, which uh, Rapport did. Um, now, after that d4 move, what happens is a trade between the pawns, after which what is very important to note is that white has one pawn in the center, whereas... Oh, sh yeah, I'm, touch screens are not my friends just yet, Danny. So white has, one, white has one pawn in the center, whereas black has two. And this central uh, superiority is basically the whole idea of the Sicilian. The, uh, that's the pro for black, but the con is that um, after some more moves, we will notice how in this position, um, we have a situation where black still has these two pawns in the middle versus white's, well, versus white's one or rather two white pawns against the three for black. Uh, however, um, this comes at a cost for black because black hasn't got any pieces into play. And so the Sicilian is very much an opening that uh, is all about the uh, uh, kind of unbalance between having good central control with your pawns uh, and getting your pieces out quickly. And we can see as the game progressed, uh, uh, here with the white pieces, 
uh, Rapport, uh, he plays the move c5. And so he's trying to make a trade with his pawn in towards the middle. Uh, and after that trade was made, uh, the situation is like this, that both players have uh, one pawn each in the center. So um, Alireza Furuja tried to make it imbalanced, uh, but uh, with the white pieces, uh, Richard Rapport, uh, he equalized that uh, situation with the pawns. And he's now trying to exploit the fact that black has two isolated pawns on the queen side. Good stuff. And you know, it's also something that we should note is the same structure that we had yesterday that Rapport was playing with black as, as Almira's c5 was played on the board and uh, predicted well, not met with queen a5 as we've kind of now learned several times in this position that while that pawn looks tasty, black doesn't seem to really be able to afford it, right? Too much, too much can be lost there. And so we get the same structure we had yesterday. White's advantage is teeny, I guess, if you talk about just the positional aspects of these pawns being split as targets. But black is doing just fine on development. You have the f4 square. Almira, it looks like your prediction of c5 was a, was a good one that we would see it. Well, there is only one slight uh, difference compared to the yesterday's game. It's just that uh, uh, Eli Reza has well, a worse structure, but which is compensated here by two bishops. Right. That's, no, I think, sense. it's the main difference. Yeah, so black is worse positionally, but has the two bishops, is, I guess, slightly ahead in development in a weird way. It's equal as both sides have a minor on the, fir on the first and eighth rank, respectively, and both sides' kings are yet to castle. But it feels like black's a little bit ahead just because of how quickly the bishop is sort of already in the game. Okay, well, this will be an equal one. It's not necessarily a, uh, as sharp of a one as what we're seeing in the other, the other feature game. We see a tired. Was he out late last night partying on his birthday? Are you I mean, on your Fuja? Okay, maybe he was preparing. You know, that's my, <laughs> my guess. More likely preparing than yes. partying uh, would, uh, would be Ali Reza Ferruja for sure. <laughs> when, <laughs> but, okay. I, when I was his age, I was preparing until I think six in the morning. You know, so it's like you, I you would stay up all night preparing yes, for a game exactly. in the morning? Yes, yes. Like when I was playing competitively, I like just I couldn't sleep. So yeah. I How just, did that go for you? <laughs> I was going to say that uh, I, I, I think I valued sleep way too much. And just hearing the balance of how I valued it, I valued sleep way too much. <laughs> More than the chess, perhaps. Well, so. I know how important it is now, but well, then I just well, all I was like just a giant mind, which was racing all the time. So yeah, that's yeah, right. no, but this is a very important point Almira brings up because there was a period of time where I started, uh, I stopped preparing for my game the day before because I thought if I prepare something. Um, I'm not going to be able to sleep as well because I'm only going to be thinking about uh, all the lines I have been investigating and yep. what I think is going to happen uh, the day after. So uh, there was a, a portion of time where, where I just decided I don't want to know my next opponent uh, because I don't want to disrupt my sleep. Yep. And I think chess players have really uh, come to understand uh, these, um, well healthy body, healthy mind kind of things. Yeah. Uh, that, um, for instance, Magnus Carlsen, he sleeps for very long during the morning uh, because he doesn't want to get up uh, too, um, uh, way too early before the game uh, because he believes that kind of his mind functions the best uh, a couple of hours after waking up instead oh, wow. of like 10 hours. That's after. interesting. Well, we know he's, uh, he's young and uh, creative, and I'm sure, I'm sure that yawn was because he was up uh, preparing, not partying, even though it is his birthday. Uh, but because it's his birthday, I think it's appropriate that we make a quick call and, uh, and show people just, just how young is he. We always say it. Here you can see that uh, he is the third youngest player to ever compete in the candidates. Magnus Carlsen and Bobby Fischer, the only two that uh, accomplished that feat at a younger age. 18 years and 11 months, the official sort of benchmark of when the tournament started. Of course, as we know, he turns 19 years of age today, uh, two days in. But still, what a career this, this young man has ahead, regardless of what happens in Madrid. But, but certainly, certainly an impressive feat that he's even here. So. Well, we were talking about Bobby Fischer, and uh, yeah. Elie Reza just certainly reminds us of Bobby Fischer. Yeah. 
even uh, well his attitude uh, during the game, uh, his uh, determination, and uh, how would you like? There is a word that we use in French, emprise. It's like the hold the game has on you. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like when he plays the game. Sometimes I look at him. And he enters a state of trance almost. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is uh, uh, not many people, like and players, they can get to this kind of concentration. Yeah, no, it's true. It's an obsession. You can see it, right? It's it's a, a focus and and passion. No, he's uh, he's creative and a, a lot of fun to watch. I really like your Kasparov image, uh, Dan. Yeah, I was gonna say I. I think I actually saw an early version of the image, and I made a shout out to the team to uh, to say, "Hey, maybe could we find a smiling Gary?" But maybe they couldn't find a smiling Gary. So and I also feel like his <laughs> hand up on his neck. It's almost What's funny. Is it looks like an extension of his neck. I know it's uh, it's definitely that's that's angry Gary, right? Although to be fair, Gary's reputation, you know, and how intimidating he was at the board definitely was a was a big part of of. The storyline that followed him during his career, right? So you know, maybe it, maybe it's appropriate. We should probably make that face an emote on our channel instead of instead of finding a smiling Gary. But okay, we're gonna back out um, and uh, switch things over to the the featured game of the round, if you will, sort of an unofficial dubbing that we that we call the uh, the most critical game, Nippon Mishi versus Carwana, as it's a battle between the two leaders. Um, let's refresh and show everybody how we got here because we left the game after Queen of Six had been played from Caruana. We can already see, by the way, just before we even dive in, let's set the stage for what's happening here. Bobby has more time than he started with by a lot. Uh, or no, no, no increment, but he, he's only used six minutes. I'm sorry, I was thinking of the 90. Of course, okay. no, no, of he's, course. But still, he has a ton of time. Jan, has, Jan is almost down yeah. to an hour, right? And this is the opposite of how we normally see these two players play. So it shows you how well prepared Bobby is for this game. Jan played the move queen e1 to defend f2 a second time. The queen goes to g7. Again, if we just look at the timestamps of this game, mm -hmm. Hammer and Elmira, Bobby has spent zero time. So this is still very clearly preparation for him. The knight comes to f1. Black castles, taking a, taking a note from Hikaru Nakamura's book that just because you play h6 and g5 doesn't mean you can't put your king on the king's side. Knight to g3, knight to e7 making sure that f5 remains protected just rookie, doubly. Just rook e2, queen e1, that's, it's... Yeah, it's very strange. Well, no, it's just that you do not see this very yeah. often, you know. Yeah. So uh, this but position is really very interesting. Now d4 comes. W what a move from Nepomniachi. Knowing he's facing his opponent's preparation, yeah. and he still goes ahead and, and makes a sacrifice of a pawn in the center of the board. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it's not too strange that he spent so much time to get here yeah. uh, because he had to build the courage uh, to, to really uh, put the pressure on Black uh, in a position where he had to assume that he was still in Karana's uh, home preparation. It, it should be noted, this was the first move that really caused Karana to do anything but physically come back to the board. It was 15 seconds on a move, 16 seconds, 16 seconds, 25 seconds. These are basically the time for Bobby to walk back. Mm -hmm. This move caused Bobby to pause for a minute and 57 seconds, so still not a lot of time, but it was the first move in the game, this D4 shot, that forced Bobby to check himself. He did capture and now brings the knight back to C6, which is, I, I like to call that like heavyweight boxers and footwork, right? You bring the knight to E7, once the structure changes and you have a new target, no problem shuffling the pony right back to where it was to overwhelm the d4 pawn. Well, it's actually a very typical maneuver. I wanted yeah. to draw your attention to this. So once white played d4, then even if you're losing a tempi, you're, you're going back to c6. And uh, now you have to solve the problem of how to protect the d4 pawn. Bishop b2 for me it's an, is a natural move. Mm -hmm. But the problem is black has put three pieces pointing in uh, against this the central pawn, mm -hmm. whereas white only had one piece defending it. So even if white does use the bishop to offer uh, additional uh, defensive uh, possibilities, Fabiano can still win a pawn by just capturing in the center. Of course, but I feel this is one of those positions, once again, uh, that when you sacrifice a pawn uh, for a long-term initiative, mm -hmm. look at the squares, f5 and h5. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I don't know. Um, just, just, I just want to get mm -hmm. the end of the line to just show like 
what Elmira is talking about. You have F5, you have H5, you have pawns that can't go back. We always joke about that, that bug on chess.com because the best move for black when you want a pawn is probably G5 to G7. This is the best move on the board, right? But you can't play it. And white will have long-term compensation here for for a very long time. Of course, and here, when you exchange this dark square bishops, you no longer have this ten tension on, yeah. uh, well, on f2, and it's very important. So the files are open for white's rook as yeah. well, so it's a very important factor as well uh, when you assess a position. So here, I would prefer white, actually. it's. Uh, I don't know what computers prefer here. Uh, I would bet Hammer prefers black, but he. I he do can... prefer black, Danny, and I ha I have a reason for it. Okay, well, if well you then did. you know, just don't mind if you do. Then go ahead. Uh, so in this <laughs> variation, uh, yeah. where White tries to defend the pawn on d4 but fails, okay, uh, I I'm going to be up a pawn, but after that, uh, I'm going to have this amazing square for my queen on e5. <laughs> this square. Uh, it's fantastic because there are no white pieces who are really in a position to kick the black queen away from there mm. uh, anytime soon. Uh, and then I will try following up with the moves h5, h4. Uh, and I'm going to use this pawn to chase away the white defensive knight so that the knight has to step back. And then you can talk to me about all these squares that knight is is looking for, uh, because <laughs> you I the sass today. I Thank succeeded you for in it. chasing it back. <laughs> um, it's a great point. Not very often we talk about a queen on an outpost exactly, square, yes. right? And so that that's already by itself a kind of a cool feature. And before you even mention h5 h4, I was I was I was highlighting this. I didn't see it. It's a great idea, but I was highlighting it just to show like what you're saying that the knight now can't access either of these squares because of the sort of the x-ray vision that the queen spies to the h2 pawn, so. Well, you can still play h3 because you have knight f1, just in case. I mean, yeah. you, you should always, well, remember that you have a lot of defensive resources, yeah. no matter what, and, uh, but, yeah, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's a valid position. point, of course. I, I... Well, and the main thing I would, I guess I would add is that, while well, Fabi did take a moment on, on e takes d4, as we said, a moment was a minute and 57 seconds, right? Wow, tons of time. That was the first time he had thought. He still then played instantly on the next move, right? Um, or sorry, he took, he took a moment on e takes d4 and then played instantly with knight c6. So still in preparation or at least a position he's familiar with, right? That's, that's likely a conclusion we can draw. There's so. certainly very nice features, but like how are you seeing all this? I mean, <laughs> what? I need new glasses. Oh, I, like, so I cannot see anything. <laughs> you know, I got LASIK at some point. It really helped my eyes. I'm not kidding. Oh, it okay. burned for like a whole day. It was like someone puts shampoo in your eyes and you can't get it out for like a day. And so it just hurts. And but I improved, got LASIK. Yeah. And it improved, it improved your, your vision yeah. is significantly. Yeah. I didn't know I would need it to read timestamps on a monitor 15 feet away that are really small, but it's helpful. All right. There's a... Uh, Yanna Pomashi doesn't need 20-20 vision to see what's in front of him right there. The chessboard is close, and he knows he has a lot of work to do today. If you're just tuning in, where have you been? This is round two of the 2022 FIDE candidates. That's one of the tournament leaders right there. Let's back up to our bird's eye view. Remind everybody that four games are in progress. And uh, not, not quite the fire on board, guys, that we had in day one, but still every game interesting, right? It felt like yesterday we were at one point on pace for four decisive results, like seriously. Um, the two games that ended in a draw had a huge advantage for, for the, po the Polish player, Duda, and of course, Ali Reza Perugia's exchange sacrifice was, was head-turning. But these games are interesting, a lot of life here. Hmm, you know, I had a thought, which, well, has nothing to do, like, uh, with the positional strategy, but more psychological finesse. Maybe, I don't know who is uh, coaching uh, Perugia, is this tournament? Nobody but, does. Well, I uh, nobody does. So you don't have. Okay. But maybe it was suggested to him that uh, Richard doesn't like to trade queens because it was such a surprise for me that also Eliza traded queens, mm -hmm. you know, at uh, such an early stage. So I, uh, I find that it, is it is it really true that players of the twenty seven fifty plus level would have a stylistic, not necessarily issue or preference of like that really, but like. I'm not sure, but 
we could establish a pattern. I think they, they of course, they are universal players, mm -hmm. but maybe there was something, maybe like a slight, uh, you know, hint. Right. I don't know, because especially Firuja, you know, the, the yeah. key. The well, Hammer, let me ask you. You were a second for Magnus for two World Championship matches. You've been in the room where it happens, so to speak. Shout out to Aaron Burr. Does that, is that a thing? Do you talk about that? I mean, there's preparation in the opening, we know. There's preparation you do just in general to be your, get your mind right and your body right. But are there stylistic preparations against a player like, hey, he doesn't like when the queens are traded? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, but this is also because Magnus is incredibly good at being opinionated and, and like having these thoughts mm. on what a player is good at and what a player is bad at. And Magnus also shouted out Gary Kasparov once. Uh, because he thought Kasparov had some really good insights into Vasily Ivanchuk. Uh, Magnus had always assumed that Ivanchuk's erratic uh, opening uh, style and that he was just able to play uh, anything. Uh, Kasparov, when working with Magnus, ha had made a point uh, of some detail. I don't know what that detail was, but there was something Kasparov said which made Magnus think that there is a system to uh, Ivanchuk's madness. Mm. So you can, um, you can have these opinions yourself, but you can also learn from your elders. And like Kasparov played against Ivanchuk for two decades. So uh, it's fascinating. I mean, trading queens is uh, not well, something we're going to see soon in this game here with Nepomneshi and Caruana. In fact, we, we do have a move though. Rook to A3 and Bobby rushes back to the board. Hammer, it's hammer time. Not, not that hammer time, but it's hammer time. What do you got? Well, I guess he thought that because Fabiano was threatening the pawn in the middle with three pieces uh, and uh, White only had one defender, uh, Nepomniachi must have felt that, well, I'm going to lose this pawn regardless. I'm not interested in defending it, which will only uh, lead to further uh, trades of pieces. Mm. Uh, so instead, he's trying to uh, do one of these rook lifts where the rook goes up the board on one side and tries to go all the way over to the other side uh, in due time and, and thereby uh, increasing uh, the pressure against an already vulnerable uh, black king. I like that. What do you say to the psychology, Almira, of, like Hammer said, he knows he's going to lose the pawn anyway, so why put more effort into it? Let's position our pieces for the long-term compensation we know we're going to need. Well, these lateral moves, lateral rooks, yeah. move, Moves, they always escape my eye and uh, well I understand of course that he wants to bring it in long term to uh, f3 and uh, you know to increase the pressure on f7 but uh, you will always have well you will keep one of the knights so it could mm -hmm. always go to e5 you know that's uh, mm, that's see. my concern but, but the h is also maybe of a long term course. target too no. so okay uh, Fabi's going to have his work cut out for him now to uh, show what his prep was all about we expect him to be thinking for just a minute here. And so on that note, we're going to take a minute and bring up yet another one of our player profile spotlights and remind you all the things you did or didn't know about the highest rated player from the United States. Fabiano Caruana stands as a pretty popular choice for winning it all here in Madrid. Fabi won this prestigious tournament four years ago in Berlin. In his challenger match against Magnus Carlsen, Caruana came just one endgame moment away from his first world championship. I wasn't uh, wasn't playing my best chess today, and Magnus, uh, I think, played, played very well. Soon to be 30, Caruana's chess resume is matched by few in Madrid. Born in Miami with dual citizenship, Fabi became the youngest grandmaster in U.S. history at age 14. A decade ago, he made history at the Sinkfield Cup, winning seven straight games on his way to a 28-44 rating, the third highest of all time. Precise calculation and deep knowledge of opening theory are Fabi's calling cards. The Italian-American used both to great effect in the FIDE Grand Swiss to qualify for this event. Caruana now aims to become the first player since Vichy Anand to win the candidates in non-consecutive years. But perhaps more importantly, Fabi looks towards another shot at the world title. It's a, 
That's a really interesting stat there from Danya that he would be the first player since Vishianon to win the candidates in non-consecutive years. Uh, he's a four-time Italian champion, 2016 U.S. champion. The Sinkville Cup is, again, the tournament that will always be mentioned because it was the performance of a legend there in St. Louis. Uh, of course, he's the Grand Swiss runner-up, which is how he got here. And as is often pointed out, he's uh, the only person to have never lost a classical world championship game to Magnus Carlsen. Um, and uh, he's the only participant to play in three previous candidates. So his career is a fantastic one. It, uh, it's one that why so many people have him as the favorite. And here we have, a, this is a, now this is a great comment. I was there when Fabi made it in person. This is from Green Man RD. Fabi mentioned during the World Championship coverage, so glad you were tuning in, that he looks for positions that give his opponent a slight edge, but are very tricky to navigate. He feels, feels like we're seeing this thought process prominently here today, meaning Green Man RD feels like we're seeing it. I, I think, so I don't know if you, if either of you saw that comment from Fabi, but we asked, we got as much as we could out of him, me and Hess, about how he prepared. And he said, one of the things that's very underrated is you know that, you know that chess is super hard. You know that you can't always prepare a win with the engine, right? So one of the trickiest things to do is to go for a position that you hope that their team stopped analyzing a little early because they're like, oh, it's just an edge, right? But you went a little deeper knowing that it was an edge, but there are a lot of problems potentially, a lot of pitfalls, right? And that that is maybe the, the most often place where you can catch somebody off guard um, in a line where they have an advantage. So, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that is not new information, but it, it's really, uh, I, I mean, Fabi is breaking code here. You're not supposed to, to talk about the Grandmaster Club. You're not supposed to reveal all our secrets. First rule about the, the chess club, you yeah. always talk about chess club. No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is a fantastic point from Fabiano, and, and it is the way to yeah. catch your opponent unaware right. these days. You play yeah. something that the computer is not recommending uh, because then there's a, a smaller chance that your opponent has spent time on just that uh, variation. No, okay. I'm, I'm taking notes. You know, so so. Uh, Almira, <laughs> your, your thoughts on the fact that while everything we just talked about in regards to Bobby's comment, again, great comment from, from the, the chatter there on Twitch. Thank you for that. Now he's thinking. So is this thinking to try to remember your preparation? Use the clock as a weapon? You have earned that time advantage? Or do you think he genuinely was surprised by Rook A3? Well, I still think that he's, uh, well, within his preparation. Right. Uh, but maybe, well, here it's like you go right, you lose a knight, you go left, you know, so it's a typical Russian, you know, folkloric <laughs> <laughs> story, yeah. you know, so uh, it's like uh, he has a choice probably, and uh, so maybe this choice is critical right here. Right. And uh, I think it's very important, of course, to uh, take a deep thought uh, and to consider his options. Uh, is that but a Russian proverb? You go right, you lose a knight. What is that? It's a, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it comes from Russian uh, folklore. You okay. know where it was like actually it's a uh, Russian warrior. At some point he comes to a crossroad. Right. So and then it's written on this carved on a stone. So okay, you go right, you you lose your knight. You know you go left. You know you lose uh, well depending on the story something more valuable. So it's like what are, what are you willing to okay, sacrifice? I so I love that. Most, I guess the, the joke is they would, they would rather lose the more valuable thing than the knight. Is that the joke? Okay. It depends. It depends. <laughs> well, um, we'll see what Wolfabi comes up with. Like you said, it's a critical decision. And uh, this, def this game definitely had all the makings of exactly that comment from Fabiano Caruana. Um, and again, huge shout out to the Twitch chatter who pointed it out. We want to give a uh, shout out to the Youth Speed Chess Championship. The third annual Chess Kid Youth Speed Chess Championship will feature eight of the top youth players from around the world in a series of Blitz matches. You can catch all the action starting June 20th at twitch.tv slash chesskid. Fun Master Mike, who's here in the building at the Palicio de Santonia. Happy Crocodile, Women's Grandmaster, Ketty Setsalvashvili, sorry about that, and WFN Maria Rodrigo. Um, gonna be a lot of fun. Shout out to the kids at home and uh, Let's give a shout out to all four games in progress. Maybe make a different decision about where to go next. We've been really focused on Nepomnishi Karwana. Well, I think we should go to Hikaru uh, because uh, the thing about Hikaru's game is that it's uh, very similar with his countryman Karana in one respect. Uh, and that is the time usage. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, we saw Fabiano Carana now taking his uh, time for the first uh, moment in this game. Uh, but that is also true uh, of um, Rajabo's opponent, yep. Nakamura. Well, uh, because even though um, this seems like a, um, you know, not as tricky of a position as Fabiano's, uh, it, it has quite a bit of venom. Uh, and that is underlined by the fact that Tamir Rajabo feels that he might go down to less, uh, more than an hour behind Hikaru um, uh, on this move. He's on pace to get there. Let's, let's show everybody where it where we left it. For those who maybe tuned in a little late, Hikaru was offered a Berlin. He took, took a page out of Fabiano's book to de decline the Berlin with D3, similar to the, their game from yesterday. But after bishop c5, where Fabiano played the move bishop takes c6 against Nakamura, Hikaru plays a different line, which leads to this sort of rare looking multiple minor piece move approach from black. D4 is played, and this was the first sign that we, we were smelling something fishy, because Rajabov in a relatively well-known position, took a lot of time before playing c6, which is the most common move, by the way. c6 is the most common move. But, it, but it, the fact that he took so much time was the odd thing. d takes e5, cb5, e takes f6, queen f6. These moves were played instantly, mm -hmm. literally instantly, by Hikaru. Um, after castles, castles, and then queen h5, you, know, you just immediately spot the structure, right? Bad pawn, which leads to an undeveloped bishop, doubled pawns which means this bishop isn't getting out here. I, I love White's position here. I'm surprised the computer doesn't give White more of an edge. It feels like such a tough position for Black to play. But then going back to uh, Fabiano's comment uh, during the World Championship, that's what uh, Hikaru has, has managed uh, here, that he chose a line that the computers didn't initially think were very good for White. But as it transpires, yeah. uh, Rajabov is coming under increasing pressure. Uh, and now a big move from him. He's moving his pawn forward in the middle, just giving that pawn up. Uh, and Rajaba is going to be down a pawn here. Well, actually, I expected this move uh, okay. from Timur because uh, uh, this is so much uh, in his style, sacrificing a pawn. He has two bishops. And he... Uh, does not want to uh, commit himself to to a passive defense. Right. So, uh, D6 uh, could be considered, but it's, so it's not in his like uh, uh, style once again. So D5. Uh, and by the way, I think it might just immediately. Ah yes. So Knight G5, of right, course, so uh, it simply win, wins. But so but you're he right. needs to play D5. Okay. And uh, say more about why you expected it. So it's an active move, obviously. You, you, what you get your only real advantage in the position as black is the bishop in the game. But a pawn is a pawn, right? I mean, what if a just takes it? Well, he takes it, so we trade queens. Then probably uh, takes only one, I think. And then he develops his bishop to f5. Let's say, is it a possible continuation? And then uh, rook d8 and try to win the pawn back. Or in the worst case scenario, uh, maybe exchange the uh, the wrong bishop so we get to the uh, opposite color bishop and games mm -hmm. sort of uh how would uh young ludwig call it the bailout yes the um, bailout, yes yeah. taking the, the, notes he yes. likes to say but there's a bailout <laughs> but move. yes but so. a moment ago we saw hikaru number 12 the rare duck lips where he kind of lowers his lip and kind of like is not really not really thinking that his opponent's plan is very good like oh really is that yeah, what broken down in the video to come soon yeah I did, well, well can, I mean, you we previewed all... this video so yeah. much now, Danny. I yeah. feel like it's time to release I, the crack. It will. It will. It will come. Don't worry. Um, we've, got right. a, we've got a lot of spoilers. But a so. lot of spoilers. A lot of spoilers. But no, seriously, Hikaru, very focused. He's uh, primed here to use maybe the advantage he, he has on the clock, as you pointed out, almost an hour. So he'll make, he'll make sure he makes the right decision. And I think this will be very quickly a two-result position for Hikaru. Will, will it ultimately prove a victory? That would be a huge bounce-back game for the five-time U.S. champion. But, um, but either way, it'll be a position where he's, he's the only one who probably can win. I feel uh, like it's also, yeah, like uh, it might very soon be a one-result uh, one uh, position. Meaning only Hikaru wins? No, Danny. Uh, meaning that it's going to be a draw. Oh, okay. Uh, because I, I do feel like... Uh, this end game down a pawn for Rajabov, it really resembles what is called the martial end game. Mm. 
which is uh, actually the Spanish op opening as well, uh, but uh, a very different way there. Uh, and it's very typical for that opening that black gives up a pawn to have an unopposed light squared bishop, which is the same case here. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see uh, whether Hikaru will be able to, to pile on the pressure or, or whether it will just peter out pretty quickly. Because here in this line you have, um, oh, it's not on the screen, but uh, the, the line Danny is, uh, is analyzing now, if we can put that on the screen. Uh, the white pawn on d5, the pawn in the middle, uh, is very exposed. Um, and um, it's very difficult for white to offer that pawn sufficient protection. And I could easily see that pawn being lost uh, in the near future, after which uh, Rajabo will make, make a draw with uh, equal number of pawns. So um, right now, like you said, Danny, a two-result game. But Hikaru needs to be extremely accurate to make sure that his initiative doesn't fade in the next five moves. I actually had the same feeling, but I wanted to mention uh, another possible continuation. Uh, after queen d5 here, is mm. it possible for black to play uh, queen g6 just to keep the queens on board? And, uh, queen g6? Yes, queen g6. Well, I see the bar, like, so it means the computer doesn't like... Hmm. Uh, I well, wanted to play uh, bishop b6 or bishop h3, but probably this is not sufficient compensation, no? Well, I, I, I want to suggest the move uh, queen takes b5. I was going to say, it might just be that you're giving no, up a second I, pawn, I, because this, this queen, move would be queen a mistake yes, that only Danny Wrench could make. <laughs> but we could start with bishop h3 first. Ah, queen g5. That's yeah. what you wanted. Okay. Yes, I think that's a very... Yeah, so, if, you, if you go mm -hmm. here, then queen g5. Queen and, g5. And, and white is actually up two pawns now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of well, course, so the, yeah, well, then you cannot keep uh, the queens on the board, so unfortunately. Okay, it was, it was a good line and instructive point about queen takes d5. I hear you, right? It's, it's definitely a hard... Hard end game to prove how white can win when both bishop e4 and rook d8 are coming as a chance to maybe win back the pawn. So, interesting quote here from Hikaru Nakamura. He says, winning is fun, losing is fun. Playing interesting games with both colors is what makes it worthwhile. Of course, just speaking about what it is to play chess at a, at a high level. I think that, I think of all the top players, Hikaru, I think that that's, I, I saw Hammer kind of smiling, maybe like calling the bluff that losing is fun. I understand, that, but I think Hikaru genuinely feels like, he's played so much chess, he streams chess all the time. I would say that he's developed a thick skin for losing in front of a lot of people. It happens all the time, right? And so I think he genuinely feels that. I'm not saying he wants to lose, but I think that that's uh, an interesting comment and probably how he feels, really. Well, I do find it's, uh, it's first of all, it's, uh, it's a very sincere comment. Yeah. And I think that we had this conversation uh, a few days ago, and it's the point that I wanted to explain that uh, a chess player is always identifying himself with his victories or the games he's playing. So it's not, it's all very concrete and it's the world of ideas. So what I wanted to explain that very often at elite levels, we forget what playing is. Essentially, you know, the, I think the most important uh, aspect of playing is fun. So that's what I wanted to say also about Magnus. I think that uh, playing so many world championship matches and having so much at stake that it's, well, he lost this feeling when, you, well, you're simply, when you're playing and it's fun no matter what. So I think he's trying actually, uh, it's, uh, it's pure wisdom, I think, yeah. from Hikaru. Interesting. I'm, I'm not sure he's, he's genuine. I think all players to become the level they are they have to hate losing so much that they put in enormous amount of time uh, to, to kind of avoid that by practicing. But I will agree that one of the most important skills, once you have reached that very high level, is the ability to deal with the losses. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I think this speaks to Hikaru, who frankly doesn't lose very often, because yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he's just, he's made winning. Uh, a regular occurrence on uh, chess.com, but also elsewhere. Um, but um, being able to cope with those few losses you do encounter is, is incredibly uh, valuable. And, and sometimes 
you don't even have to believe what you're saying. You just need to have that psychology of, yeah, it's okay, I lost, it's okay, there's another game yeah. uh, coming in. And actually, this uh, matchup is going to be a very good illustration of just that. Hikaru coming off uh, a tough loss um, in the first round, he's now trying to bounce back. And, and having that mentality may increase his chances of, of getting back into it immediately. They say all the all the best players and athletes have sort of short-term memory loss in that sense, right? They're they're so confident in what they're able to do. It's what got them there that they kind of develop that ability to just focus on the present, quickly forget the mistakes they made. They don't hold it against themselves and the type of attitude that allows them to bounce back. Although you made an interesting comment about players, they, they want to win, they hate to lose. Kaidanov, when I was working with him for a short period, said he could define like the psychology and then a, a full bullet point list of what that type of player's strengths and weaknesses were based on one high level comment, which was there are those who love to win and those who hate to lose. And that it's actually a very different type of mentality and attitude toward prophylactic thinking versus you know, taking chances and risk. Anyway, we don't have to get into that, but it's, it's an interesting, interesting psychology to th consider the style that a player develops based on the joy, the, the thrill they have of the kill versus the absolute, just how much they despise losing. And, and I think we have a lot of uh, those uh, who love to win in this tournament yeah. uh, based on how much aggression yeah. we've seen in the first two rounds. But do you remember, like yesterday, Fabiano shared with us uh, all his insights, and the first thing that he said, I do not allow myself to get too excited. Mm -hmm. This says a lot, you know, yeah. about the, the mindset and, like, it's pure joy winning, you know, yeah. but finally it comes down to like to being relieved, you know, so I think that uh, especially like in all other sports you're allowed, you know, we have a completely different ethics, you know, so mm -hmm. it's allowed to, uh, well, to express it. That's, that's a really great point. I mean, like they win an NBA game, a single game, let alone like the finals and every teammate, you know, they scream and enjoy, like they have like a release, right? They, they high five, they hug it out, right? They sometimes literally scream to the crowd, right? And there's, chess players aren't allowed to do that, right? So there's a lack of like emotional letdown that you experience from, from a victory that, I feel like we should do something about that. Go ahead. Yeah, because I, I, I was, I, I know that there's been uh, some research in handball, which is very popular in Norway. I don't think the US even knows what it yeah, is. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, in that, uh, it was discovered that teams that massively celebrated goals, and there's like 30 goals for each team per game, teams that really celebrated their goals was doing better. Interesting. Just because of like, you know, you're kind of also saying to the opponent, yes, we're the best, we're gonna take you down. I don't, Maybe I'm not it's sure the, the endorphins they were winning. I mean, there's a lot. I'm sure there's all kinds of studies that can be done about that. Well, and also I think that in chess, you well, it's well, Fabi said, and it's a very elegant way of saying this. You're also um, uh, preserving your opponent because mm. you know you yeah. still you have 14 games, so uh, it's. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they're celebrating in their rooms. You know, yeah, I want the camera there. Maybe they go home there. and fist bump, <laughs> and uh, and you know, I I don't know. I can't really see like uh, Fabi and, and Chuchilov like you know hugging it out. Maybe they have a whole secret handshake. Like boom, boom. I don't, wouldn't that be hilarious? <laughs> That's the next skit I'm gonna make Fabi do. Him and Chuchilov. You have the power to do that. Oh, I can. Yeah, Fabi will do it. I'll, I can make Fabi do anything. All right, let's back this thing up and take a look. Take a but look we at, are dancing the flamenco. Yes, then it's like uh, they're doing can, the handshake. I'm yes. going to tell Fabi if he wins the candidates, we're doing a flamenco dance. Yes, okay. That's it. <laughs> no, we will. We will. Oh, they didn't see it. <laughs> there's uh, there's four four boards in, in front of you. Oh, they brought us. They brought us back. Yes, they brought. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So we'll do the flamenco dance if if if, if well, with Fabi. That's the deal if he wins. So <laughs> let's, let's head back and take a, take a peek at where all four games stand. Very, very little to no action in the rapport for Rouge game. The Queens have come off the board, and those two young players who I think we would all classify as players who love to win, they're, uh, they're giving it a long think. Of course, we've spent a lot of time on the Palma Shikarwana, which has had some things change. Um, and then this, this, this due to Dingley Ring game, I feel bad we're, we're kind of neglecting it the most, but... It's so a very, very long positional struggle ahead in that Italian um, with a very close position there in the lower right corner. 
Do you want to head back and take a look at that hammer, or do we want to go over to the uh, Nepomniachtchi Corona game? Uh, I would say uh, Nepomniachtchi and, and Corona, uh, if only because I'm planning to look at this uh, Ding versus uh, Duda game uh, on the monitor. On the next hammer on. time? Yeah. <gasps> Preview, foreshadowing, don't go anywhere. We're going to have some more breakdowns of the positional battle of knights versus bishops ahead. All right, what happened here? A couple of moves. Caruana took, let's see, about nine and a half minutes on move 17, knight takes d4. So the first real think of the game occurred. Uh, right here, someone standing in front of our camera. We love that. First real shout out to a, a nice looking suit of the day. Knight takes d4, and after bishop takes h3, okay, knight e5, and bishop a2. So the bishop was attacked, moved away. Uh, Jan Nepomniachtchi just playing calmly on, down a pawn. Playing instantly too, by the way, now. Yeah, well, he kind of has to because he's way down on the clock. Uh, and we just got an, an interesting situation uh, in front of us. Uh, Fabiano has chosen to play with uh, extreme risk. Um, and he has a 30-minute time advantage and a pawn advantage as well. But in the resulting position... Does he like this outcome? And, and will this suit him better than Jan Nepomniachtchi, who is kind of the king of uh, Messi? Uh, so um, I'm, I'm very intrigued uh, by the, the new developments. Um, and I think this is going to be a tough game for, for both players, both of them trying to reach that two out of two uh, score to just dominate uh, initially here. It's, uh I'm trying to find out the point behind rook e3. Very often, you know, when computer offers a you like an h4 move recently, like almost in every position, and you don't understand it initially, and then somewhere on the move 22, mm -hmm. you, like you see the point. And I cannot make it work for the moment. Well, I, I think um, had a white's rook still been in the corner, um, the bishop could have taken it. So well, I, I feel mean, like it's it's something as simple as just getting that rook away from uh, potentially being captured, and then secondarily, uh, hoping for to bring it up over uh, to an attack uh, against the uh, the black king. And I, I think there's a real sarcasm, potential for that. Sarcasm, you know, it's like it's a big bug theory. You know, they're always bringing you know this. <laughs> sarcasm card the for, for Shel <laughs> Sheldon, you know, so like I've, I spotted this, you know, I, I have some of Sheldon's qualities, you know, but that's <laughs> You, think, you <laughs> think he's being sarcastic? Uh, of course he no, is. I, I, think, I think maybe there's a, here's my version of the attack. I think the king moves to unpin the pawn from f2, and on that note, you're, sub, you're actually maybe immediately threatening f4, because after the captures, you would have knight h5 with a tempo on the queen, then you can recapture f4 with either the bishop or the knight, depending on what black does. And suddenly, the g3 square is available. So mm -hmm. let, me, let me just play some fantasy chess mm -hmm. real quick. We'll make some random move. And again, forget the eval bar here. I'm just trying to show that if nothing changes, suddenly a move like f4, in fact, the engine likes it, right? That's the idea, is that I'm very quickly justifying what, what, what did look like a very awkward placement of my pieces mm -hmm. into a quick attack, right? Because the g3 square is going to be a real problem. So. The engine backing me up there feels better than almost anything that has happened to me while here in Madrid. I actually really think that there's an idea here, especially because that shot is, is not something that black can do anything about. The g5 pawn can't run away from this fate, right? And, you know. The point being is that the rook on the three. Forward. Yes, okay, more okay. useful than on c1 or d1. That's like, I, because I was feeling that it has to be on c1 and I in the c7 pawn and open files, but. Here he wants to keep his dark square bishop, mm -hmm. exactly, maybe to sacrifice it uh, at some point. Maybe there's something like if knight f5, knight h6 is possible, then bishop g5 and rook g3. This is fantasy yeah, chess. Yeah, like all, all in on something like that. Well, I mean, Fabi's thinking, again, he's earned the advantage on the clock, he's up a pawn, and the computer's like black. And I, I, I made those moves randomly, of course, and he'll have to come up with something, but... The point is there, is, there is a future where White's pieces look like they planned it all along if Black isn't careful, and I'm, and I'm sure Fabi is aware of these, these potential ideas. And so. if he makes a standard move uh, like uh, for the Italian, we should be six. Right, okay, Th this Let's looks try. good. Because Let's try, yeah. Here we offer the trade. 
Of course, this transition, I'm just going to make it, I would assume it's good for black because opening the F-file and, yeah. and then over-protecting the light squares can only be good. So Nepo would not do that. So how do you continue here? It's a good move, bishop e6. Well, what about your uh, king h1, Danny? That's okay. a simple king h1. I guess, I guess already, at, le at least now, if you take a2, I don't have... Well, then I have knight f5, Danny. Ah, okay, yeah, that's, that's huge. No, 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 no yes. Actually, you, even, even immediately, maybe, right? Inter intermezzo. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you have to yeah. guard the f5 square. Nice. So how do you continue here? Hmm. At some point, you have to start using the majority. I don't know what pawn should come first. I think you could maybe make an argument for all three pawn moves, in fact. Um, but, like, white's attack is coming on the next move. Like, white's next move is pawn to f4. You like it. You so like that idea. Yeah, no, I... I, I Hammer? Do you want go me on. to say it go out on. loud, Danny? Say it out loud. I like say my you, name. I like your <laughs> idea, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what uh, is going on here, <laughs> <laughs> All right. F4, F4, um. F4 is coming, and, uh, and yeah. Hammer likes it. Yeah, no, it's, it's really difficult to deal with for Fabiano. If, if he has to play a move like knight g6. Mm -hmm. Why not? Um, yeah, knight h5, just if you want it. I'm, I'm not sure. I was going to think but then, about it. But then you get it, your favorite alpha square. Just oh, here the queen is really uh, yeah. very vulnerable. I like that move, actually. Because the queen is, in a rare case, is the queen better on the alpha square than a knight? Mm -hmm. In this yeah. position, I guess so. But maybe you can start with knight f5. Can you? Okay. I don't want to, but... Okay. I mean, now the, the white uh, rook and queen is making a lot of sense. This knight cannot be stationed here uh, without causing massive headaches for black. It has to be captured. Uh, immediately, mm -hmm. but once that capture is made, white recaptures, opening up for the rook down the open file, uh, opening up for the bishop uh, towards the uh, black king, and just really releasing the energy in in white's pieces. And now, now I, I, I still like this, Danny. I, I think this is a great idea, and um, I think Fabiano will be um, nervous. Uh, about such the chef four lines idea. in his uh, calculations. Yeah, I think if you play knight d5 there, then uh, your idea simply smashes uh, black f4, knight, e knight e5 f4, and I don't see even how okay, to... Okay, hold on, let's yes. see that line again with Elmir on the top, so, so knight g6. Knight g6. Oh wait, no, bishop b6 first. Yes, bishop b6, because we want to release... King h1. Uh, ...pressure from knight the f7, knight g6, knight f5, yes, and I don't know how to react here. Yeah. Bishop f5 is probably forced, of course, then you take, and then knight, if knight e5, I wanted to show that your idea, like with f4... Super strong, and oh, then... Yes, it's very strong, yeah. and, and now everything makes sense. That's how everything makes That's sense, was, like 10 I moves think later. That, I think yes. that Jan is very sneaky in those, because he has such a good feel for potential of, of an attack, right? I mean, everyone has known that about him for a very long time. He's a, he's a very intuitive player, has a very good feel for the danger in positions. Fabi plays c5. And he uses the majority. He uses the majority, which I think at some point had to be Black's plan, and he gets up to uh, take a walk. And as Jan returns, we take a look at the larger playing hall cam so that we can take a walk. It's gonna be only our, our second break of the day. Don't worry, we will leave you with a view where you have an eye on all four games, of course, uh, there is so much ahead here in round two of the 2022 FIDE candidates. Don't go anywhere. Our live coverage from Madrid continues in just a few minutes.
Madrid. Civilization here is almost as old as the game of chess. Some claim the queen was given her powers to honor Queen Isabella. That, my friends, is a chess legacy. Passion for chess continues to thrive in Madrid. For the first time in 30 years, Spain's capital plays host to the candidates, the most important tournament in chess. At the Palace of Santona, the stakes are high. Eight of the world's best players 
competing for the right to challenge for the most coveted title in chess, the World Chess Championship. The candidates is grueling. The winner requires mental endurance and unbreakable focus. There are those familiar with the biggest stages in chess, yet still chasing unfinished business and others from the next wave of stars with little patience for yielding to those before them. Mis amigos, the next challenger to the world champion of chess must come through Madrid. Like Queen Isabella before them, the candidates is all about leaving a legacy. We are back, we are back looking at the beautiful, beautiful park, El Retiro Park. What a gorgeous scene there in Madrid. El Retiro is one of the parks where citizens of Spain, citizens of Madrid will play chess regularly. I, I want to go to there. That looks very pleasant. I would like to go to El Retiro Park someday. Maybe we will. But right now we have other things to do. And that, don't look at me like that, Hammer. <laughs> it's fun to go to parks. These, I bet the players would love to go to the park too. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you could go to the park uh, if you just went there on a rest day because you are currently in Madrid. You, you make it sound like it's such a, a freaky thing that you could go to the park. Well, let's, do it on, let's do it on Monday. You want to go to the park together? I'm not sure I want to be outside in this Spanish. Okay, evening. that's true. We want to keep you inside. We like, we like Jan Ludwig Hammer right where he is here in Madrid. We like Elmira Skripchenko right where she is. And we hope that you like our coverage so far of the 2022 FIDE candidates. It has been, it's been awesome. It's been so much fun. The players are delivering on the board. The fans are delivering in chat. The team here is delivering. We are, we are having a great time. We hope, we hope you are too. What do we want to do with this uh, next part of the beautiful program, the beautiful games we see in front of us? I wanted Lots of to, options. I wanted to troll oh, you Al first. Almira, <laughs> you get to go. This my final day. I've got some confidence now. It's about the park. I'm the typical Americans, you know. They want to go to the park. I want yeah. to go to Del Prado, you know. I love it. So, okay, let's have a look at this position. It's absolutely crazy, yeah. and I think that we should stick with the game uh, between Jan Nepomneshi and Fabiano Caruana. Okay. Uh, it's uh, an absolutely wild affair, if I yeah. might say. C5 so. was played right as we left. We highlighted the use of the pawn majority. Well. It's not how many pawns you have, it's how you use them, and it's time to push them. Push them, baby, as Yazer, Yazer would say. B takes C5, and now Fabi is... I didn't realize this was a debate, but I guess actually... Both what did moves. you think was the obvious move? I, I, I don't think there is one now that I, I see it. I, yeah. I thought D takes C5. I guess I just assumed to capture back with the pawn. Yeah, but then we have the uh, wrench patented. patented uh, uh, if you're going to make fun of a tool, as one tool to another, yeah. make sure you do it right. Yeah, Hammer. Uh, I'll try. Um, but then I think <laughs> the, the Danny plan uh, okay. of King H1 is super strong. The thing is, first of all, when you're playing uh, C5, I thought he already knew what the follow-up. This is what I find surprising. Mm. Well, you take a deep thought, yeah. C5, B takes C5, that's, uh, that's where I agree with you. It's like right. probably the next move is absolutely natural. Well, and Fabi thinks he takes once again, yes, and he takes with the bishop. Wow. So, so he's taking with the bishop to put uh, pressure on white's rook. Uh, and he's making the argument that uh, now that you have to spend a move uh, protecting your rook, then I will have time getting my pieces into defense uh, afterwards. But uh, I'm going to be honest with you, Danny. I I'm not even sure Nepomniachi will move his rook. Oh man, now that but, but you don't have that would be some fun. You don't have yeah. a square, that's the thing. Bishop ah. like you have bishop before next, so rook c three is not possible probably, no? So it's actually funny. So the more we look at it. You don't have a square. Yeah, the only safe square is B three, which is well, awkward say, AF. Right? And you want to play rook c three, but then bishop b four is coming, so So White's rook is lacking squares. And that means the rook is probably going to be sacrificed. So Jan Nepomniachi has already given up a pawn in the opening. Now he's going to give away a rook for a bishop as well. This is, this is fascinating. The, uh, the, all the psychology went into that. I agree with Yelmir. The, it wasn't that Fabi was taking time. It's that he, usually when you make a move like that, you already know your plan. But he thought for another 
eight minutes mm -hmm. almost before taking backwards with the bishop. He must have really been afraid of not gaining a tempo because of the f4 idea. But how would you stack the exchange? So let's say you, do you still play the king h1 f4 idea or do you, you don't need to move your king because this bishop is going to be gone. So maybe you do something else. Yeah, um, I'm not really sure, Danny. I, it's such a tricky position. Um, yeah, no, I, I would probably still go king h1. Um, but the problem is that uh, after Fabiano then captures uh, the white rook, uh, you're down a lot of material. Uh, and you no longer have that rook coming over to the other side, uh, creating an attack on the black king. I, I think the reason Fabiano hesitated is because he assumed that pawn takes pawn was not a possible move mm -hmm. for Nepomniachtchi because he saw that that would create such big trouble for the rook. Uh, and then Nepomniachtchi says, well, I don't care. Um, I'll just give away my rook. And uh, like for this to be the second round, uh, two players who, who won their first round game, yep. the amount of risk they are willing to, to take, first Fabiano, playing an incredibly aggressive opening with black, and now Nepomniachtchi giving up a rook for bishop. Uh, it's just outstanding. I mean, yes, more of this. Thank God none of us said this was going to be a lame game. Thank God nobody here said that or predicted a draw. I didn't do that. Um, okay, but let's, let's talk about this because if now we know this exchange is going to happen and we know that d6 will be the most natural weakness. I start thinking of other moves like queen d2. Like ju just to say like queen d2 or queen to d1, something like this happens. I think that's now much better than king h1 and, and the computer likes it too because I'm gonna win back some of my material <coughs> here. My bad. You're allowed to sneeze, it's okay. Yeah. We all sneeze. We're all human, Hammer. Um, Amir, your thoughts? Well, I had thoughts uh, which are completely crazy because what, like the second round, I was thinking about actually the second game of the World Championship match where Jan Nepomniachtchi was black, was having mm -hmm. black pieces and Magnus Carlsen was having white. And actually uh, I was a bit surprised that almost no one talked about this game and how it psychologically affected Jan. But I think that was the game actually which broke him. It, he that went- he didn't convert. Yeah, no, the, but the position was so complicated. It's almost like it rem It has nothing to do with this position, but the spirit. It's like it uh, put him on tilt. Hmm. I think so. Starting from this game, he like it affected his. It's so much. So that's exactly the feeling when I look at the position in the. Uh, I get. It's very complicated p position. Uh, maybe black feels that. Or Fabi feels that he is supposed to win, but actually White has so many dynamic resources and uh, so many resources to increase the initiative. And then uh, maybe the position is balanced. Who knows? It's it's fascinating. I, I remember that game, and I I think that I mean Jan had a very big advantage at one point. According to the computers, it. but from the human perspective, and once again, I really had the feeling that it was very difficult and. Especially the feeling that Magnus would gamble mm. in this situation, I think that was uh, really psychological, had a uh, huge psychological effect on Jan. We actually got a move on the board. Yeah, he, he didn't go for it. By the way, the, the computer kind of did like the imbalance of this exchange stack, at least from the perspective that it's unclear. But now he puts the rook on b3. But it's still tricky because the move we thought Bishop could be nice just looks for, good. Uh, for the, black. The rook has to go to b2? No, the rook can capture on the pawn on b7. What? Because it turns out the white bishop on a2 oh, is, protected, is in yeah. fact protected by the white <laughs> I, rook. I literally didn't even see that. And, and if we were to get a trade like this, not only would Nepomniachtchi get back that pawn he lost in yep. the opening, he also has that amazing square on f5. Uh, for his knight, uh, where there are no black pawns that can chase it away, and the white bishop, no, sorry, the light squared bishop, black had, uh, with the exchange of, of those, um, black just has no way of preventing uh, the white knight from moving in afterwards. So I guess he just didn't need to lose his rook, so he, he didn't give it away. Yeah, we just, 
we overreacted, I guess, to bishop e6. I personally, again, fully just wear the egg on my face. I wasn't hmm. even looking at this, but it's obvious now. And But, okay, black, black doesn't have to give back the b7 pawn by developing the bishop. No, and one of the disadvantages of this rook move is that the rook is now blocking white's bishop. We wanted to have that bishop pointing in towards the, the black king, um, but, you know, for material reasons, uh, we haven't been able to, to keep up that pressure. So what, what is black's move now? The, I want to I defend the b-pawn so I can develop the bishop, especially to e6. Can I play a move as slow as b6? Well, then we're back to the Danny plan, right? Mm. If pawn to b6, king f1, uh, king uh, h1. Mm -hmm. And here comes. And the pawn is coming in, putting pressure on those uh, few black pawns that are still protecting uh, the black king. Yep. Uh, and this could be a, a big, big problem uh, moving forward. And can we make a very strange looking move, as, well, like anticipating king h1, king h8? where it's not at all in the spirit of the position. You want to play f5? Well, I want to use it <laughs> as a threat, a possible threat, not for the moment, but then maybe you will play knight f5. What do you think? Knight f5 definitely comes to mind. The moment you put the king on h8, bishop b2 comes to mm -hmm. mind. Exactly. But so. I don't think I can do it right away, because actually maybe I can meet bishop b6 with knight f5. So I mean, I'm not even sure. Nepomniachtchi is that afraid of a black bishop attacking the white rook anymore. Right, right. We've seen so many lines in, in which just giving up the rook uh, would be uh, actually a quite advantageous. Uh, so just threatening the rook in itself uh, is not going to be, um, be a big success for, for Fabiano. I want to give a shout that we've seen some interesting progress in the Nakamura Rajabov game. Hikaru did not take on d5 with the queen. So we'll, we'll get over to that in just a second. I know everyone is kind of asking for maybe a little more Naka coverage from some of the, some of the comments I saw. Okay, Fabi, Fabi has got to figure this out. It, black, he, did, he didn't actually play that. That was my analysis. Got to figure out how to keep his edge. He's up a pawn, but there is work to do. And as, as has now been dubbed, I, I say humbly, the Danny plan. There's, there's potential life here that you have to watch out for. So let's back, let's back up um, either, either to the bird's eye view or we can jump directly over to the Nakamura game. But we'll, we'll get a quick look, a good reset to show everybody where things stand. Hikaru, of course, still has a huge time advantage on the clock. Look at that, an hour and 23 minutes while it is his turn to 38 minutes from Rajabov. And we head over there to see that uh, Hikaru, in that critical position that we left it on, took on d5 with the pawn and not the queen. Yeah, so he didn't want to trade queens because that would put uh, black into this uh, drawing martial mm -hmm. endgame uh, territory where it was unclear how to uh, keep protection of white's most advanced pawn um, yep. in, in the long run. So he took with the pawn. Let's we're we're going to analyze this here to see. We had e takes d five, rook e one, knight e one, queen c four, and then h three. A very uh, anti martial move. Freeze your back rank, a little bit of protection, but it's a slow move. And then bishop d seven. Yeah, I mean, I I would be uncomfortable here as Hikaru because the rook on a one and the bishop on c one, and frankly the knight on e one as well. All of these pieces Hikaru has is just not contributing in the fight right now. And yes, he is up a pawn, but black has some rather commanding bishops uh, about to put their rook from the corner into the center of the board, pointing down uh, towards white's position. Um, I feel like uh, this could be unpleasant for Hikaru, even though he's up a pawn. Well, I completely agree with you because, first of all, I have uh, well, I feel that uh, those bishops are more powerful with queens on board. Mm -hmm. uh, White has well uh, very specific problems uh, while finding out how to coordinate the pieces. So even if you bring finally manage to play, for example, knight c two, bishop b three, bring the rook, then the a two pawn will be hanging. 
and the deep fly found uh, yeah. is of course is very vulnerable so uh, those are the factors that uh, we should of course uh, have in mind when uh, we assess this position so i don't know how uh, to coordinate the pieces should you start with queen f3 bishop b4 or queen f3 knight c2 uh, and then bishop b3 this is a good move queen f3 you because I, I, I wanted to point out, the, the move I keep wanting to play is bishop e3, right? If, mm -hmm. if white could magically take the dark square bishops off the board, white would be incredibly happy, right? But the problem is the only way to offer that trade is this, which we can quickly see. Not that, not that this isn't an option. It, it, it definitely weakens white's kingside structure. It puts a target on the open file. So bishop e3 is the move I want to play, and I wasn't thinking about this move. But this is a very strong move, because now this is a threat. And if you do play rook e8, I can develop to a square that is protected by the queen as well, right? So queen of three, I think, is probably the best move in the position, not just because it threatens bishop e3, but because it guards f4, which finally allows white to complete development and actually do so maybe sort of just in time. Well, actually, I, w I wanted to play knight c2 first because I'm not sure like uh, if a bishop b4 is... Maybe it's a bit premature now, so my plan was to play knight c2. Oh, rook e2. I've missed something, I Fork, think. Fork, I guess. Oh, then I've missed something, because yes, because I was thinking that uh, that was not possible. And why, but is it, then why is it just winning? It must, it must yes, be and I think this is uh, like a it's just simply a very good ah. position. Bishops move backwards, Danny. They don't move like that. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, no, I didn't think that that was possible because, like, in my calculation, like after rook e2, yeah. just to my defense, I was I wanted to play uh, b3, but I probably missed something as well. So, uh, what is that? Uh, ah, you have rook you f2 take. intermediate, of course. So now, now, now that I see the position, yeah, of course. So. Um, because I want to play b3 and then uh, bishop b3 if we exchange queens, of course. But then there is absolutely, uh, like, it's a very nice tactical refutation of... Uh, With rookie 2 So it has mm -hmm. to be either bishop e3 or bishop f4. Hikaru is... But you see how dangerous this position yeah. is? Like, in yeah. one move, it, it came from a little bit bad, slightly better for white to Two. absolutely lost. So um, you have to be... Very careful, but then uh, maybe you have to play bishop b3 now or in the next move. Yeah. Well, Hikaru calculates lines like this for a living. He's the, uh, the most popular chess streamer in the world. Many maybe were surprised by the fact that he made it to the candidates. Uh, but he brings something to the candidates that, of course, none of the other top players do because of his community and his following and his reputation being that of the online Blitz and Bullet legend. So let's remind everybody of who Hikaru Nakamura is as he sits here and thinks in this critical moment. In qualifying for the candidates, Hikaru Nakamura ratcheted up the level of interest in what is already considered the most important tournament in chess. With millions of followers as a popular content creator, Hikaru brings along his sizable community while also attracting more casual chess fans. Although once ranked number two in the world, most believed Nakamura's best days competing in classical chess were behind him. That changed when this Japanese-American grandmaster leaned on his exceptional calculating ability to win the FIDE Grand Prix. The unexpected victory earned him a bid into the candidates for the first time in six years. A five-time U.S. champion, Hikaru has stayed sharp of late by dominating in speed chess formats. Nakamura is currently ranked by FIDE in the top two in both Rapid and Blitz. A chess giant on Twitch and YouTube, Hikaru brings a special buzz to a tournament that already holds the keys to becoming the next world champion. And there are certainly those who have yet to rule out Hikaru from catching lightning in a bottle here in Madrid. Hikaru Nakamura, will he catch lightning in a bottle? It's got to start with a victory, a bounce back, of course, from the first round loss he had to Fabiano Caruana, but his reputation, his career is full of accomplishments that say he can do so. He is, well, he's a five-time U.S. champion. So many things. Uh, he's, uh, he's won the last four Chess.com Speed Chess Championships, which is not an easy feat, and uh, he was the first chess streamer to, on Twitch to reach a million subscribers. Shout out to Agad, Agad Mator, who someone called us out and said, 
that we said he was the first to reach a million on YouTube. That's not what we said. We said Twitch. So take that. Take that Twitch chat. Uh, Hikar was trying to think of what he can what he can do to make sure he doesn't get himself in tactical trouble in this sneakily sharp position here. The rook coming to e8. Yeah, and I, I think he's uh, he's a bit uncomfortable now. I, I think uh, Rajabov has the pressure, uh, and um, the the thing Hikaru has working in his advantage is the time situation. Yeah, he's uh, way up on the clock, uh, and he will try to um, keep the tension. He will try to avoid that it's just traded down to something that's very easy uh, for Black to deal with, uh, and I think that's also why. Uh, Hikaru chose not to trade the queens yeah. because he wants to keep more tension on the board to exploit uh, Rajabov's um, somewhat um, lacking time management. Yeah, that's a, that's a really fair point. I mean, we were talking about him not trading on d5 with the queen for those maybe just tuning in on that point here to, because he didn't want the end game. But another very good practical observation there by Hammer in addition to avoiding the end game and maybe a draw, the more pieces on the board, the harder it is normally for your opponent to play under time pressure. So what do you think about that, Elmira? Well, once again, I think even though that I, I completely agree that this end game had uh, a lot of drawing tendencies, I still think that uh, this choice is very risky. Yeah. Especially that I think that uh, Timur Rajabov, once again, you, you should always think about the position uh, or the type of positions where your opponent excels. And those are two bishops, uh, like with the queen on boards, and uh, very dynamic positions for Timur Rajabov. Well, he's, he's got his work cut out for him. He knows it. He's, uh, he's thinking hard. I still... I still think white has an edge if you find all the right moves, but I guess we've seen so many times that you're tactically right on the edge uh, if, you, if you don't find all the best moves. So, Hikaru, this is, this is a longer thing than we've seen him take in the entire game today. We'll see how long he's on the clock. There are four other games going as well. Let's remind everybody of where each of those stand. I feel like we probably have to give some attention to Jan Christoph Duda and Dingley Ren or the or the chess gods might come after us. Um, I know that... Uh, well, we sort of have like a divine situation right now, like Magnus Carlsen being on Mount Olympus, you know, choosing. Like it's a really like sort of Greek mythology situation. I've been such a fan since I was a, a, like a kid. So we here we have a situation where like an absolute god, you know, mm -hmm might choose or not to play. And who is this hero who is going to be chosen? It would be, it would be interesting if the, uh, the Norwegian final boss, Norwegian chess god, chose not to play. But speaking of other gods, Thor brings down his hammer on a regular basis on Marvel villains across the world. And we bring down the hammer whenever we want to get a little bit more, a little more deep analysis, a little more insight. So. We're, we're, about to, we're about to throw to Hammer and uh, give him an opportunity to look, to look at the Jan Christoph Duda Dingley Ren game. And on that note, let's, uh, let's hook him up. Yeah, Danny. So I thought there was a very interesting moment in this game, which kind of goes against common wisdom. Uh, in this position, from that uh, Duda versus Ding game, uh, Ding actually played the move C5 voluntarily blocking in his bishop here on b6. That bishop is now much less uh, influencing the game because of putting all these pawns on the dark squares. And what is the reasoning uh, then uh, for uh, the top rated player in the event to make such a decision? Well, yes, the black bishop is bad, but so is the white bishop. Ding is arguing that uh, both bishops are being blocked by the black pawns, so both bishops are equally bad. Uh, and uh, this move does allow black to have uh, increased influence uh, in the center of the board. And we're going to actually jump further uh, into the game as well. Um, apparently my, my soft touch is not soft enough uh, sometimes. Uh, but here, in this moment, 
that Ding had actually started putting even more pawns on dark squares, and now he goes ahead and plays the very aggressive g5, a move we will recognize from Nakamura's game yesterday and Fabiano's game today. Ding is really going for that aggression, and he doesn't care that all his pawns are on the dark squares, because yes, the bishop on b6 is terrible, but so is this white bishop on d2. It's just pointing into a wall of black pawns uh, blocking its path. I think this is going to be a very interesting game. And, and I kind of like Ding's position. I, I think he may be able uh, to get something out of this with his aggressive pawn play. A lot of, a lot of maneuvering ahead in that one for sure, right? It's a very going to be... That's a, that's a closed position if I've ever seen one, and I love the uh, love the highlighting of voluntarily blocking in your own bishop like that. You just you don't see that every day. Ding Li Ren in a shorter chair than he was in yesterday. For those who missed that storyline, uh, all the other players playing in the chair with the big back, but uh, Ding doesn't want that. Every time, like uh, I look at your music, I'm thinking like about the song by Peter Gabriel. It's like. I want to be your sledgehammer. <laughs> sledgehammer. I, I mean, Hammer, there's so many ways to just, you know, have a good time with you. Especially when you're over there playing playing Weatherman, you know? Yeah, King Fluff, man. <laughs> you're stealing viewers' comments, uh, Dan. Yeah, there's uh, a little bit of a storm moving in on the eighth rank, right? Maybe, uh, maybe a pawn storm. LOL. How about that for an awkward chess pun? I'll be here all week, everybody. Don't forget to tip your waitress. I kind of liked it, Danny. Pawn storm? That, that's precisely what Ding is doing. He's using his pawns aggressively to storm against the, uh, the white uh, king. Barry Chess wanted to know, what's the forecast? I hopped in the chat. One of the best things about you heading over to the Telestrator, as we're calling it, the Maurice Monitor, as it's been dubbed throughout most chess commentary lands, is that it gives me a chance to hop on chat about cloudy with a chance of bad bishops. Let's keep, come on, this is awesome, <laughs> Natasha Archer. Do we got more? <laughs> I love this. So we got, we, we see a pawn storm moving in from the north. We've got cloudy with a chance of bad bishops. By the way, cloudy with a chance of meatballs as a dad. One of the most underrated animated films. A film, not a movie. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs is a film. Hurricane Ding to make the landfall. I love it. Uh, it's good stuff. This well, is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah. You look good over there. You maybe could be a weatherman. It's, it's not as easy as it looks because you're constantly looking at yourself on the monitor, which is like reversed, right? It's, it's, not, it's not easy. So but we're gonna it's breaking the codes of uh, traditional weathermen, no? Don't yeah. you think so? Traditional weathermen are very good at what they do, I would say. It's a very hard job. <laughs> That's what I had in mind. <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad that he brought uh, this C5 move because it was yeah. like one of my um, undisclosed desires, if I might say, like to, to come to this position and to understand it. Yeah. Hammer, will you give us a forecast um, of this one here? Well, I, I, I think we said it, right? Uh, <laughs> Hurricane Ding on the way with a pond storm. And uh, if, if, I was, uh, if I was Ding in this position, I would be massively tempted uh, to play the move f5. All um, in on the pawn storm. Yeah. Good but get. I, I guess the concern is that when you start pushing your pawns forward, there's l less pawns uh, protecting that um, a black king. And, and also, in, in this concrete situation, um, if Ding pushes his pawn forward here, uh, then the move e takes f5, uh, knight takes back, and then knight e4. And, oh, wow. and white's knight gets a very nice position uh, in the middle of the board. Uh, and I would imagine it's uh, this kind of play uh, Ding is uh, considering at the moment. And I wanted to just to point out that these moves like c5, first of all, deprived white of any positional uh, like idea of playing d4 first, yeah. g5 deprived of any counterplay, so uh, with f4. And then I wanted simply to come back a little bit later after knight e7, that, and that explains the move b4 that white played. Because yeah, right here. Uh, yeah, a little like after knight e7, yes. Uh, Duda did everything just to, uh, well, to play b4 because he needed 
a plan and something yeah. very active. So there, there, there really, there really weren't any other plan. That's what you're saying, right? F4 has been shut down for business. D4 has been shut down for business. It's fascinating. You know how weird this sort of closed, as we said, cloudy with a chance of bad bishop's position is, is when you get a chance to open up your bishop, you choose not to. You don't even take it. You take it with the pawn because you care so much about keeping this structure closed, even at the cost of this uh, bad bishop. Oh, man. All right. Well, a lot of people care a lot about opportunities to play an online chess that matters, big events. We're bringing them to you. The first ever chess.com global championship. Qualifiers are well underway, and we'd like to see what our amazing community has achieved. What, what can you achieve? You can submit your best game, and we might show it live next week. So if you've played in the chess.com global championship, use the command submit in chat for more info. We'd love to see what the community has been up to, and if you think you've played one of the best games so far in the chess.com global championship, qualifiers are running every weekend, submit it and we will review it, and maybe maybe we'll announce it on uh, the candidates show, who knows, so. All right, back to Dingley Ren's game. A takes B3 was played, and after the bishop found safety, wait, no, he hasn't played at five, sorry, that was mm -hmm. my analysis there. So we're still on the clock here with Dingley Ren considering. Open it up or keep it closed? Yeah, and I mean, if Ding is happy with the draw here, he can just sit and wait. There's nothing really white can do in this uh, position. White has an extra pawn on the side of the board, uh, the pawn on a2. Uh, and this is a passed pawn because it cannot be interrupted by any black pawns on its way uh, down. The problem is that uh, Ding, uh, he can just put both his rooks on that uh, uh, a-file, yeah. uh, and he'll just put tremendous pressure down on the pawn, and there's no way that pawn is going to make it all the way uh, to becoming a new queen. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it's interesting to see uh, what level of ambition uh, Ding is going to show now. Is he going to take risks to go for the win? Uh, or is he just going to settle for a draw in a position where neither player really can make uh, any progress? Yeah, it's a good question. I predicted a draw. I'm sure he cares about that. I'm sure he wants to prove me right. So he probably mm -hmm. won't play for a win because of that. Well, I do like uh, rook a7, uh, rook a8 idea, but then I feel that after queen b1, there won't be much progress. So the rook on e2 also protects, and then I can even triple uh, on the b file. I can play rook e, b2. So uh, on the other hand, I think maybe he can seize uh, the momentum now and play knight g6 and bring his knight mm -hmm. to f4. But it's starting to see like he has a full board Plan. I mean, you can double rooks on the mm -hmm. A file. You could you could play for this. So he's got a full a full view of his options, and we've got an amazing view of the Palacio de Santonia. But I, I think, love it. I Go think ahead. that I will always be able to exchange those rooks. So like queen b one, rook b seven. That was my idea. Also, so uh, uh, yeah. But still, I mean, Ding is in control, right? I mean, like you can exchange the rooks, but like I think you can kind of try to play on both sides of the board here for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. If the knight ever comes to f4 and the exchange happens, maybe then the g-file becomes open, right? There's, I'm not, you know, claiming like some big advantage, but it feels like a very comfy position for, for black. Queen e8, so... Uh... Hmm. Ding is trying to play the move h5. Mm -hmm. uh, his queen now protecting that square, enabling the pawn to move forward. I like that. Uh, and this is going to be in like a, a heavyweight uh, duel um, where uh, both players are trying to make some progress, but it seems uh, difficult for uh, both of them. And, and with that, I thought maybe we should head over uh, to Nepomniachtchi and uh, Karana because Nepomniachtchi has just played the Danny plan. He did. Can yeah, you eat one, or what did he? Yeah, play? we're gonna do that. Let's let's head on over to the Yonda Pomnishi Fabiano Caruana game because Mr. Caruana looks a little. I don't know. He looked a little tense there. He gave the the Fabi neck rub. There's kind of a patented Fabi move where he kind of leans over and rubs his neck. A little bit of a stress reliever there. They've got King H2 on the board after. So we left it on B5. Okay, B5 was mm -hmm. clearly a better way to play. Uh, than I was thinking with b6. I think the main tactic, just to show everybody, is that if you take twice, the bishop doesn't hang. We already solved that. But bishop a6 is likely a problem here. 
But on the other hand, if the bishop comes out there to attack the white rooks, we've kind of discussed the possibility of uh, not being so afraid of losing our rook yep. if it means that we can maybe get our knight into the attack against the, the black queen. So like no, none of the moves here are, are obvious and sacrifices uh, are possible at, at every junction. Well, it's funny because Jan didn't take there. He played knight to f5. And after queen to f6, he played king h2. The Danny plan. The Danny plan. He's playing for f4. I mean, if f4 happens and the king side opens up, we are, we are in an all-out slugfest. It would be very, very dangerous for Caruana. We said he played like Hikaru did yesterday, and, and in that game... Everyone was skeptical of the, of the risk that Hikaru took by castling short. We haven't been that skeptical of Fabi's approach here. It's a, been a different type of position. But if this position blows open, we might start, uh, start talking a little bit about Fabi's choice here to play so aggressively with the black pieces. Yes, and rook g3 is also a massive threat now. Oh, rook g3 yes, first, yes. And, and then both f4 and h4. Or oh, knight h6, you know, I always look at some uh, concrete sacrifices. Of course, f4, but rook g3, knight h6, and bishop g5. I like that. Rook g3 threatens knight h6, bishop to g5. Everything blows open. Well, even in this position, right, Almira, earlier you suggested the move knight takes h6. As just at this moment, even immediately, oh, wow. that's yes, a exactly. That's uh, so. Okay. That's maybe the like. Although, is there wait? There, sh there is always a defensive resource with knight g four. Maybe knight the, the king. Okay, is let's show it okay. before we get two in our heads and everyone yes. we lose everyone. Just to show a random move. The point is that mm -hmm. if if captures captures bishop takes, there was some idea that queen takes mm -hmm. could be met by rook g three. But as Elmira pointed out, there's always a knight g four in the end. Maybe other things, but knight mm -hmm. g4 check interposes the pin, and white keeps, uh, or sorry, black keeps the queen. So this would be fantastic. But it, it, but this is a great idea, right? We have to watch out for this shot. Honestly, it's getting so dangerous here. If I'm Fabi, why am I not just taking this? Uh, because then you have no light squared control in the position, and you let the the white bishop on a2 be be unopposed with its pressure uh, down towards the black king. But you get rid of such a dangerous knight, on the other hand. I think that's, uh, uh, that's probably the right continuation here. You get rid of not only of the knight, but like of half of the threats, potential threats, yeah. maybe. Um, I, I really don't like you this don't like position this as well? for, for Fabiano, no. Uh, I can see that the, the engine is suggesting B takes A4. Here? Uh, yeah. Uh, and then moving the rook over to attack the black king. Uh, and then, like, these... Um, here, Fabiano is up two pawns. But those two pawns are the pawns on a6 and a4. And I really struggle to see any chance of those pawns getting past the white bishop. The white bishop is on the light squares, and you just exchanged off the only uh, piece that could challenge this white bishop, which means that your extra pawns on the queen side are probably not that significant. So, um, I mean, it's a tremendously interesting position, but I, I think both players feel like uh, they have chances to win here. Fabiano yeah. with uh, potentially two pawns up, and Nepomniachi with some very dangerous bishops pointing in towards the black queen. A uh, king. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think, but I think, as Elmira said, you're you're kind of picking poisons, right? I mean, you want to trade off the light square bishop and leave Jan with the knight, or would you rather take your take your chances in a, in a position where yes, white dominates the light squares, but as we analyzed, sorry, not that, and bishop takes f5. Mm -hmm. At least you have a bunch of pawns. Maybe you use the b file to get active and 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 try to playing some active defense, but for sure, I, I'm with you, Hammer. I mean, this, you probably have to already put the king on h8 or h7. I don't know which one. But that's actually what I wanted to do without taking on, on a4. Maybe, like, you're winning a tempi, but still, yeah. uh, maybe it's useful for black to start immediately with the move, uh, like, king h7. Right. Not well, to even take even on now a4. You can play it. 
Oh, you think that even now it's possible? Okay, you brought like another piece into attack, so... Yeah. It's very unclear. Wow. But I well, think maybe like bishop f5 is the lesser of the evils, like if we... Oh, but it looks like he's moved. Did he, did he play b takes a4? Okay, maybe it's just a transposition, so maybe uh -huh. like after okay, like... Yeah. So he took first, and maybe with the intention of capturing on f5 so next, let's depending say, on where let's the rook goes. But I wonder if there's something subtle about if the rook commits to g3 right away, if he has a different plan. We're going to find out, because Jan doesn't take a lot of time. Vintage Jan coming out here. It took a lot of time to start, but as we look at the gap between the two players on the clock, becoming less and less. At one point, Caruana earlier in this game had about an hour advantage, so... This is a, uh, what do you, what do you feel when you, when you can, when you're sitting across from your opponent and you can see in their body language, you can see in the rhythm of their moves that they're feeling, right? Stella got their groove back, if, the, if you will. How do you feel when Stella gets her groove back, Hammer? Danny, I just want to say that all your, I mean, Chad is calling me out for not getting your references. But people need to understand that not only is Danny way older than me, <laughs> uh, he is also American, and, and I am Norwegian. We have a, a very different uh, cultural backgrounds, and as such, the references are prone to, to being misunderstood or unknown at times. Okay, well, good. Uh, okay. This is such an eloquent speech, you know, like, uh, hats off, <laughs> hats off, really. <laughs> Well, I know myself that there are a lot of things that uh, when I was traveling uh, to the United States that I was missing at times and uh, like my first Thanksgiving was only at 2019 which I've spent like watching American football yeah. you know and we had a turkey and I felt that it was such a special moment but those were the things that I only saw in movies yep. and I was like so the They're turkey <laughs> American culture I guess eating too much food and watching Grown men beat each other up. Anyway, let's watch. Let's take a look at Bobby's really path. Enjoy the American Speaking of grown men beating <laughs> each grown other men up. beating each other up, we're going to have a lot of grown men beating each other up here in Madrid for the next few weeks. And Bobby has some uh, some interesting matchups ahead of him. Right, the head-to-head -head scores that he has against most are are good. Other than that that big one you circled there in the middle against Dingley Wren. I, I don't know what speaks to you guys here. Hammer your thoughts on uh, what speaks to you about about Bobby's path as it as it stands well actually um i'm i i've been uh ripping into this uh, ding versus uh, carana uh matchup uh where i i saw that fabiano has a quite significant negative score uh but i was made aware by robert hess mm. uh that uh in fact two of those wins for ding like two of uh, fabiano's losses are in fact from when they were like 12, 13 years old. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, it's not that bad. Ding has the better score against uh, another one of the pre-tournament favorites, but uh, he's going to go into that um, not as confident as these numbers uh, may suggest. Speaking of context to be added to the score as well, we hear the context about his record with Ding Li Ren because a couple games from their youth Further context, just everyone pointing it out, we know that it is now eight wins versus Hikaru Nakamura. This was the head-to-head -head by round coming in. So his record now against Hikaru is eight wins and five losses. So we, we, we see you, chat. We, we know. We're, we're all over it here. All right. We'll go back to the game here. What do we think? We've got uh, another move being played. It was King H7, Almira, as we were talking about. And you suggested perhaps the power of playing this move before taking the knight, right? Flexibility, I think, kind of favors Fabi as he's defending this position a little bit. Well, first of all, King safety. I don't know, he already, well, played quite a risky move, G5. So I think this is very consistent. Also very consistent of Fabi maybe playing for more. So I, I, I think that uh, he still feels that uh, even though that this position is very complicated, that three results are still possible. Yeah. So um, I'm really amazed of how um, how 
they evaluate uh, how strong players uh, evaluate the position. Yeah. So how, uh, like, f finally? No, that's like, because the smallest nuance, like, can influence their assessment, and they, they have this feeling it's almost intuitive now. So. Because I always overestimate, like I have this tendency to overestimate, the, yes, and, uh, and I think that uh, mm, this is a very uh, powerful demonstration of how uh, they lead plays. Yep, I'm also guilty of that. I think it is a, a, another common trait. We talked about short-term memory loss being a common trait among the elite, right? They just they, they let go of their mistakes very quickly. I think another common trait is, like we said, lack of emotion there. They don't. They're just very skeptical of their own chances in a healthy way all the time. It kind of helps keep them in check as they play very complicated positions. And Jan, Jan at the same time, though, he has to smell a little bit of blood here, right? And he also probably has to have the sense that it's almost now or never, right? He's going to really think about this position before letting Fabi off the hook because if he doesn't convert, now Bishop takes f5 as a threat. Mm, you know, there's bishop b1 at some point, maybe then. You, you won't take twice, because yes. at the end there's bishop to b1 in, in some positions, in some positions not, maybe yes, not right away. Course. There's also f4, though, so probably he's just sitting here thinking, all right, well, Fabi's allowing f4. Let's go, big fella. Let's look at it. Let's analyze f4. I mean, actually, I don't understand why he can't just play f4 and pry open the g-file. I, I guess he's considering sacrificing the knight first. But I mean, either f4, like opening up towards the black queen. G, f4, g king. takes f4, mm -hmm. bishop takes f4. Now you have to take on f5 because you, th there is no way you can protect on h6. Yep, takes f5. Mm -hmm. E takes f5. And now maybe rook g8 to exchange one rook. It's very important like to exchange attacking pieces. Yeah, and if black can start taking any pieces off the board at this point, as ugly as these pawns might look, they are extra. So with every piece that comes off the board, every ounce of pressure that black can relieve from white's attack, is just going to be maybe a winning endgame. So you have to be, uh, you have to be really precise if you're going to go for these concrete lines with f4, and that's kind of what Jan must be calculating. I want, I want to look at this, though. Is there anything? I know pots are c-check, pots are play-check. But I was looking at, at the G file and wondering if there was anything here. Oh, I completely forgot about this check. But I, then, I think uh, it's probably just horrible because after the king moves, it's like, now what do you do? Yeah, eight, computer's yes. like, yeah, good job, Dan. Because the point is now you're taking and the rook's falling. So I knew it was bad, but I just had to point it out that it was a check. So that means? That means that this line is forced, so maybe bishop of five. It's, mm -hmm. And then rook G8. I actually really like your, I mean, this... This looks like a very reasonable guess of where this game might head, and not because we're trying to play guess the move necessarily, which of course you can do on chess.com, it is a feature, um, but... But on the other hand, like, uh, this light square bishop that white yeah, still it's has, monster. it's like, it's a monster. Let's say bishop d5, Kay. it protects on g2, yeah. and controls the a2, attacks the f7, a8, so it's like, uh, it's such a powerful piece right now. Yeah, that's a monster in the middle of the board. That is not a bishop. That is a monster. So yeah, I, I, it's just a weird position, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, you can't help think about the pawns and the Ebel bar, but this is why Hammer didn't like it. He's like, look, this is, this is a really tough position for black because of white's dominance of the particular light square color complex. And I'm not even sure that if uh, black would win a third pawn on f5, that, you know, th this position uh, would be winning. We have action. And like I said, not playing guess the move just to do that, but to try to maybe anticipate, if we can, what the storyline of this game might be, what the players are looking at. And it, you can just tell that Bobby has to be feeling ha happy that there's no concrete sacrifices, maybe, but he has to be feeling the, 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 the pressure here as Jan is now untying the pieces. These are pieces that were given big tasks earlier in the game. Now the queen mm -hmm. is coming to a4, maybe coming to d1. 
we already talked about the bishop. It feels like with every move that Jan kind of re-coordinates the pieces with the looming threat to blow things open. You know what? It reminds me also of the yesterday's game. He didn't play g5, the move that we were analyzing for quite a while, and he chose a very specific moment to do so. So I think that we are completely obsessed during, uh, like, our games with concrete variations, right. but maintaining the pressure and maintaining the chaos on the board is uh, is very important. And yeah. so not going for the concrete line because he's absolutely sure that Fabiano has calculated it and calculated it precisely, but he increases the pressure. Yeah. So this is the, uh, this queen d1 move is uh, absolutely brilliant from yeah. this point of view. Yeah. For those who don't remember the critical moment Almir is talking about is that we knew Jan was better with black against Dingley Ren. There was all this pressure mounting, but we, we established just how brilliant it was that he didn't go for the knockout blow until Ding was also under time pressure. So just those practical sort of elements and, and uh, you know, things that, that the players are doing in these games as, a as, a, as an overall strategy is fascinating. So maybe Jan knows that at some point he's going to be all in on an idea like this. Keeping it flexible, you also still keep the h4 option open, which we've talked about sneakily. It's, it's still something to keep our eye on. There's also your sacrifice idea, right? And now the queen is adding other elements for black to think about. So I agree. This is, this is, this is going to be a very, very interesting position for Fabi to figure out, knowing the potential dangers. Um, and that Jan is playing faster, playing more confident with every step. So, all right, I think we have to look at some of the other... Lots of stuff happening in the uh, rapport for Rouge game, but that's one we haven't checked on in a very long time as we look at the mm -hmm. bird's eye view. Only one move has been played in the Nakamura Rajabov game, and it was the moves we predicted. The queen came back to f3, and the rook came over to e8. So now, as long as Hikaru doesn't blunder knight c2, we expect bishop e3 or bishop f4 to be on the board. Can we have just a quick look on. Uh... At Richard Rapport versus Ali Reza Firouz's game. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. we should. Again, just happy birthday. Happy birthday to Ali Reza Firouz. I almost just, I almost just bursted into song. You are so welcome, chat, because you guys know, you don't know what I'm going to do. I almost just started singing happy birthday. Because <laughs> I said happy birthday twice by accident. It's rude to not sing someone happy birthday. Anyway, we're not going to be that. Do you, do you have a dress? A, a dress? A dress, yes. Like Marilyn. So like oh, that's oh now that would be something. <laughs> if I, if, how about if Ferruja wins the candidates, we'll do a Marilyn, a Marilyn Monroe happy birthday, Mr. President. I'm not going to do that. While actually. dancing flamenco. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that I want I, to I see. Already owe a, I already owe an Andrea Botez like, cat maid dress or something. I don't know. I st I'm going to do it. It was a charity event, so I got to do some cat maid thing. All right. But where are we at here? This is an end game. It has been for a very long time between these two young gentlemen playing in their first candidates, each respectively. We'll back up a little bit to where the queens were traded. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Just wanted to note a few changes in the positions. So like now the uh, black spawn is like on the B file. So. Yep. Yeah, so there's a, it's... yeah, if we just, if we fast forward in Tarantino, mm -hmm. the position, we've had A captures to the B file, which doesn't actually solve the C6 weakness problem, which was the biggest weakness in the previous structure, but it does give black some new chances and some new pressure as compensation for it. So how did that happen? Well, on the other hand, he doesn't have his pair of bishops anymore. So ah, that's the other thing. So mm -hmm. let's see how we got there. We saw the rook come to C1, rook A6, mm -hmm. typical stuff. Okay, now we can already anticipate where we're going here. The knights remaneuvered along with the bishops developing. And the one early observation I have to make, Almira, is what did Rapport do with his king in this structure in the endgame? He brought it to the queen side. And ultimately, that paid huge dividends for him defensively and to maneuver. Farouche's king on this side of the board is never going to be a helping factor to the weak c6 pawn. So we have to keep an eye on that storyline. Should Rapport find a way to get, get something um, in this endgame, it, it, it may be because of a uh, lack of sufficient defense to this weak c6 pawn. So the bishop was exchanged on b4, as you said. Bishop well, pair no longer. It improved black like, structure, pawn structure, but on the other hand, of course, it created like, well, it's balanced. You have the weakness on a2 now and the weakness yep. on b4. So, uh, yeah, and uh, even though c6 is still weak, if a2 is to fall, even b2 could come under fire unless the rooks are traded. So, so quite the. 
quite the interesting end game. Again, I know this is a queens off the board position, so it doesn't, doesn't scream fire on board like some of the other games, but the more I look at it, the more I feel like we could, we could still have a decisive result in this game. I actually really like the idea of moving this bishop mm -hmm. to d6, hit the rook, and then use the, use the c file if I can to try to bring pressure to the c6 pawn. Maybe I have to play b3 at some point and then play rook c2, because if I can block the bishop's defense of a2, then I can use the second rank to guard a2 and double rooks? Well, that's, I have a feeling that white is slightly better and mostly uh, because look at those knights. The knight on g6, you know, uh, doesn't have many prospects, so you should bring it to play probably via f8, maybe knight f8, knight d7, uh, or you know, knight d7, then at some point they can take it and win on c6, so, mm -hmm. and knight on d2 goes to c4, knight d6 as well, so are you going to uh, exchange it. Yeah. Shout out to Robert Hess, who, if he was here, he would highlight the pawn's ability to corral and tame a knight. A wild, a wild beast stallion becomes a bit of a donkey against a pawn, uh, either on on b3 or g3, and a pawn in front of its structure. Right. That's a that's against the Soviet chess school. I, I know it. I, I know what you were going to say. Um, but right, but By the still... way, we have Richard Rapport on our screen, and we were talking a lot about music. So does he look like a rock star? He does look like a rock star, plus the shirt there. And what a great comment here from chat from Casey. I think Casey Abel. Rook B8 is forced to protect the pawn, kind of groveling as a move. I, I, I guess so. You're right. I mean, Ferruja knows he's, uh, he's on the defense. But what I was about to get to, and, and with Hammer here back with us in studio, I want to ask... What's the plan for white? So we've highlighted the dysfunction for black. The knight is corralled. Black has to defend two weaknesses now. A bit of a groveling move, right, according to Twitch chat. But how does white make progress? Well, I guess that's why uh, Rapport is, is thinking right now. He, he needs to, he has maximized his position so far. And he needs to figure out what's next. Um, and to be honest, I'm, I don't think it's, it's obvious because the, the uh, black bishop on e6 is doing a really good job of discouraging the, the white knight from getting into the game. Yeah. Um, so I would like to get my knight involved, um, but I'm not sure how I'm going to accomplish that. What, what, what kind of credit do you give to my plan of b3? I kind of like it. Uh, Danny. The, let, let's say we play it, and the idea is, again, by eliminating the threat, the only way that black can increase the threat is to double, which would be an exchange of b for a, but in theory, I guess it should also drop the c6 pawn. I, I see the tactics with b3 falling as well at the end, but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll calculate that. The, the idea if black were to do nothing is to play rook c2, to double, and only then try to release the bishop with some sort of threat, because one idea, Almira, is at some point you might actually trade A for C if white can do that with some firepower, right? If the pieces can get active on the C file, you might make a trade like that. Well, I agree with this, of course, but for, for me, that like uh, the most natural trade here would be in the long term, like I would win maybe the A2 pawn, you will win the B4. So, yeah. And then you will try to win the C6. Here. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm actually quite intrigued also by a suggestion the computer made in the initial position. A move I don't think I would have come up with myself uh, out of the blue. Uh, it's the move A3, uh, where the idea is uh, that after black makes the trade, uh, white will recapture with a rook, um, and then we're going to see a trade of rooks as well. Uh, and if that uh, rook trade happens, uh, then white can recapture with a pawn. Mm. I, I wasn't sure what you were going to say. I think both yeah. are possible. I, I really like this pawn takes because then you can uh, try and get that pawn up the, the side of the board. And, and black's pieces aren't really in a, in a situation uh, to prevent that so easily. And in fact, it is this A3 move that uh, Rapport just uh, made on the board. Wow, look at you calling the shot. What are you, Babe Ruth over there? Uh, we don't have, there's baseball. no other country <laughs> than the US that plays baseball. Okay, well, you mentioned 
baseball. I will I will come back to your disparaging comment against the great American go, pastime in a minute. But first, go I have to say that we have not a baseball <laughs> event coming up, but we do have an NFL event just around the horizon. Blitz Champs is coming this July. It's going to be amazing. You can see, watch your favorite NFL stars compete for their share of $100,000 for charity. The legendary wide receiver Larry Fitzgerald, as you can see, kind of kind of headlines the event. Cave on Thibodeau has an active fan club on chess.com. Amari Cooper may or may not be streaming chess lessons soon. Wink, wink, hint, hint. Micah Parsons. So many things. You can catch Cleveland Browns receiver, like we said, Amari Cooper. Dallas Cowboys linebacker Micah Parsons and uh, the top drive, top five draft pick there. So it, it's going to be awesome. Tune in. It's July 9th and 10th in the afternoons. It's not Pog Champs, but it's the first kind of non-chess endemic celebrity event we've done in a while, and we're pretty excited about it, and uh, we hope to see you there right after the candidates. It's our next big event, July 9th and 10th. So A takes, A, A3 was played, Rook has taken on A3, Hammer's idea lives. And uh, you knew who Babe Ruth was when I said you were calling your shot, though. Of course. I, I did, Of yeah. course. And it was a great segue. You think I did that on purpose? Well, I, I don't know the reference. I just know he's a baseball player. Oh, he, player. he, he came to the plate and, like, held his bat out, and the legend is he was calling his shot because he then hit a home run to exactly where he was pointing. It could also be that he was just stretching. I, I don't know that it was ever confirmed, actually, on record. Well, I mean, if I was just stretching and then hit a home run in that area, I wouldn't confirm or deny either. Yeah. Okay. I, I do know an incredible story about a chess game calling their shot, if you want to hear that. Yeah. So... First ever tournament I, tur tournament I ever organized back when I was a tournament organizer in Arizona, Copper State International, and Daniel Fridman, German Grandmaster, was there, along with Anna Zatonsky. But in the last round, he played the black pieces against a buddy of mine, David Pruis. And I had every title player, because I brought in title players from all over the world, first time I'd ever done that. Big deal for me, I had everyone sign the board, right? And David went over to the F7 square and signed F7 and said, I'm going to sacrifice on F7 and win this game. And he sacrificed on F7 and won a brilliant checkmate attack against Grandmaster Daniel Fridman, who was, for the point everybody was, it was probably easily 150 feet, eight points stronger. So it was, that was literally a big deal, calling your shot. So. Everyone loves a good Pruis story. Yeah, everyone loves a good <laughs> David Pruis story. Shout out to David Pruis, Chess Dojo Live. If you're looking for a great Twitch channel with educational content, give him a, give him a follow, give him a sub. So, all right. We're back to the games here. Do we want to go to a bird's eye view and... and uh, Take things a different direction. No, just that, that was the position on the board I, I, while you were well, telling a ridiculous telling, story. No, that was a very nice story. It's like I always love a nice story. <laughs> I was trying to um, uh, to find a way to avoid those exchanges. For example, to play rook b8 in this position, but maybe then white can play rook a c3, and that's how you double on the c file also. Mm. Yeah, the rook comes from a3 to c3 in a different way, and then the bishop could come back to a3. We're talking about the game. If you look in the in the upper left corner there, for those sorry sorry that it's in your head, but uh, we're gonna head over to the Nakamura mm -hmm. game. His battle versus Tamor Rajabov is uh, stuck kind of, kind of right where we left it. Uh, the position is very tense for Nakamura, and you can tell because he doesn't use his time lightly, right? Hikaru doesn't uh, spend time on the clock unless he really has to, but really giving this position a deep think before making a commitment. He spent 32 minutes on queen f3, for the record. And, I mean, he spent so much time on, on this move as well. At some point, Hikaru was up an hour on the clock. Right now, that time advantage has shrunk to one minute. He, he is uh, very uncomfortable with his position right now. Yeah. Let's, I mean... Uh, are we going to try to predict what lines he's in? I mean, he's thinking so deeply. You have to wonder what he's struggle evaluate, what he's struggling to evaluate. Maybe, about the decision maybe. He that, first of all, that's the variation. Maybe he was planning to play knight c2, mm. also bishop b3. He knows he needs to exchange this bishop. So, right. uh, well, it didn't work out like in a in an ideal world. You want to take with the knight on e3. So yeah. uh, he probably realizes that he has to play bishop b3 and take with the pawn. Yeah, and again, for anyone just tuning in. Almir could very well be right. Maybe when he first started this whole line, because Hikaru wouldn't make the blunder right in front of him. And, but I think you might be onto something, because he didn't go for the end game. And maybe when he first started this line, he thought 
that he could get knight c2 in, right? Now he's recognized that knight c2 would be an immediate blunder. Again, as we said, we showed this line earlier. So he has finally moved, and indeed he has committed to bishop e3, mm -hmm. where he will now have to take back with the pawn because he didn't have time for knight to c2. The structural change still gives white a tiny edge, but this, this already feels way worse. Although it does feel a little better hammered that that dark square bishop is off the board. Man, that guy was dangerous. Yeah, for sure. But now and if I, I play b4, just because I don't want you to, uh, to let you fix my pawns, so be, because you can play a3 and then still fix my pawns b4, a very uh, aggressive move. I like that. Well, in some ways, it's also a very defensive move. Because when you're uh, defending, when you're uh, trying to uh, equalize uh, um, an inferior position, uh, you will often want to make pawn trades. Uh, and if all the pawns disappear off the board, you can even make a draw uh, if you lose your bishop. Yeah. So exchanging pawns is one of the key ways of, of trying to defend a problematic situation. Uh, and I, I agree with Omira, this b4 looks like a really good move, uh, both because it gets rid of black's doubled pawns, but also because now uh, the, the black queen uh, is, is able to make many more threats on the white position that, than she was earlier. Also, I wanted to open some files. I didn't, I um... Yeah, I, I also just want to highlight, because you said mm -hmm. it so quickly, I think it was really instructive, that the threat is a3. White. Yeah, this is a position. Of, well, it's in my mind, you know. It's so. It's uh, but. No, I think it's a really strong point. I think, especially because when when most most levels of chess play, we think of threats as attacking moves, right? Threatening to win a piece. But this is a very real threat because if the structure is fixed, not only will the pawns remain doubled, the bishop will remain less active, and that allows a knight who thrives on maneuvering to kind of slowly work different angles. So I really like the idea of b4. Should, should Rajabov choose to take? He, he hasn't moved yet, is there? Yeah, there, I think he played bishop b3. Uh, Rajabov has not played bishop b3. No, 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 I think Hikaru played No, no, Hikaru has. No, yes, I, I was I, saying Rajabov hasn't mm -hmm. moved yet. I was just mm -hmm. about to ask, is there any other option besides taking? No. Right? That, that's what I was getting to, is Rajabov hasn't moved yet, but I'm not sure what else he could be thinking about. So, the... All right, well, Rajabov is thinking here, and as we've said, Several times, he's the oldest player in the field, and that doesn't, that doesn't mean he has any less chances to win. That means he's one of the most experienced players in the field. We're going to jump into our highlight and player profile on Tamo Rajabov and his career and how he got here to Madrid. The oldest player in Madrid at age 35, Timur Rajabov is competing for the third time at the candidates and for the first time in nine years. Once ranked in the top five in the world, Raja qualified for the candidates two years ago, but was unable to compete due to COVID concerns. For this year's tournament, FIDE offered Raja a wild card, which Raja accepted. Born in the same Azerbaijani city as former world champion Garry Kasparov, Raja beat Garry Kasparov at age 15. In fact, he has never lost to the former world champion. One of the peak achievements of Rajabov's career was his victory at the FIDE World Cup. In that tournament, he defeated the top seed Ding Liren in the final to qualify for the 2020 Candidates Tournament. In Madrid, Raja hopes that he can lean on his experience at the Candidates to post some impressive performances even though expectations for him here are not as high as they once were. Gary Kasparov lost to Tamer Rajalov in the Lenari's tournament. Maybe that was when Raja really first arrived, I guess. But this guy, he's had a quite the interesting career, Hammer. He's a three-time European champion. He played in the 2011 and 2013 candidates. He won the World Cup. Remember, he would have played in the last candidates if not for COVID concerns, right? So I think that's a really interesting stat that he could also be another player playing in his fourth candidates, technically, because he willingly withdrew Right, and turned out he was right. Otherwise, he would have a stat there just like Fabiano, which is his fourth candidate, is underway. So, talk a little bit about Tamer Rajabov. Maybe not as well known as some of the other players, Tamer, but I think there's a there's a lot a lot a lot to this guy. 
Yeah, I know, and he has really excelled in knockout tournaments. Uh, he he is a very very difficult player to beat, and, and he has shown a lot of great nerve uh, in managing to to win the the FIDA World Cup, um, which which then is the direct reason uh, he's uh, he's here today. So um, he's um, he's a player that it's very difficult to beat. But he's uh, struggling with winning games. Mm. And, and in fact, Rajabov has not won a game of classical chess uh, for several years. Yes, he hasn't been very active because of the pandemic. Right. But, but he's looking down a very unfortunate stat- uh, statistic that he will want to turn around uh, here in Madrid. What do you think about that, Almira, as a guy who's been playing for a really long time? Certainly he's had many great victories in his career, or he wouldn't be here, but is that, is that playing with your mind a little bit? You start to maybe make decisions at some point that you wouldn't otherwise make because of the, the self-imposed pressure to get, to get a W? Uh, this might certainly be true, but maybe not true for this tournament, because like, as we all know, f- like, the first place is at stake. So right. probably you can, you can play in an absolutely different manner here. And I think that uh, that's what he was doing already, f- starting from the first round. Uh, he might have in a very unfortunate tournament, like in Norway, for example, but let's say it was a training session. So you were trying new openings, or you were trying to get the feel of your opponents in the games. But um, here, well, you can sacrifice it all, like you just uh, and try to win the tournament. Yeah, I guess interesting point. He's. He does. He doesn't have to break his uh, his draw streak so aggressively. That's kind of the point, right? In, a, in an event like this, unless you really start to see someone run away with it, someone is just on fire. For the most part, you're still in it as long as you're not losing, right? And if he will be able to uh, to play the way he played before, I remember so many of the of his King's Indian sacrifices, yeah. absolutely brilliant sacrifices. So that's just so to bring the kid. Yeah. You know, so it's no, he, to play for the beauty of the game, of course, and the stakes are very high here. Well, he was very well known for the Kings Indian, of course, also from Azerbaijan. At one point, they were talking about him as the second boy from Baku. For those who don't know the nickname for Gary Kasparov, the boy from Baku, uh, Rajabov, also from the same hometown. In fact, funny story, the first time I met Rajabov, he was 15, playing in a tournament in Moscow, lost a blitz tournament, lost to Gary Kasparov in that tournament. But I remember all the media there. One, it was my second trip to Russia, and I was just a total fanboy. I'm a year older than Raja, but I was just a total fanboy there, like watching this Rajabov Kasparov blitz match. And all the media was there because at the time, Raja was a real prodigy, right? He, he was being talked about as maybe, you know, one, one of the successors to Gary Kasparov, even at that young age um, of 15. So, anyway, funny story. He and I were talking about it at the opening ceremony because I think it was the first time I had seen him in person since that Moscow blitz event. So. Another story. I didn't know it was going to be story time with Dan today, but apparently I've got a lot of stories to share. Hope you guys are having a great time, guys and gals. We're going to take a very, very short break. When we return, of course, we have more action. All four games are still underway, which means we still have so much ahead in the Palacio de Santonia. It's a beautiful, beautiful building, some beautiful chess being played. We will be right back with more action from Madrid in a few. Want to play chess online or learn how to improve? Join us at the number one chess destination in the world, chess.com. With thousands of people playing at any moment, you'll quickly find a game with someone at your level, whether you're a beginner or a grandmaster. Chess.com makes learning fun and easy. Sharpen your tactics with puzzles and enhance your strategy with our lessons by top masters. Learn from your own games with our easy-to-use analysis tool. Chess.com has everything you need to take your game to the next level. Signing up is free and easy. Join chess.com today. Want to play chess online? The FIDE Candidates is the most important tournament in chess. Taking place every two years, 
the candidates qualifies the victor to challenge the reigning world champion in a World Chess Championship title match. The 2022 candidates will feature eight of the world's best chess players. They've all earned their spots through two years of fierce competition. They now head to Madrid, Spain, where everything will be settled over the board. One of those eight spots is always reserved for the previous World Chess Championship challenger. Jan Nepomnesi would love nothing more than a second chance at the throne, but he has to get through seven other great players in Madrid first. Two spots went to the top finishers of the most prestigious open chess tournament in the world, the FIDE Chess.com Grand Swiss. Ali Reza Perugia won the Grand Swiss, turned the heads of everyone in doing so, and has become the youngest player in history to cross the 2800 ELO rating barrier. He would become the youngest world chess champion of all time should he win the candidates and ultimately the world chess championship match. Fabiano Caruana joined him taking the other spot from the Grand Swiss. The U.S. number one and third highest rated player in the history of our game is also the only person to never lose a classical chess game to Magnus Carlsen in a World Chess Championship match. Two of the spots were claimed by the winners of the dramatic 2022 FIDE Grand Prix cycle. Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura is a former world number two, a blitz and bullet chess legend, and the most popular chess streamer in the world. He was joined by GM Richard Rapport. The Hungarian number one is one of the most creative and dangerous minds in the game today, and nobody is looking forward to facing him in Madrid. FIDE awarded one of the eight spots to the wildcard invite Grandmaster Tamor Rajaba. Raja missed the 2021 candidate cycle in consideration of COVID concerns. But as the oldest, most experienced player in the field, he's looking to use that knowledge and punch his ticket to the World Chess Championship title match. And finally, two spots go to the top two finishers of the world's largest knockout tournament, the absolutely grueling FIDE World Cup. Jan Krzysztof Duda, the Polish number one, punched his ticket by ousting none other than world champion Magnus Carlsen in the semifinals of that event. Duda would ultimately defeat Karyakin in the final to win the World Cup. However, Karyakin, due to suspension from play by FIDE, sees his spot go to China's number one, Grandmaster Ding Li Ren. Ding Li Ren takes the spot due to being the highest rated eligible player according to the May 2022 FIDE rating list. So that's how each of our eight competitors earned their bids to Madrid. Inside the Palace of Santona, it's about who can sustain the mental endurance to secure the coveted slot as challenger for the world title. But we're not sure who that will be just yet. We do know this. We'll enjoy watching every minute of the candidates with the chess.com community as we see how the most important tournament in chess plays out together. How many brilliant moves have you played? When do you play your best chess? How many games have you won by castling in the end game? How many opponents have you played from New Zealand? And most importantly of all, how many Botez gambits has Alexandra Botez played? Find the answers to all of these questions and many, many more at chess.com slash insights. Our new tool that lets you dive deep and do all of the fun and instructive data behind your chess. Try it today. Madrid. Civilization here is almost as old as the game of chess. Some claim the queen was given her powers to honor Queen Isabella. That, my friends, is a chess legacy. 
passion for chess continues to thrive in Madrid. For the first time in 30 years, Spain's capital plays host to the candidates, the most important tournament in chess. At the Palace of Santona, the stakes are high. Eight of the world's best players competing for the right to challenge for the most coveted title in chess, the World Chess Championship. The candidates is grueling. The winner requires mental endurance and unbreakable focus. There are those familiar with the biggest stages in chess, yet still chasing unfinished business. And others from the next wave of stars with little patience for yielding to those before them. Mis amigos, the next challenger to the world champion of chess must come through Madrid. Like Queen Isabella before them, the candidates is all about leaving a legacy. What legacy will these players set for themselves? Will we have someone re-challenging for a world chess championship title, a brand new challenger, who knows? So many things ahead. We are now looking at the beautiful views outside of the Palacio de Santonia. Of course, it doesn't properly reflect just how hot it is, but you can tell by the clothes people are wearing that it's, it's summer out there, I can tell you that. And uh, as we move inside the playing hall where it's a little bit cooler, a little bit nicer, more refreshing, a great view there. Uh, well, it was Ali Reza Perugia before someone took a, took a slow walk in front of the camera, <laughs> Richard Rapport. Um, we have uh, so many games going still, as we said. We have a bird's eye view uh, right now coming your way of all four games still in progress. We see that uh, Rookie 5 has been played by Rajabov. We'll get, we'll get rid of that uh, bad question mark there. Apologize for that. We will remove the game glyphs from the board. Um, but uh, we're going to dive back into that game because we do want to see... We do want to see what Rajabov did, because it wasn't the B4 move that Almira was talking about. So we'll definitely jump back to the game as soon as we can, everybody. Don't you stress. And uh, here we have it. Rookie 5 on the board by Rajabov. And then D6 responded by Hikaru. Wrong camera there. We're still looking at Ali Reza Ferruja. But uh, we'll, we'll get over there in a second. Let's talk about the position we see here, Almira. D6 in the response mm -hmm. to Rookie 5. Threatens B7. Well, allows bishop c6. I wanted to explain, first of all, uh, rook e5, of course, it's a very concrete move, but it's also, it's not very comfortable to, to play like a pawn down, so yeah. if, you, if you have a chance, you try to get it back, of course, so like rook e5, maybe that was uh, supported also by concrete uh, variations, but d6, uh, bishop c6 now probably, or can I still win the pawn back, maybe I can play rook d5, queen d5, so many options. I, I and like, I don't want to change the queens, okay, then maybe rook d5. I like rook d5 a lot. Um, one, yes, but queen d5, there was rook d1, of course, so then queen and rook, rook d5, I think, yeah, is okay, more yeah. precise. The queen mm -hmm. d5, but I, the thing I wanted to point out is that the moment that rook leaves, there's a pawn hanging. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. I'm not sure you want to take it, so... So flippantly, but uh, it is a pawn. No, maybe both are still possible because like queen d5, rook d1, of course I can take on the f3, take on e3, yeah, take yeah. on e2. So, so many uh, possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Rajabov so. going to think about how he wants to maybe corral this d6 pawn before anything, anything crazier gets underway. But again, back to the aggressive bishop c6. I, I feel like that's the other way to play the position because black has so many active pieces, right? Mm -hmm. So much potential. For, for threats if, if white is careless. A move like queen e2 would come in not just with pressure on g2, but pressure on b2, pressure on e3. Obviously the d6 pawn is dangerous, but I'm, I'm just looking at the, the, the potential tactics here and... No, but you, you're absolutely right, because like, of course you can, uh, well, win the pawn back and then equalize, right. but you could be looking for more and for some for a dynamic solution you know like to increase your pieces activity like rook g5 of course is coming to mind after bishop yep. g6 bishop c6 but then uh, hmm. maybe bishop c6 then yes yeah i like it bishop c6 but you no know, no rook d5 was also made a lot of sense 
I like how aggressive he played it. It shows that Raja maybe thinks there's there's some double-edgedness, right? I mean, we've been talking mostly about the fact that Hikaru's up a pawn. Mm -hmm. Feels like White has the advantage. Obviously, the eval bar kind of kind of guides that bias a little bit for us to feel like White is better. But but I think Hammer said it well. B4 is it was a good move, but it was also kind of a defensive move, right? It was thinking about the weaknesses. Rookie five is not a defensive move. It's an aggressive move, right? He wants to win back the pawn with interest. But then uh, I don't like d6 because it's also it's very direct. But I would prefer to gi to give up the a2 pawn and play rook d1. Yeah. So you think you're saying Hikaru should have maybe played this and mm -hmm. just give just up to a2. keep the passer. It's very important. It's like. Hmm, but what to do? Right? Yes, but what to do now? On the other hand, now I'm looking. The b2 pawn is maybe but we it, should it sacrifice it like, all. Yes. Well, it might just be that e4. Like, def, like the point is the pawn is extra. So if you play a move like this, I don't think you can take because of knight d3. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's the move the computer wants, but it looks very good. You you protect d5. Now you can play knight d3, push the rook back. You've got a pass pawn. So I, I agree. It feels like rook d1 might have been. A slightly more just kind of like solid approach to keep your edge if you were Hikaru. D6 is a very, very aggressive move and it just immediately opens up these kind of things that has me feeling like who says black isn't, isn't playing for an advantage. It's a very committal move once again. Yes, yeah. like I, it's, I had this feeling it's like, you know, it's coming from like when you're studying all of the positions, you don't know why, but you want just to play rook d1 to keep the d5 pound, maybe to centralize your pieces, because I know how difficult it would be later to coordinate your pieces. Yeah. So just out of these uh, concerns, I think that uh, because d6, like everything is possible now. Yeah. You see, I can win the pound back and I, I can activate my pieces. I right. can. Uh, I can do whatever I want in this position, and this is uh, a bit scary, I think. Yeah, and I wonder if it was Hikaru feeling like he needed to be more aggressive than, than he needed to be, right? Sometimes that happens, like you lost, right? You know you had an advantage, maybe you're getting a little bit, a little bit too invested in converting now, and, and not to say the Rook D1 wasn't maybe just objectively better, but uh, Rajabov is going to be someone who can take advantage of that, right? He's an experienced player, he knows what it is when your opponent maybe overpresses, right? And uh, one mark, I think, of strong grandmasters isn't just that they win games clearly start to finish one-sidedly, but that they understand that it's a process and you let your opponent sort of overpush a little bit and then pounce when you have the opportunity to do so. So I, I really feel like this game could be about to turn. If, if Raja plays bishop c6, I'm just liking black's position. I mean, just, just optically, it just looks so open and dangerous, right, for white. The only weakness black has is this, you know, Back rank blunder, but only only I blunder into back rank checkmates. That's not something. That... No, no, I do. I think oh, you do so. too. Okay, brother, that makes me feel better. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so. I, I just had a thought, you know, because yesterday, of course, I couldn't sleep for a while. Then, it, like, we are here covering the candidates. Yeah. And you know, I've been looking at the history of the candidates since I was a kid, of course, and like there have been times where they played twenty-eight games. You know, like. Oh. Uh, Sorry, I really want you what to finish happened? your story, of but course. I just no, got no, no, something just happened that maybe a draw. Or we're gonna we're gonna head over to due to Dingley Ren. They just very quickly repeated. We apologize, everyone. We're normally normally right on top of something when it's coming to an end, but they repeated rather unexpectedly, in my in my opinion, Elmir, Bishop C eight, Bishop E three, and then it was uh, it was just uh, shuffle puck. But so he finally uh, well he doubled his rook. Rooks on the B file, as yep. we predicted, but that's what I wanted to tell you that uh, Ding's idea of playing Queen A8 was actually to play Bishop C8 to guard the B7 square. We didn't have we didn't have time to mention it, but only then I think he was intending to play F5. Is was it correct or not? Well, I'm going back to the position Almira said because again we didn't we didn't look at this game a ton. We see the two players gone, but Almira's point that we didn't have a chance to look at was Queen E8 was preparing. Bishop c8, precisely to make sure that the rooks would stay out of of this uh, seventh rank. That was a key idea that Ding Li Ren went for, but it shows that now he's sort of stuck, I guess. Right? I'm just sort of trying to paint the picture. How do we get a draw? Black feels stuck to get too aggressive because of the counterplay that white would get, right? But white lacks opportunities, really, to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Both sides are lacking real opportunities here. We see that empty, very short chair there for Dingley Ren. Dingley Ren, not, not, a, not a short guy, by the way. Tall guy, but wanted a short chair. Um, 
And uh, in the end, I think I think neither side just felt like it was worth risk. Okay, but they do go for f5. Mm -hmm. So he prepared the f5. Yeah. And finally pushed it. And you are forced to take because otherwise, of course, the knight goes to d4. Yeah, this it's very important to exchange this, this knight. Yes. Right? So. Yep. Probably yes, knight g3. I cannot see the moves. I'm getting closer and closer to the monitor, like here, like on the spaceship. Yeah. But <laughs> you're creeping in for the whatever this was. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's not not a super surprise. Once the f5 exchange happened, as you said, White had to take the knight to prevent this. But I, I'm still, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel a little robbed because while I I agree that there's, you know, it, it's hard to make progress. Still, a lot of pieces on the board here for for a game to end so quickly. Was there really no plan either side could go for? Uh, let's maybe let's get back to knight g three, uh, king g seven. Like while the king is still on g seven. Yeah. That uh, I think that we should have a look at this position. If you want to to find a plan here, then. Uh, I mean, but it's the more I look at it, the more I understand. I mean, I, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, maybe it's uh, it's sort of balanced. If it, position. Like, if it wasn't for the fact that the queen and knight are holding h5, one plan for black would be like h5, h4, g4. Okay, but not possible. If it wasn't for the fact that the bishops are holding down the b file, a plan for white would surely be to execute here and try to simplify and maybe even have the a pawn. And you have to be very careful because, like, you are you don't have the light square bishop for yep. white, and then your pawns could fall, like you know, the Roman Empire. So uh, yeah, all right. Well, I'm sure everyone wants us to get back to more exciting game, but this was just a surprise, right? It doesn't happen very often that a game will end in that type of fashion. So again, for those who want to see every handshake happen in those dramatic moments, just uh, not not so dramatic here, just a very very quick draw. So. Let's head back to our bird's eye view if we can um, and show everybody where we sit because we now have one game in the books. Uh, it is the draw in the lower right corner, which we will reflect for you mm -hmm. next time around. And right now it just happens so quickly. Now we have to look at all three of the other games again. We see Fabiano still with an edge, but still with a similar sort of dynamic we left them with. Um, Meaning he has a couple pawns, but White has a lot of light score control in the pawn machine versus Caruana. Maybe we can have a look at this game because okay. I also had uh, a thought that you could also positionally uh, sacrifice an exchange now. Okay. You know, just to release some tension because. Uh, you mean black sacrifice? Maybe not sure. exactly in this position because I haven't looked at the position, but you right. know, that's what I had in mind because those two bishops are so powerful. So maybe now, or I, first I was thinking about rook b3, like in some previous position. So that's yeah, yeah. how this positional sacrifice came, well, in, into my intention. And then I thought, but then why not sacrificing it for another bishop? So yep. that's how I was um, trying to find out, like, what could possibly be like the how closer I, I, we can get to the truth yeah. in this position? So I, I like that idea a lot. Honestly, I think that I want to just show Almira's rook b3 because I think it's fascinating. Just forget forget that the rook is on it. It, it doesn't work precisely because white can take mm -hmm. and then the rook can take. But I think that type of shot is really instructive because undoubling your a pawns and then quickly having two pass pawns. Right? Of course, that was that's, uh, that's some explosive stuff there. And if you don't take it, then the rook is is a real thorn to the pressure you had. So it doesn't work, but I love it. Although let's look at rook takes b two because just after we showed your your first instructive point, I actually think this is a real move. And, and look at that. Even here, like because Computer I was just thinks, looking. I don't I don't know if there's a follow up, but. Maybe there is a follow-up here. I don't know, but even if there isn't, no. But now the thing is, now I, I have to. Well, I wanted to push my well a three because like. Yeah. Doesn't matter. I have those pawns. I wanted right. to push, and you don't have the bishop on b two anymore. And the very important point is this: that now my pieces, the knight on e five and the bishop on c five, like just th those are real monsters. You yeah. have absolutely no chance of exchanging those. I, I, so I like, love this idea. I wonder, I wonder how much, how much credit Fabiano is giving this idea because your last point about how getting rid of the dark square bishop just cements. Right, the stranglehold you have in the center is, is a really key one, especially because that knight 
is so critical to almost Black's entire position, right? It kind of, exactly. it kind of starts mm -hmm. and, and ends with the fact that the knight guards F7, right? It holds these other squares in place. I think that really important to... But that's very strange. Like, we managed to, like, I managed to explain in a very rational way something that came to me intuitively, you know? Yeah. It's like, uh, but now, like, the more I look at this position, uh, the more I think that maybe this is possible now. I don't know, like, how computer evaluates it, like, in the long term. Maybe it's uh, not correct at all, but I really love this, these pieces, the knight on e5, the, and the bishop on c5, and especially, like, all these threats on the on the G1 A7 diagonal yep. uh, would possibly be uh, deadly. Well, so. one thing we have to point out is that Bobby may or may not be thinking about this, but he's thinking about something because he now is lower on the clock than Jan, at least for the f for the first time where we've been covering it. Uh, we obviously left it to, to take a look at the other games, but if you're just tuning in, at one point in this game, Fabiano Caruana was up more than an hour on the clock and and clearly playing from some sort of deep preparation. It may be why he, he got what maybe could be an advantage here, right? But it's but it's a very dangerous position if you don't sacrifice the exchange. Let's just point out that White might be threatening to take the knight, Elvira, and just take F7, right? I mean, that might ah, be it. So there is even a concrete, I was going to say, now, there, now we, we, we went from an intuitive idea <laughs> yes. that we explained rationally to now we're being concretely forced to consider exactly. rook takes v2 because if we don't, f7 might fall. That is kind of funny, right? It's an intuitive idea. We rationalize it for positional sort of strategic reasons. But maybe and the more I look at it, I don't do know it, that like... he has a better move to guard f7. Ah, you know, yes, of course, there is also like a small tactical shot, even though it loses like knight g4 and then take on b2, but they, we have to protect the f7 pawn anyway. No, oh, you like, mean like right away? Like right you away. Can, yeah, but, you would love but, to try this, Yes, of but course, but then because, and, because f7 is falling, falling and yeah. no, I mean, you take then queen f7 or maybe even rook h3, I don't know, like probably you take and then yeah. take on f7, so... Um, we have a comment from chat that says that these two, I assume you're <laughs> referring to Nippon Nishi and Karwan, or maybe referring to Skripchenko and Wrench, I don't know. But these two love complicated positions, you're right, and this one is nutty. So, uh, great comment there from Mungus. We agree that it's a, it's a nutty position, and we love it, me and Almira, and maybe, maybe they do too, maybe uh, Nippon Nishi and Karwana. Um, yeah. It comes, uh, my poker years come back to mind, so like I was having this, Tight, aggressive style. <laughs> you could, so you weren't a, a bluffer? No. Not a bluffer? Well, I was a bluffer in some spots because you yeah. should carefully choose them. Yeah. And then uh, also it's also a risk-reward situation. You have to evaluate carefully. Right. And then uh, what also comes to mind, like when you're playing the candidates, this is where you have to give it all. Right. So you can yep. lose everything everywhere. So, so. Yep. And the question, what I wanted to ask you, I'm so sorry, while uh, Fabi is still thinking, it's like, so what is it, why in, in chess we want the candidates to be truly uh, deserving of this match, you know, that they have to yeah. go through the qualification path yeah. and play 30, 50 games in order, you know, to, to play the world champion. Yeah. So we want it to be a gauntlet. Right? Yes, and exactly. So I think I, I've made the final boss Norwegian joke a few times and Magnus tweeted as such, uh, in response to Elon Musk. Elon Musk tweeted uh, a few days ago something about chess and uh, about how, you know, if a young player is learning it, like, it's like a video game map that's boring and all the rules are defined and, and then the Norwegian final boss is, you know, it's kind of a jerk waiting at the end to beat everybody um, on the board. You know, he's hard to beat. And I think uh, we just... It's something, something I guess, romantic and royal about the game, right? We want there to be this epic storyline. They fought their way through the all the different levels to get to King Koopa at the end of the Mario Brothers. Um, so anyway, I don't know. It's fun. I, I wonder how I wonder how the outside world feels about it because you know there are many different cultures. I mean, like tennis doesn't have a world championship match, but it has a series of grand slams, right? You have playoffs in other sports, so. I don't know how people feel about it outside looking in. Well, we don't have, well, I had, I had that feeling, first of all, as a professional chess player, but then also like now a commentator, because I feel that my prism is uh, gradually changing. Yeah. But we don't have a universal uh, system yet. I mean, where like everyone can play the tournaments, qualify. Right. So um, I think that we are 
probably uh, going in that direction. And even Magnus has expressed his views. I think that uh, he wouldn't be against it. Yeah. No, so and Magnus is, gets a lot of credit for that because he's the guy sitting on the throne saying, I don't know that I want there to be a throne, right? Maybe I want there to be a different system, you know? But I, I, I don't, I mean, I think initially I, I really respected and agreed with that. I love the excitement. I love knockout tournaments. Almost every tournament I've ever designed on chess.com is a knockout. You know, the Speed Chess Championship, anything we do, I think, I think that's very fun. But, but I think a lot of people really like the appeal of a match, like a heavyweight match, too. And I think some people, evidence would show that more people tune in for that than like every other thing in chess by far, besides pog champs. Okay, that's another story. Um, but okay. And rook e8 was played. Rook e8, wow, mm -hmm. okay, hold on. So this was not the move we were expecting. We wanted to give all the pieces we, because well, for the, for they the are not we our wanted pieces. It. We yes. wanted it, but the computer agreed, by the way. After, after letting it sit, the computer agreed that this was really? the, this was the oh. best move for black, including your A3 follow-up. This, this is what the computer said was black's best chance. I like to look at it after the move is played. I don't like to predict, unless, unless, unless there's good reason to predict with the engine. I like the eval bar, but I keep the engine moves till after it's played most of the time mm -hmm. to keep my chess brain analyzing. But after, after it was played, I look back at the engine, and the engine liked your move. Rook takes B2. So this was best. But okay, rook g e8 was the second best move, and now we're back to this position from Carwana. What happens on takes e5? I think we just have to analyze it. Jan, mm -hmm. looks like he's about to move, by the way, with his body language. Indeed he is, but he doesn't play it. He plays bishop to c1, back to the f4 plan. You know, it, you know what? It, it's also a draw offer. Yeah, is it like, yeah well, that's exactly what it was. It's a silent draw offer because yeah. he, when he made the move, he looked, he glanced at, you know, at Fabiano. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. and then, uh, well, and then only he, well, he I, noted. Like, I love the wrote. body language we recognize in the players because we've like, been there. Like, he did that thing where, like, it, exactly like Amir, Elmira said, it was a silent draw offer. He moved, and as he moved, he looked up, uh, and look at that. Fabiano went right back. Will he play rook e8? And will we have a draw? Unfortunately, one of us predicted that this game would not be as spicy as we wanted. They have already proven me wrong, so I'm not going back and saying I was right. Um, but I did predict a draw because I thought that neither player would, would need to risk it, Almira, because they're leading the tournament. For the record, I desperately hope I'm wrong here and that Fabi plays rook takes b2. I have a feeling we're going to so get a draw. So is this the... Yeah. EV, no, EV plus situation means that uh, uh, I, you have to sacrifice. <laughs> you got you to do it. Come on, Bobby, Bobby. Everyone chant, Bobby, Bobby. Come on, chat. Send him the, uh, the psychic powers, the strength to go for rook takes b2. But it's so easy to take those decisions when you're not feeling oh, the pressure. You know, sure. like, I, like I, it would be so difficult for me to, to do it over the board, I think. You need to be completely sure. Yeah. And, and it's easy for us to say, and it may be what the engine also thinks is best, but the point is the reason that man is very focused and nervous is because this also risks losing to go for a line like this, right? I mean, like, you're down the exchange. Your opponent still has this very nasty light squared bishop. So I will, we will not hold it against Fabiano if he accepts the draw, given the situation he was also black. Look at the time. I think that's the most important factor now. Like so, yep. um, when you are like sacrificing an exchange, first of all, even though it feels very natural, uh, then you you have to understand how to play the next ten moves almost. But yep. and the position has still a very concrete character. So yep. even if rook b two a three might feel very natural, then it's like, how many moves do you still have left? I don't see. Then you would move here, you know. He is on move 32, so eight more so moves to make. Eight mate. more moves. Okay, then maybe, maybe this is possible. It's. Uh, I don't know. I, I know that Bobby face. You know. I, yeah, I think he's kind of like. Uh, he just glanced back at his clock as well. I think he. We got some chant. We got. Um. Yeah, I, I knew it. Unfortunately, chat called it. Maybe I don't speak as fluid Fabiano as I do Hikaru, but. Uh, I could, I could see that our, our efforts will be wasted here. I believe that Jan will probably play bishop to c1 and accept the silent draw offer in return from Caruana, and we'll have our second peaceful result. Could be wrong. But, we'll but how often do you look at your opponent when you're playing a chess game? Because, I, well, I have the feeling that I'm so absorbed by, like, by what's going on on the board that 
I almost never look at my opponent. And I, I'm the opposite. I look at my opponent a ton, a ton. So I, and I think I think there's a lot of players that do. I mean, I I, I I I don't know what it is, and maybe it's because I'm just, you know, thinking that it's making more of a difference than it actually is. But I feel like seeing my opponent's just reaction, their focus, their emotional sort of like feelings, and reading the body language is, I don't know, something I can't turn away from. I put more effort on the board. But I, I do look at my opponent. But a lot. that's something which actually poker taught me, you know, like to look at your yes, opponent. well to well to look at the body language, you know, yeah. to look at uh, well, to um, well, psychological di dimension became very important to me then. Yeah. So and uh, maybe it made me a better chess player as well. So, I, but uh, I still feel that uh, I should do it more often. Like yeah. I, Without, well, without disturbing the opponent, of course, because it's it's not easy because it's a very thin line, you know. It's like I've been taught that. Uh, well, especially if your opponent is known to be rather emotive and maybe distract you or whatever, it can be like, all right, I, I don't want to look at this, look at this person who's driving me crazy. Maybe better just focus on the board. But, but uh, just a glance, of course, sometimes yeah. is. Uh, Jan and Hikaru are probably the two most expressive players in this event. Hikaru are very well known for being a very you know, expressive player uh, with his emotions, facial expressions, body language, and Jan too. Half of his facial expressions are a meme on the internet. I saw Gotham Chess tweeting just now. A shrugging face from Jan, some, some sort of meme about game reviews. So anyway, yeah, it's, uh, there we go. And we're gonna, we're, gonna stick, we're gonna stick right here because I think we are seconds away from seeing, in fact, we're about to see even a claim. So this is, might as well even just offer the draw, I believe. No, he's, he's just he's going to claim it. So this rule for everyone yes, is very important for those who don't speak over the board, especially elite level chess. If you believe you are about to repeat the position for the third time, the proper process is you make a claim before the move is on the board. I have made that mistake because it's it's threefold. It's position. Okay, he just offers the draw straight up, and here we have a result. Okay, but I, I will explain that rule for those who don't know because. Well, well, it's a little silly and kind of weird because internet chess has changed that because inter the internet just tracks it for you. Mm -hmm. So if you repeat the position three times, you know, chess.com server will just automatically claim the draw. So people don't even have to think about this anymore. But if you ever play in an over the board chess tournament, especially one with these stakes, they will be very strict on the rules, which is because it's threefold position, not threefold move. You have to claim it because once you make the move, technically you're resetting it exactly. because it's about whether the position has occurred exactly that many times with the same player on move. And so you have to make the claim before you make the move, otherwise you've reset it. So sorry for the rant, but it, it is an interesting little nuance in chess. But also it's uh, something that we've discussed uh, yesterday. So yeah. like, that's why you need score sheets. First of all, there you go. that's one of the reasons. Yep. And second, I was not even sure. Like I was thinking about two other reasons. Maybe uh, it's um, intellectual property. Like it's completely different okay. topic. Yep. And maybe it's also uh, like a legal proof that you won the game because it should be signed, you know, by yes. both opponents. So there, yep. there are several elements, of course, that right. uh, which. That's okay. actually a super important point because we don't think about anything disingenuous happening in events like this. They're on camera, the players know of each course. other. But there are very large scale tournaments, right? In the US, you have the World Open where there's literally hundreds of people just in the open section. And if you don't get a signature from your opponent that says you won and they falsify another score sheet, it's quite mm -hmm. possible you could have a real controversy. So great point from Elmira actually on that, that one of the most important purposes of a score sheet, even with all the advancements in technology, is proof of a record of the game. Um, and okay, we, we've already moved on over to uh, report for Ruja. Mm -hmm. Good call. Oh, we've okay, uh, we brought up that board. Whoa, what happened here? Another rook ending. So for Nerezza Firuja, yesterday he had to defend a very unpleasant yeah, one. This is, this this is, is more unpleasant mm -hmm. than yesterday's battle with Rajabov. For okay. sure. Two rooks on the board is already offering way more dynamic chances than one. The fact that this rook has taken the seventh rank could spell danger. It puts you in a spot, just to add context to that, that even if you were able to trade like B for C, it doesn't have the same value anymore if white is also entering the seventh rank with, with uh, a very devastating effect on the king side. Uh, of course, black has a D pawn, mm -hmm. and, and who knows what that actually looks like, but just 
pointing out that if you were just able to do this, the game is basically over. So actually, you might be able to do this if you play before B5. I was B5, just about to say now course. that we've now that we've given context that if we used our imaginations and the pawns were gone, sometimes that sometimes that gives you a plan. First you imagine, and then you go for it. Then you weaken your own king. And then you weaken your own king, and that and then you lose the game. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then I play uh, D3, rook A2, and <laughs> yeah, it's funny because if you play B4, ooh, it's not a good way to move. Okay, my apology. We were just so focused on the think, abstract. I think if you play yes, let's let's move something, okay, like, something H6. like H6. B4 after D3, are you are you losing? Uh, maybe. Let's say. Yeah, like it looks like the pawn is too fast. Mm -hmm. So, really good point that as as nice as this idea is, Ferugia is in control. Should this become a pure race, black is faster. Okay. Um, so black is to move here, of course. So then. We need to make a move, something like h6. I, well, you see this, uh, it's a useful move, g6, because it's, you know, it doesn't do much, but we need uh, yeah, to I, do I something. Yeah, I like this. h6, right? Mm -hmm. Although h6, you know, I always have this feeling that somewhere, because yeah, I have this imaginary yeah. positions, yeah. play f5, then the king will uh, go on h5, g6, yeah. and something like this will you happen. Get, you get checkmated. And something it's, terrible will yeah, happen. Yeah. Yes. Well, the other thing of h6, I, I always imagine either one of these pawns on this square, now you have the back rank mating that, right, with the mm -hmm. king sitting on h7. So you, you have to be careful. And for the record, it's funny, because we're, we're playing imaginary. Wait a second. He gave up a pawn. Wait, he played rook a1? Yes, so... Oh, my... Okay, out of the imaginary into the fire here, we have we have a huge moment right now in this game. Why has Ali Reza just given up the C6 pawn? For the record, that is this is a moment where I will look at the engine. The engine is just saying rook takes C6 and then rook C7. What the bleep? Oh my god, but I, I really think that sometimes Elvira runs out of patience. He doesn't want to defend passively. This is a very unpleasant position, really. Yeah. This is a very unpleasant ending, and um, he's trying to create some counterplay, but I believe that uh, we, he's simply not on time. Like, he yeah. wants to take Ra the H2 pawn. He takes the pawn without hesitation for the record, and just here we, I mean, oh my gosh. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. This this could end up being maybe the only decisive result we have in the round, and not one we saw coming. Report just takes on c6. Mm -hmm. Ali Reza H1. immediately played rook h1. Okay, then I play rook c7 anyway. Yeah, just, just rook c7. Yes. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally the imaginary line I was giving. I was like, hey, imagine a world, everybody, where somehow this rook gets on c7, the game is over. And somehow Ali Reza just clearly miscalculated something very... I don't know what because because he's such a strong player and, and this is quite quite clear. Okay, let's see. When you take on h2, you still protect the h7 pawn. So okay, okay. We so should we, we consider this, but the problem is that we need also to play and, d3, and play maybe something like rook h3, rook g7, and then king h8. Okay, so okay. So let's you're not just see. resigning yet. Mm -hmm. But rook g7 protects on g3. We need an, an extra tempi, so we need to play g3, and there is no way how we can do this. Yeah, if, by the way, Almira's point, if, if the pawn was on d3 in any of these lines, it's completely different, right? Because mm -hmm. now the king has to go backward, and the pawn advances, and you get a queen. And this really brilliant point that the pawn is guarded on h7 by Almira, that's really important. The problem is that while that's useful to put the king there, white is just up pawns and... You and can make almost any move with the rook, and you have the b pawn, you have mm -hmm. the e pawn. Black, black has no moves. And the reason black has no moves is because the king is in a mating net, right? If you put the rook somewhere, j just to put it on a square, if the rook ever moves off the eighth rank, you have checkmate. If you advance the h pawn, the rook goes back to the seventh rank. You know, it's like we were talking about this, like you make the second move of the variation, but ah. here it seems like uh, the. He wants to make d3, rook h2 at the same time, and then uh, yeah, yeah. And, and somehow you go for rook a1. Oh man, this is a surprise. And poor Ali Reza Ferugia on his, on his birthday is, is facing a lot of pressure. And, and of course, one of the things we should highlight, Almira, is you know, to give credit to part of the reason maybe he, he made this miscalculation is, is we haven't even talked about the clock. He has only four minutes, and I think that 
frankly, when we first came to the board, we were so focused on the, the fantasy. We thought it was a fantasy that this would happen. I wasn't even looking at the clock, but now we see maybe why Ali Reza misplayed that position so clearly because he was very nervous. And remember, there's no increment. So he looks at that clock. He hasn't played a lot of chess this year. You get those practical nerves, right? And maybe you just you, you mismanage your, your time there. Well, but on the other hand, you know, this, uh, this position, this ending is very unpleasant. So it's the physical feeling that they, you get. The more you look, you don't want to defend it, you know? Yeah. And that's the nature of a mistake, actually, yeah. because maybe a more passive defense uh, would be more sound, but uh, it's very difficult, like, from the human perspective, yeah. once again, to uh, to defend it. Right. And again, you're making a great point. I'm not just trying to highlight that mm -hmm. it was maybe a mismanaged clock because he, he, you know, hasn't played a lot of chess. That is a practical muscle that you, you know that you're in shape with when you're playing. So but G6. you're making a point. Like, mm -hmm. no one likes looking at a bad position or a tough position, right? And the longer you look, the worse you feel. And that, that sometimes puts you, um, lack of a better term, on tilt, right, in terms of the way you're calculating and now we see the wheels are coming off super quickly here. E5. That's such a good move, actually. Like he... Yeah, here, here comes the e pawn. Mm -hmm. So he'll take, play rook h3. Takes. Mm -hmm. He'll take back. Rook h3. Ali Reza probably, probably has mm -hmm. to play rook h3. I, I don't see anything else. So, uh... But then probably you'll, uh, you'll push e6. So if... Let's say rook h3. So, okay, we'll look mm -hmm. at it. So if rook h3, mm -hmm. if you play e6... Mm -hmm. So what happens? Takes. Mm -hmm. Then rook... Ah, uh, rook, sorry. Uh, but if, if you go backward, maybe mm -hmm. you're actually suddenly in trouble, right? Ah, you maybe, have to run? Ah, I cannot go... Uh, maybe I cannot go king e4. Some f almost yeah. for king e4, rook e3 then. L l I'm going to stay right here because they, they move of fast course. here. Let's see. Um, we, we have 16 minutes for Rapport, two minutes for Ali Reza Perugia. We are on move 37 right now, so that means we are three moves away from time control. But those are three of the toughest moves Ali Reza Perugia has ever had to play in his life. With with what's at stake here, this is this is very difficult. Well, he went for an active defense, you know. Like I, I have to praise it. So. Uh... King e4 first, but okay. no, 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 but then I can take on g3, and that's the same. So now rook e3 is, can be a threat. Yeah, that was your idea. In fact, rook e3 is, okay, it's, it's dangerous. Or maybe us. then it allows, of course, rook g7, rook h7, but maybe white doesn't have more than a draw. I'm not sure. It's like this is a, a very concrete position. So let's say rook g3. Okay. Mm -hmm. let's, let's bring up the two board view with analysis so we can look at this line. I don't want to lose the live position for the fans, but I just want to show. There we go. We got rook, rook takes g3, because mm -hmm. this is an important line Elmira is pointing out. You have to give rook g7 first, I think. Mm -hmm. And after the king goes to h8, you can take again. Okay, let's say yes. So mm -hmm. remember, white has a draw if you want it. Mm -hmm. But how do we play for a win with this aggressive king? Okay. We cannot play e6 for sure. I okay, if e6, mm -hmm. let's just show yes. what, rook e3 and the yes, pawn. Yes, I was looking pawns. for rook e3 and rook e6, so then, yeah. uh, and you still have a draw, of course, so how okay. to... Ali Reza, Ali Reza has moved, rook takes g3. Rapport, again, pointing out, e6 is not a threat because of rook e3 winning the pawn, so we think we're going to see rook g7, mm -hmm. here it comes. Either king h8 or king f8, just to show the fans, likely the next move is king back to g8, because now you have to guard checkmate. So you still have to go right back to g8, even if you go to f8. Uh, so, so you might as well go to h8. We're going to have this position on the board, and then what will Rapport find? We've got uh, <laughs> uh, Richard's birthday present to Ali Reza Ferugia. May not be a welcome one. Shout out to chat. Yeah, this is a huge moment for the now 19-year-old Ali Reza Ferugia. Did he just make move 40? Mm -hmm. Yes, they did. Okay, so that's, first... That's the biggest problem, actually. Oh, yeah, I just took a deep breath. No, but then now, like when you're having an advantage, basically when you're defending a position and you have a plan, it's... Uh, well, you don't want to reach the move 40. You want your opponent uh, like, to, well, to make a mistake, yeah. of course, because uh, now Richard has one hour to think. 
it's huge. Now that he's reached the time control, you don't want the person with an advantage with a bunch of time on the clock. Rapport will make sure he finds the right approach. Let's back up our approach, quickly take a peek at the bird's eye view because I don't think that Nakamura and Rajabov have reached time control yet. So just to stay with the drama of the first stage of these games, again, reminder to all the fans, you have to reach move 40, you get more time on the clock, and then you can take a breath, even if you're the commentator and struggle with anxiety. You can relax once you get more time. Um, okay, we've got, oh, whoa, okay, only move 34. 12 minutes for Hikaru, three minutes. Look at what's happened here. This is this is significantly better for Hikaru than where we left mm -hmm. it. This is this is truly a two result position, I think, for White. What do you think? Well, I think it's probably equal. I, probably like, equal, yes. but just a centralized night. Of course, no, no. I mean, Hikaru is playing uh, for two results here, but uh, knight is six. Uh, well, it's probably just a draw, so he, of course, he will never exchange this yeah. powerful knight against the bishop. And then um, he, Rajabov created this tension on the um, king side, so yeah. it's important, of course, to have this in mind as well, that the h-pawn also at some point uh, could be very fast. I like rook c7, but then how to continue here with black? What if you just wait, if you play bishop g4? I don't know where the bishop was before. Was it on g4? The bishop, okay, let's back up. Just a, a few moves before. Back up a few moves before. Mm -hmm. So we had... On d7, okay. Yeah, so. it, was on, it was on d7. But I'm, I'm curious how we got here, because when we left the position, the queens... Oh, so uh, he, he played, played queen, queen d5. d5. That was mm -hmm. it, okay. So queen d5, rather than the moves, we were potentially suggesting a bishop c6 or rook d5. Roger was feeling some danger, so decided to exchange into the endgame. Hikaru, happy about that, I, I would think. Um, he goes for an endgame where white has an edge, mainly because a centralized knight on a dark square one, let, let's highlight why we feel like white is in control. It's not just that the knight is centralized, it's that the knight can't be removed. It's, it's outposted here. This rook has the aggressive opportunities to both poke at the a-pawn, and even this, is this on the agenda, right? Because if the rooks come mm -hmm. off, we, we highlighted that a rook ending is likely an easy draw. But the knight endgame versus the bishop, that's a position that's going to be very hard to hold, especially with now less than two minutes for Rajava, who, by the way, still has five or six more moves to make. First of all, I wanted to come back to this queen d5 move. This is the move you were, you were trying to explain, by how do you take this decision? So this is a move of a person who doesn't want to lose. Ah. You know, that's like, we were considering uh, rook d5 and bishop c6 because, yeah. you know, we were thinking also about a win. But I think that transposing to this end game show clear intentions that, well, you draw is okay, you want to equalize with black. Yeah. So this is maybe something he, uh, he was okay with beforehand, no, before I, I... This, uh, this game. So, and then if you are mentioning uh, the what? rook exchange, uh, later on, you still have to be careful because I can bring my king to the king side. Yep. Your pawns are weak. Yeah, no, so exa you can exactly. Lose, this, you can lose uh, the h4 pawn. This threat of rook c6, the rook exchange with these. Okay, you, yeah, you, you can't be you can't be crazy aggressive mm -hmm. because the king can come in. But notice that Rajavov avoids it with a minute and nine seconds on the clock for five more moves. And again, this is if you've watched a lot of overboard over the board chess in your life, fans. This is not a time control with increment. That one minute is very different than traditional chess that you've watched where they're getting time added on every move. So we can't go anywhere, although, by the way, Rapport may be beating Ferruja here soon. We have drama here in round two. And he leaves the bishop on prise. The bishop is on pre, but it can't be taken because of rookie five check yes, just to show. Yes, it's, a, it's a quick fork and black regains the knight. That would be the rook ending that Rajabov desperately wants, right? Knight e6 is what he's praying for. I think Hikaru may just play rook c6 anyway even after rook d5, it attacks the bishop, it attacks the pawn. Mm -hmm. I think Hikaru's going to win this game. I really do. I think that with this type but of time why, pressure... But then why didn't he play bishop g4? Instead of bishop e6? Oh, you think rook c, rook c6 was like a positional threat? Did just, uh, well, go back to the position after rook c7? Okay. No, no, after rook c7 uh, here. No, no, the last position no. where he played... Uh, in, in the live position. Yeah. So here, like, just back rook d6. 
Bishop G4. Bishop G4. So was Rook C6 uh, like a positional threat? I wanted to know. It might be, right? Because if takes, takes, the mm -hmm. knight endgame mm -hmm. is potentially better. It looks better. very okay, unpleasant, of course. Rook C6 played, where Jabov instantly plays Rook E5 check in only two seconds, by the way, he, which he needs to do. Uh, so now he has a minute and seven seconds for four moves. Hikaru puts the king on F2. Rajabov. Oh, man. Okay, he plays bishop d7, but this is... It's, it's, it's a pawn now. Hikaru's going to take the pawn on a6 and... Yes, but maybe he's looking for g takes h4, takes rook e4. Can you protect this? Yes, you can protect knight f3. Um, he's also, he's trying to create some counterplay. Well, rook takes a6, wins a pawn. You're suggesting g takes mm -hmm. h4, g takes h4, and rook, rook e4 for the target. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Okay, so Hikaru's going to have to calculate. You could also, you know, Play a weird tempi move, right? Ask, ask an awkward question to the bishop. I, I think it likely just tucks itself mm -hmm. on c8 if you let it. So that means you probably want to take the pawn now while you have the chance, right? Because just remind everybody, the whole reason the bishop had to go to d7 is you couldn't go to c8. The rook is here, right? So if you don't take the pawn now and you move the rook somewhere else, Rajabov likely just defends the pawn. Yeah. It should be consistent. You play rook c6, so you have to take rook a6. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's some trick. I'm like, I'm like, I'm playing full Hikaru here. I just, I've watched too much of this guy to be like, we assume this is the obvious move. He makes some weird move because there's a knight c6 fork or something. I don't know. I'm just like. So you, you've lost your innocence. I, I've lost my innocence. Hikaru <laughs> took my innocence <laughs> long ago, which is a whole nother story we will get into on a different show. Um, but yeah. Oh, I, I still have this uh, romantic side in me that like always hopes for the best. You know, it's so, like you take the pound. Okay. He did so. Okay, he then... took the pawn. All right, Rajabov takes h4. Good call, Elmira. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the move we expected. So, probably rook e4. I don't see it. Yeah, he only oh, has two more moves continue? to make. Mm -hmm. So, Rajabov, using his time, he has 30 seconds and counting. That's true. It happened to me once, like uh, live on the French television. You know, actually. Uh, Fabiana gave his whole rook against Sergei Karakin, and then I was like, the rook! <laughs> <laughs> no! I was like, exactly rock. like, no, you have so yeah. the rook. <laughs> when, you're, when you're just screaming, and I fall out of my chair all the time. It's well documented. So, um, rookie four played. That was a very well spotted quick, quick heads up, Elmira. White is still better, but it does show the game is not over, right? Because if, if black wins this pawn. So, just uh, to, um, to show that. I wanted to meet King G3, of course, by Rook G4. So that's just yeah, Rook a, G4 check and a just small, to show everybody. small tactical idea. So you cannot defend yeah. this pawn. You so. can't put the king on H3 because there's a lined bishop with check, mm -hmm. which means so if you do this real quick, fun exercise for everyone to get better. King G3, Rook G4 check. If you move the king, you lose the pawn anyway. So why play King G3? And if Rook G4 check and you play King H3, you've walked into the line of a discovered check. So the rook will capture the knight and unleash a check on the king and win a piece for free, full free. So I don't think he'll play king g3, but he has seven minutes to decide the trickiest possible move for Rajabov's 40th. I think I, well, how can you continue here? So you have probably to, okay. I love rook d6. Rajabov so, is on the clock. And if he moves his seconds. bishop, you want to play a4. Okay. He's got five Almost. seconds. What's going on? You have to move. Move, Grandmaster. Move. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Bishop to c8. Oh, man. I'm too old for this, Almira. That was two <laughs> seconds of my life that are way too long. I will never get it back. Oh, man. Okay. Rajabov moves. Two. And uh, I feel better. Sorry, I just yelled, move, Grandmaster. That felt... I feel ashamed about yelling at him about that. But. No, that actually explains that I really love this move rook d6 because my idea, of course, was to play a4, you know, to create a pass down. I'm not sure, like, if it's, like, the best idea, but, well. like, to remove the bishop from this diagonal first, yeah. and then, but Hikaru goes rook d8. Hikaru has a very creative, or sorry, uh, a very confident way he creatively moved the rook there. I talked about the, the screwing in of the square, Gary Kasparov style, if you notice Hikaru, Moving the rook, 
kind of drilling it into the square d8, just right? Like, I know I'm winning, and I'm reminding you right there, which, again, it almost becomes like a subtle habit, and, and players who've converted a lot of advantages in their life, you just, you kind of build the type of, like, poise you have, right? When you know that you're on the prowl a little bit, you know? And, and I think he, Icaro knows that this is his game to get. I, I think he's going to take the, the victory. I really do. And, and what a bounce-back game that would be for the five-time U.S. champ. So, Man. Sergeant Tom to ground control. Should we go on a break? <laughs> Major Tom to ground. I, I, I don't want to because I don't want to miss. I, I want to go back to the Perugia game now. So now that this has reached time control, let, let's please back up and head back over to the Perugia game because we may, we may get a look at rapport and know very quickly that he's going to be thinking for a while. But that game is moments away from, from winning. So let, let's go back here. We're flipping over to rapport versus Ferugia. And by the way, when are we going to have um, basketball players, you know, in uh, in the chess show? Like, I'm really looking forward to Michael Jordan, you know, oh, yeah. I appreciate <laughs> joining that. We, the we show. have the NFL Blitz Champ. So we are also working on an NBA event. Really? Yeah. And I guess actually I just signed the contract today. So I'm going to spill the news. Um, my my VP of partnerships. Alex Brewer might be a little irritated, but I think I can. There wasn't a plan for announcing any other way that Gordon Hayward is someone who recently kind of struck up a partnership with us. He's an NBA all-star. He's going to be streaming some chess. He has an active fan club, and we are we were actually closer to doing an NBA-style pod champs than we were an NFL event, but um, we didn't pull it off before the playoffs started, so we had to kind of pull the brakes up. But there are, there's a lot of NBA players who play regularly on chess.com. A lot of people know Clay Thompson, a big chess player. Uh, Daryl Morey, who's a buddy of mine, who was actually texting me in the middle of this game. He's the, the GM for the Philadelphia 76ers. Plays every day on chess.com. So I just wanted to share a secret. Yeah. You know, like, well, sometimes you think, like, what are your wildest dreams? Yes, yeah. like, as a kid, like, once again, like, my wildest dreams were, like, um, riding dragons. Okay. This one, you know, every, not, not even close. Not even dragons. close. Okay. Then uh, singing opera, you know, okay. like, so... Not even close, and then playing chess against uh, Michael Jordan. So okay. maybe to get that maybe closer, that, that, that closer. One, that <laughs> could happen. So who knows? So I don't know that uh, MJ is a chess player. I don't know if MJ is a chess player. I don't know that he's not someone who I know is on chess.com, but uh, but there are many others. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. So look, tune ahead, everybody. We uh, we have a lot more a lot more fun celebrity chess events coming up uh, this year and around the corner, and in many ways. Uh, just working with different celebs who we know love chess, like Kayvon Thibodeau, having a fan club, Gordon Hayward, is a big part of some other stuff that we're planning to do. So, anyway, um, we've, we've got two matches remaining. If you just got here, this is round two of the 2022 FIDE candidates. The two matches that are in the books were both ended in draws. Fabiano Caruana and Yana Pomnachi, the co-leaders, drew their game. And then we had a very quick and surprising repetition from Jan Christoph Duda and uh, Ding Lee Ren. But... Of the two matches still going, the drama right now is really focused on Richard Rapport because he knows, he knows his advantage is winning, but he knows it might be now or never. So, all right, our break comes now or never because the Palicio de Santonia, as beautiful as it is, um, also has restrooms. Can I say that on air? That may not be the most professional thing I've ever done. That's uh, like so it's a... we're gonna we're gonna take a break and we will be back with more from Madrid in just a minute. Chess Kid is fun. Chess is great for the brain, but it's also fun to play. And Chess Kid makes it easy to have fun. Whether your child is a total beginner or a prodigy, they can hop on and find a well-matched opponent from around the world at any time. Chess Kid is the safe, parent-approved way for your child to play chess online. Chess Kid is educational. To kids, it feels just like playing, but chess is a great way to learn patience, strategy, and critical thinking. Chess Kid features a comprehensive training program that guides kids to level up on their way to mastery. This curriculum is designed to work with Common Core standards and global educational guidelines. There are more than 50,000 chess puzzles and a whole library of entertaining videos that teach strategies, tactics, openings, and end games specifically for kids. Chess Kid is easy. Whether you're a parent helping your child, a coach managing dozens of kids, or a school of hundreds, Chess Kid helps you organize your students and monitor their progress. Each child receives a weekly report card that shows how many lessons, puzzles, and games were completed. You can also organize kids into clubs and send them messages. 
Chess Kid is the online home of Scholastic Chess for thousands of kids, parents, schools, and coaches. Signing up is free and easy, so what are you waiting for? This club is called Amigos del Retiro, friends of, of the Retiro. The Retiro is a, uh, the most uh, big and important park in, in Madrid. It's a very important park in the city because it's right in the center. If you want to play chess, you don't know the, the place. This is uh, maybe the best one in, in Madrid. Aquí tenemos, eh, viene gente para aprender. Y se hacen muchos torneos a final de mes y los domingos y... Pues es muy común venir aquí y echar unas partidas y sí. Hoy, eh, porque como se juega candidatos aquí, pues queríamos hacer algo especial. Sí, hoy voy a dar la simultánea y a ver qué tal se da, a ver si juego, a ver si juego bien y, y no consigo saltar puntos. The oldest player in Madrid at age 35, Timur Rajabov is competing for the third time at the candidates and for the first time in nine years. Once ranked in the top five in the world, Raja qualified for the candidates two years ago, but was unable to compete due to COVID concerns. For this year's tournament, FIDE offered Raja a wild card, which Raja accepted. Born in the same Azerbaijani city as former world champion Garry Kasparov, Raja beat Garry Kasparov at age 15. In fact, he has never lost to the former world champion. One of the peak achievements of Rajabov's career was his victory at the FIDE World Cup. In that tournament, he defeated the top seed Ding Liren in the final to qualify for the 2020 Candidates Tournament. In Madrid, Raja hopes that he can lean on his experience at the candidates to post some impressive performances, even though expectations for him here are not as high as they once were. Want to hold a massive chess tournament with dozens of clubs or hundreds of players? Or maybe a small chess tournament with local but competitive clubs? With Club Arenas, you can. Club Arenas allow for tournaments of any size with any number of clubs and players. Customize the arena with any time control, with standard chess or mini chess variants, and with any starting position you want. Club Arenas are the most flexible tournament format on chess.com. Try one out today. Madrid, civilization here, 
is almost as old as the game of chess. Some claim the queen was given her powers to honor Queen Isabella. That, my friends, is a chess legacy. Passion for chess continues to thrive in Madrid. For the first time in 30 years, Spain's capital plays host to the candidates, the most important tournament in chess. At the Palace of Santona, the stakes are high. Eight of the world's best players competing for the right to challenge for the most coveted title in chess, the World Chess Championship. The candidates is grueling. The winner requires mental endurance and unbreakable focus. There are those familiar with the biggest stages in chess, yet still chasing unfinished business and others from the next wave of stars with little patience for yielding to those before them. Mis amigos, the next challenger to the world champion of chess must come through Madrid. Like Queen Isabella before them, the candidates is all about leaving a legacy. We're back, we are back in Madrid Rapport focused on his game. I love this view. I love just looking at it. it. Makes me feel like I'm right there in the playing hall with him. Richard Rapport, of course, is uh, is still in the position we left. We kind of had the sense. We knew we could take that break, so we took it. It's round two of Chess.com's coverage of the 2022 FIDE candidates. In case you missed it, with me here, Almira Skripchenko, International Master Danny Wrench. Our man Hammer is taking a little bit of a break right now, but we're going to continue to have the action for you. We have two more games still going. If you missed it, high level reset. Two games are already in the books. Uh, the two tournament co-leaders drew their game, Napam Nishi and Karwana respectively. And then Ding Li Ren held with black versus Jan Christoph Duda. So will Ali Reza Baruja be able to hold with black, with black here? That would be a birthday miracle, Almira. Well, uh, and you know, Richard is still thinking. Yeah. That's, it means that maybe the win is not so clear. He certainly has to find yeah. uh, the, the winning variation. But look at his face. He, he's looking puzzled. So maybe something that um, Ariza calculated that uh, has a finesse. What do you think? Let's, let's try do something. Like, okay, let's, let, give, let's give a check let's on analyze. this. Let's analyze. We're yes, not going to calculate. One, because I'm too lazy for that. No kidding. Two, I think it's easier for the fans to show the board. So let's try to analyze what we think he's calculating. Again, we've highlighted several times that e6 is not on the agenda because with this pawn controlling the f5 square, white would simply lose the pawn. So that's key. But what else can you do? So what if you just move the king first? Uh, well, I was thinking about check first. Uh, one thing that I wanted to say that analyze and calculate is like if you can make a move and you're pretty sure of it, like you make it, then it's already half a move, you know. Right. So you are advancing in your calculations. So just it's just um, an advice, like yeah. for for the players. So I was actually looking at a rook g7, well, rook b g7 first, not let the king okay. on well, e4. Part of my idea of this, because we'll, we'll come back to it, was mm -hmm. that if I make the rook choose, maybe there's an idea that I'm running in. Right for the mating net, and I'm not actually winning this game with a pawn push. Just to show like some fantasy lines, if mm -hmm. we get something like this, and you come in, you're actually threatening both the rook and you're threatening to mate with check and mm -hmm. mate. Ah, oh, I didn't see rook h5. Ah, uh, that's the move. Okay, that holds everything together. That's the only move, by the way, I think, because otherwise I'm attacking the rook and threatening rook g7, and then rook h8 is checkmate. So what an idea. Okay, so that doesn't work. So now we're on to Almira's idea, which is. Rook B to G7, mm -hmm. King F8. Well, so now I, I can. Well, I cannot play six still because you will take the pawn. So now we have to find like what is the follow up? Uh, can we? Ah, no, we cannot exchange. Wanted to play uh, Rook D7, but this is not easy at all because. Uh, what what happened? We'll just show it so that no, we establish. Then it. it's a, just a draw, of course. If, if takes takes. Yes. Then I. But how is it a? No, because you will always exchange the pawns because you cannot go like easy. My idea was to go king d5, king e6, but it's way too slow. Because that was my idea too. Like, oh, 
if you go here, here, and mm -hmm. here, is it not? But I guess black is holding. Mm -hmm. This is. This just feels so scary for black, but apparently it's holding. Okay. Um, no, no, that's not enough. Of course, like you have two dangerous rooks, of course, so you have to keep them. Yeah, okay. But uh, like my first idea was to play rook d7, but of course it doesn't work as well, usual. By, by the way, he's played the move king of four. So king f4. Probably won't be my idea. He'll have something better than that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do like this idea in theory. You force the rook here before you've advanced and kind of give your king a, a touchdown run ahead from checkmate, right? It, it doesn't mean it works, but you are now within striking distance of ending the game with a forceful variation. So we have to play rook e3. Okay, the rook is hanging, first of all, and we have to keep the rook on the e-file to attack the e-pawn. So that's very important. So I will always take with the check on e5, and then I will have this defensive resource rook h5. So yeah, that's yeah. very important. So, like, I think we have to, we are almost forced to play rook e3. So you have to play this. Mm -hmm. Well, now I, that I know your idea, of course. Yeah. It reminds me, by the way, of, of the game uh, Nigel Short played against Timon, you know, in a completely different, uh, like, context, where the king came from g1, h2, g3, and came to h6 mating, like, with the whole board of oh, yeah, the, yeah. the ball of course, yes, the, the most the famous board is full of pieces the most famous king walk of all time if you if you've never seen this game chat just do yourselves a favor and just google nigel short jan timmon just look and up the that king's game. march yes what? king's march like king, king's march if you just google short timmon like it's like the first result even before king's march because it's such a such a beautiful elegant display of what a king can do to help a checkmate attack succeed um rookie three has been played so rapport not going to go for king g5, and you see the more the engine thinks, the more it thinks, as we said, that it's closer and closer to potentially holding. So it is Ali Reza Faruja's birthday. Again, we've been talking about it. Happy birthday to the young man. He would love a birthday present of holding this game. We need to find, like, the idea. How to proceed, because we have all these checks, you know, yeah. but, like, there is nothing... Uh, concrete once again and it's very strange because when you have these powerful rooks you think that you're on the verge of winning in the game like in two moves yeah and the uh, past deep bound and that like from now you know this was a brilliant defense you i know? mean seriously it's it's it was such a risky defense right and obviously we're both us and the eval bar we weren't alone in saying what are you doing right you're giving white this massive advantage but I wonder how deeply Ali Reza was, was looking ahead, right? Where, where, did he, where did his evaluation, because part of calculating is two parts, right? There's the I go there, he goes there, I go there, he goes there. You go as far as you can. And then at some point you're evaluating in an abstract way a position that is not in front of you and you have to make your decision about whether you can hold it, whether it's an increase of your advantage. So I wonder, like, did he just go to this point and just realize that, look, this isn't as easy as it looks. I know he has a draw, but there's no mate. And if he doesn't have a mate, I got a deep one, right? I, I, I wonder what the, what the abstract sort of uh, goal was that he had in mind. If there was a chance to talk to him about it, we might ask him, we might ask him that if we get a chance after the game. So um, what is the position that we have in mind? Because like, that's why I wanted to exchange rooks, you know, to win the deep pawn and to keep both pawns. That's like something that I was aiming for. Is, yeah. there, is this something that we can, we can obtain? Yep. So, uh, rookie three, um, can we play, um, hmm. rook d7 is a draw even after checks, of course, we've established this, so um, how can we try? Yeah, it's one of those positions where, again, the, the eval isn't telling the whole story, everyone, because, and I'm not saying there isn't a winning path here for white, but obviously Rapport doesn't see it, or he would have moved, right? And we don't see it. And even the engine, if you're running it on chess.com slash events, like many of you might be, it says why it's winning, but there's no concrete suggestion, right? It, it, I mean, the computer right now is basically suggesting to check and then go back. But you know why? Because there is a concrete threat to Rook of eight. You know, do you have to do something about it? Yeah, when you go here, you're threatening checkmate. But my question is, the computer is suggesting this, but why is the Rook on C7 any better than, like, What's the next move, right? And you, by the way, the computer just proved my point. It's bouncing around again between rook c to g7 and rook h to g7. So the point is, sometimes you have positions where 
the computer is not wrong mathematically and, and is here to, to guide us, but converting this is a completely different story. And, and, and coming up with a plan that has risk, like activating your king to lose a pawn, uh, you know, lucky for Rapport is this. He always has a draw. Of course. but Always has a draw. How, how disappointed is he going to be and how uh, inspiring it would be also for Ali Reza. You know, it's like he started the tournament with two draws. It's, uh, it's very difficult, especially on this level. So, and he played two very interesting games. And yep. even if today, you know, it was more of, um, a, p of a positional, you know, advantage for Richard, yep. he probably escaped tactically. Yeah. So that's, uh, but once again, you know, I want to play Rook F8 and take the pawn, but then you're mating me. Yeah. So maybe Rook F8 is a threat and then I will go back. So I don't know. Or maybe Rook F8 and then Rook E4 and I'm checking you and that's a draw like this as okay. well. Okay, so it's not black to move yet, but... Just, let's say B4. Okay. I wanted, so let's say, why not B4, then Rook F8, yep. and then I'm probably checking you. So, you know, so it's... Uh, well, you, you can come in, but yes. now I'm just checking you forever. And actually, funnily enough, the mm -hmm. rook. So that's what I wanted to, to show. White would love to play a move like this, but you just can't, and so it's just a draw. Um, wow. Well, ironically, the only game with a decisive result might be a game that uh, we haven't given as much attention as we normally do with a superstar such as Hikaru Nakamura, but I think it's time for us to back up a little bit and go back over to that game. Hikaru's advantage seems to have increased against Rajabov after mm -hmm. the time scramble craziness that was. We now have a position where Rajabov has been unable to get the pawn on h4, but, uh, but Hikaru was threatening to win yet another pawn and then push him. So. Ah, so that was the reason like behind the maneuver, like a rook d6 you know, bishop c8 and rook d5. So he didn't want to create a pass pawn. He wants to, well, to win the b5 pawn. And uh, and then, I mean, the, the knight centralized defended by c3 is really mm -hmm. key. I think it makes white's chances of, of, of dealing with things here so well, right? The knight is just such an irritating piece in terms of preventing progress and having tricks. So I'm sure Ricardo was calculating force lines now, like what does the race look like if I take b5, exactly. race, and you take h4? and a4 and you know you give a check or something and you try to push and i'm pushing too right i think that this is one of those positions where when you're looking at it sometimes they're evaluating abstract positional improvements right because you can't realistically calculate the game to the end in a middle game you have to improve on your on your advantages this is a position where you could go 20 30 moves down the road possible if you needed to you, you know you don't want to totally do that yet but you're not outside the realm of calculating a very concrete forced variation if you're hikaru here and also, yes, this is a, like a very important point, but also I wanted to say like if you would create a pass pawn by playing a4, b takes, b takes, it makes it easier also for black at some point to sacrifice the bishop, maybe to get two pawns and that would be a draw even uh -huh. like, so that's also like, uh, I think he wants to keep the three pawns here. It's a good point. He, he plays a little bit of tickle there. Let's, let's bring up the analysis board so we can maybe show Almira's variation there. I think that it's important to show that you don't just, you don't just want to play a move like a four. Like before, like rook d six before. I mean, when the rook was in d six, I think. So. Okay, so mm -hmm. a few moves before. Mm -hmm. So here I suggested a four because I wanted to, to create a pass pawn. So right. To, but even if it's a race, so you see, well, I am not sure like how accurate it is. Yeah. Just in case, so even if I play. A5, A6, it makes it easier for black to sacrifice the bishop and then to take the C3 pawn, you know, something like this. That yeah. was my idea. So it makes it easier yeah, for... Yeah, I mean, if you, just to, not, not to say what just, happened, but mm -hmm. just to say, like, if black sacrifices and gets something like this, you're drawing. And you see the table base just kicked in there and says it's a draw. Um, rook, rook and knight versus king and rook, even if white is to corral these two pawns and win them for free, is not a win. So, table base says draw. Um, but that type of variation is exactly what Hikaru wants to avoid on Amira's point, is he's trying to corral the, this pawn mm -hmm. in a different way, although he, he hasn't quite been able to do it. And he, he hasn't had the, let's, let's also look at why he didn't just 
take, right? Because he played uh, c5, bishop d7. So you take it. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe he feels that uh, black has enough counterplay. I guess so. Because, uh, yeah. yeah, he's not sure. So maybe mm -hmm. this is not going to be as easy to win as we thought. Something like check and the king moves and... Okay, now check. No, maybe even check first. Oh, Where you do you check. go? Yes, I want first to... Yeah. Uh, yeah, black's to, not really playing to, for a win. To create, a, yeah, to yes, create so a few threats. And I mean, you're... you. Check and torture. Mm -hmm. I know check I can even take, but if you if you go king e4. Also, I was a bit afraid that after king e4, rook h3, king e4, uh, white could run into a mating net if it's possible. With uh, with the king in on if like you have to be careful. You know, here here you could almost maybe I can take take. I mean, I don't or run h4 also is possible. You see, it's, it's, it's not trivial at all. Yeah, no, the, it, this is a really instructive point to show that it's funny because it's, it's not even so much about the race. It's not that you're not taking this pawn because you, you believe that white can't win the race. It's partly because if black gets this pawn, it opens up all these chances to draw because of the checks, right? So Hikaru's, Hikaru's sort of stubbornness to not just grab the pawn is he, he really wants to find a way to win this pawn on favorable circumstances. He can't let this rook get in a spot where suddenly he's got a whole bunch of draws. And a whole bunch of checks. There was the one moment, I'm so sorry, Daniel, like when the rook was on c5 and uh, the bishop on d7 here. Uh, another possibility was to take knight b5 here, but it's probably it's coming to the same position, yes, like knight, knight b5. b5. Mm -hmm. Probably you just take h4. Yes, exactly, you know. so and then uh, your your pieces are even farther. Yeah. So that's why he covered it into this, okay. Yeah, there's no, I mean, whether you push a4 or bring mm -hmm. the knight back and directly transpose, right? Then you go, yeah, so. uh, rook h2, okay, so then uh, it doesn't work. So yep. now we understand. Now we understand, no, it's so good knight to Knight f3 is a very good move. Knight f3 protects the pawn, mm -hmm. even more importantly, prevents potential counterplay for a draw of some kind. And unfortunately, if you're Hikaru, it also removes the knight from the central position that was threatening to win the pawn. So he's sort of back to square one. But I, to be I'm going to stay with my prediction that I, I think Hikaru is going to find a way here because this is a two result game for white. He's going to grind it. If he finds a way to get his, him and his opponent back in mutual time pressure, who do you take in a mutual time scramble, Hikaru Nakamura or the field? Right? Of course, it's, it's not even a question, right? So I just I feel like this is a okay. Rajabov, incredible player, and, and if he and if he's proving as we look at it that there's some <laughs> sort of optimal defense here. I mean, look at this. It's kind of it's kind of funny, right? There's some geometry here. The rook defends the bishop. The bishop is holding. The rook is keeping everything at bay. It keeps the king out, right, of the e file. It keeps the knight back of guarding the pawn. But so this so is knight of three. is like it's a perfect a prophylactic move. Yeah. Like this is uh, even though like it was very beautiful on uh, d4, like I, I have this feeling of how important it is to deprive your opponent of any kind of counterplay once again. Yeah. Even in the end game. So it's like uh, I like this move very much. So he could keep on increasing the pressure and maybe even play until the very end. Yeah. In the time trouble. So and win the game in the time trouble because he. I think that's what he wants to do, right? If he can find a way to keep this exact position and just put both players under two minutes, he'd be happy. <laughs> that's what Hikaru would like. So, uh, okay. Well, uh, we'll see whether he can do it. If you're just tuning in, of course, we know that Richard Rapport is also trying to see if he can do it and and deliver the birthday boy some a very unwanted present with a loss there. But we've got a lot ahead. We had two games finish, and on that note. Uh, we also had an interview with one of those players earlier today, Dingley Wren and Jan Christoph Duda. They played their game to a draw, uh, and it came out of nowhere. Moments after the match, our own Dina Belenkaya caught up with Jan Christoph Duda about the game. Jan Krzysztof, thanks for joining. We just had your opponent, Ding Loren, here in the studio. You have heard everything that he said about the game. Is there something that you would like to object? Yeah. Um yeah, I'm not very satisfied with this game, to be honest. 
I um, prepared the idea in the opening, which um, of course didn't give me any objective advantage, but I hoped actually to get a playable position and outplay him somehow the process. Uh, but um, the thing was that uh, I wasn't feeling very comfortable uh, in, in this position, and I mean, I yeah, I basically didn't know what to do. <laughs> so um, I think I was worse. Um, I mean, I, I, I really didn't like my position and didn't know what, what to do. And um, yeah, but I think that um, he, he was better. He probably could have played something better. I, I think I think B3 maybe wasn't the best move in the position. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I miss a lot of stuff also in this game. Like he played some moves I wouldn't have found in million years, you know. So um, yeah, I'm quite content with the draw. Even in the final position, uh, I guess it's sort of um, balanced, but I mean, he's, uh, he has two bishops, he, he's better, and I have to just, you know, do nothing and not to worsen my position. So you're taking the road very smoothly, step by step, game by game? Yeah, I mean, today's draw is nothing. I mean, yesterday, of course, I spurred a totally winning position and was very upset about this game, especially that I did see a winning uh, continuation, but at the very the last moment I changed my mind and I actually spurred it totally. So, yeah, yesterday was kind of painful. Today, I mean, it's just you know, a very boring game, actually. Recovering from yesterday. Yes. Right. You are actually the first player who knew he was going to play the candidates. So you had almost one year to prepare. How does it feel to finally be playing the tournament of the year? Yeah, it's very nice. Actually, I didn't know how much time I had because the candidates weren't announced at the time I qualified to them. Um, yeah, I was actually very shocked, you know, that I qualified and uh, because it involved beating Magnus of the World Cup. So. Well, interesting. It's a, it's a funny storyline we haven't thought too much about. He was one of the first players to know he was playing in the candidates, but he makes a good point. He didn't know when he was going to be playing in the candidates or the field of players before him. Uh, once again, the results versus Rapport and Dingley Run have not been updated. So this was the head-to-head -head pairings and schedule setup for young Christoph Duda coming into the candidates. The, the biggest thing that jumps out to me, Almira, is that he's playing Carwana tomorrow. Your oh. thoughts on how he might be feeling? He's, he said to Dina, right? He said, okay, the first game was kind of tough, right? And now it's going to take some rest here. It's a quick draw, right? He didn't see what to do, so he, you know, he didn't want to go crazy. Maybe, maybe he also did it because he wants extra time to prepare for that guy, Fabiano Carwana. What do you think? Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So uh, maybe Fabi took this decision. Of course, he was a long time and yeah. the position was very complicated. But he also knew that he's having white tomorrow. And mm -hmm. well, let's have a look at the score. Right. So he is leading by three victories. Right. So it's uh, I, I'm not even sure that the players, they take the strategic decisions. So they look, so, OK, should I like push harder here, like, right. uh, is this a more important round? But this is certainly something that uh, he's taken into consideration. Yeah. But while we were looking at this absolutely right. brilliant right. young man, you know, young Shistov Duda, I wanted to ask uh, you, uh, do you think that this was the first uh, Polish player to to play the candidates? I know you're, you're quizzing me because you know <laughs> the answer. No, actually, I didn't know the answer myself. You okay. know, I, like well, I, I, I don't. I'd have to think back of great Polish players. I don't know off the top of my head, but it is a great trivia question, maybe for the chat. Maybe a chat answer. Yes, I actually we do, wanted... Chat to... answer. Was this the first Polish player to play in the candidates? Because I don't know the answer. No, the thing is, like, it's it's not so trivial. Because, like, uh, first, what do you consider the candidates? For example, if you're thinking about the uh, London tournament uh -huh. in 1883, the candidate, like, historically, the first it candidates was, it was tournament. kind of the candidates. Yes, but, but you know that Johannes Sukertoid is actually a Polish player. You okay. know, so he won this tournament actually by like by three points margin and then went on to lose uh, like against Tainitz. A lot of people thought Zukertoid was maybe the strongest player in the world there for, for well, some time. Well, so um, exactly. So, so that's uh, that's uh, something very interesting. Yep. At the time, he was born like he was a Polish chess player, of course, but that was the Russian Empire once again. But yep. I think that's a Polish legacy, Polish yep. chess legacy. Yeah. No, great stuff. And obviously, uh, young Christoph Duda wants to continue to build on a Polish chess legacy and maybe help inspire the growth of uh, uh, the rebirthing or more, you know, continued growth for a chess culture that, while, while it has a lot of history, hasn't had a lot of stars in the, in the top of the world. I mean, that's why I didn't know. It was a great question because but I myself like Zucator, I mean, I can't think of a lot of great, I mean, like I'm saying like world championship level 
Polish players, right? There, of course, there are many great grandmasters from Poland, but Jan Krzysztof Duda said in, in, in a quote that he had, uh, we, you know, we quoted, but we'll bring it up again at some point, but he said he always thought he would be world champion. Like, this guy believes that, that he's going to be the world chess champion, and he certainly would like to, to get that shot um, by, uh, by winning the candidates, so... But he himself was inspired also by the games of Akiba Rubinstein, you know, so that's like yeah. the, uh, I feel that he has a great future yeah. ahead of him. So um, let's see first how he does against Fabi tomorrow. For sure, because as Almir said, the first point in question we asked, remember, he has three losses. He has three losses to Fabiano Caruana as we switch over here to the Ali Reza Perugia game. Uh, we've had we've had a move made, Rook F7 check and then King to G8. Um, no, it was a rook g7, a rook, uh, king f8, yeah. probably rook g7. Mm -hmm. But still no, like this. Mm -hmm. no concrete action. And, and the problem with committing your rooks in that way, Almira, is that, okay, I guess it prevents rook f8, so maybe that mm -hmm. was his idea, right? I was going to say, it, it limits your chances for other opportunities, because now the king is attacking both rooks, right? So there's never going to be an opportunity where you, you, know, you, you would move the rook to some other square to attack something or whatever. So... Uh, so can you try before here? That was my plan okay. beforehand. So is, does this work? If, and the, the reason before might be good is because you're taking advantage of the fact that the D-pawn mm -hmm. can't push at this exact time, right? So just want to push like B4, B5. So like, uh, how do you defend here? So what if black plays rookie one check? Rook oh, sorry, sorry, rookie, oh, wait, one. rookie one. So that he can <laughs> turn check, that was in my head. Oh, apparently that's losing. I did sound uh, like... To what? I don't know, like, I, I, I first of all, ah, uh, You can now check and mm -hmm. take, that's yes. it, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that's yeah, That's the difference, And of you're, course. Threatening, you're threatening rook h8, because among many other things. your king is now in f8, of course. Yeah, yeah, the it's king so is on f8, so there's no rook f8. Okay, so that's actually... Can I try before here? But okay, that's a really see. instructive mm -hmm. point I want to highlight again about rook f7. Maybe black can play rook f8, and we'll, we'll analyze that next, maybe, instead of rook e1, but... No, before. But like, this, mm -hmm. is, this, is a, this is a threat that you have. If black makes a mistake, you're now threatening to check and take here, which you were not. You were not threatening when the rook was still on g3, right? Uh, so, like, I'm trying to find. Uh, what we is... see. By the way, we have uh, another check played. Mm -hmm. So if rook h8, then it leads to the same position than uh, with rook d7. So it's the same. Rook h8, king g7, even if your king is a little bit farther. So it's uh, like rook h8 here. What I want to like, I mean. Oh, now? Yes. No, oh. no, I mean, so it leads probably to the same drawish position, even if even if your king is a little bit farther from the e-pawn. Yeah. So I think that uh, maybe you can simply attack the b-pawn and take it. So this doesn't work for sure. Well, it's interesting because we were talking about maybe one of the only chances that Rapport would have to win this would be some sort of some sort of crazy king walk. Mm -hmm. And even though Hammer's not here, I actually want to show that crazy king walk on the Telestrator real quick. You okay with of that? Of course, of I'm course. I'm gonna leave you this alone is... for just just a moment. You mean the game? Well, let's look at this. Leave you alone for just a moment and show that game. It's an it absolute the, jewel. Yes, of course. One of the most epic games you could ever see in chess. Oh, hi there, everybody. Uh, oh no! <laughs> this is we're, we're showing the final position, but no, we can we can show a lot about this game. So, th this game's dominance is really uh, a positional lesson about the power of having control over only one open file on the board. Because White's rooks dominating the D file prevent Black from doing anything to change the position here. The Queen and Bishop, as cute as they look over there, are actually threatening nothing on the King's side as long as the Knight's on F3. And so, snapshot, you look at the position, and none of black's pieces can do anything. But only one white piece is not helping in the current attack. And it's actually this guy right here. So that idea inspired King H2. I remember the first time I saw this game, I, uh, I it blew my mind. The king starts moving forward. And when your opponent is shuffling rook c8, rook e8, when you're about to make the most epic king march in the history of chess, you know that you have problems here. Uh, and bishop c8 eventually played, but too little too late. White plays king to g5. Of course, you could take the rook. That would have allowed king to h6, and any move on the board is met with queen to g7, checkmate. That's kind of cool how it does that right there. I, I like this touchscreen. 
Hammer, I don't know what you were complaining about. This is awesome. I'm going to steal Hammer time from now on, but okay. This is an incredible game. Look it up. Also recommend John Nunn's Understanding Chess Move by Move. Does a great breakdown of the positional lessons of this game. Huge shout out to John Nunn for a great book. Uh, I'm going to head back over here because that was a lot of fun. Well, you stole Hammer's Thunder. I did. I stole, <laughs> I stole the bleep out of Hammer's Thunder. That was awesome. <laughs> And I am, I am happy about that. That was, that was so much fun. So, um, way to go, team. Pulling, uh, pulling up that game. That's, I mean, that's, 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 is that not in everyone's, like, top ten favorite chess games, like, ever? That's, that's a pretty awesome game. Well, you know, the thing is, like, when you look at the position, and I, I just, I can imagine Jan Timon. Like, of course, his position is uh, hopeless, but when Nigel Short played King H2, I yeah. was not sure he realized. It's sort of like, okay, you make a move, you know, yeah. you're trying to improve yeah. a piece. <laughs> but King G3, right. then you understand, then it dawns on you. You know, <laughs> that's, I think, uh, I, it brings, like, I always smile when yeah. I think about this game because this is, uh, well, the aesthetical beauty is very important to me. So, like, this is so beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'm an absolute masterpiece. I, I love the point you made. Like, at what point did it dawn on Jan Timmen, right? Not, maybe not on King H2, but the moment the king goes to G3, you're like, okay. Oh, bleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's the great game. I don't know that Rapport is, is coming up with anything here. And, and talk about a great gift for Farouja's birthday. If you were to hold this endgame in spectacular fashion with the very aggressive approach he took, an approach we were critical of and, and, and kind of shocked to see, but what an amazing defensive setup it would be unless Rapport has another idea. He's repeated moves a couple times here, so. Uh, wait a second, I'm like, that's what I'm trying to establish, like, rook g7, king f8, and king f8. Uh, okay. I don't know. Now, it's not a three-fold repetition yet, but yep. uh, he cannot, he, well, he can play, he cannot even play rook ag7 then, because then he will have no, to repeat, exactly. and then it's so okay. That's what I was saying, the risk of this is, okay, initially I was highlighting that the king is attacking them. Oh, no, he, I think he, is so he taking he, the draw? No, he, no, he, like, took a nut. He, he has to play this rook, the other so rook would have been... He will probably take on g6 then, I don't know, like... Uh. Okay, well, king, king h is the only move, so it'll be played here in moments. And we'll find out if Rapport has more than just a concession in his mind that, that, that we have peace. Um. And you see, Elrez is lo looking at the score sheet. Of yeah, course, they're both looking at the score sheet. Well, he's doing the same thing because, like, Rook HD7 still yeah. does not offer him the possibility to claim the threefold repetition. Yeah. But uh, so, King H8. And, but so, and it's good that he checks, though, because sometimes you make mistakes, right? Sometimes you think it's not three-move repetition if you're Rapport, right? But you actually did mess up. And, you know, we can, we can do a quick discount double check. Uh, so, the, so let's see. So I checked it already. This, so here we have this position here. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Sorry, one, he goes for two, six. Mm -hmm. two, and now two. Okay, so... So actually, yeah, even even this position here, and indeed he does take g6. So okay, we mm -hmm. still have action. That makes me happy. Um, but again, shout out to Perugia, right? Because even though the game continues, it doesn't mean that he hasn't already proven that he was correct, that he took a really aggressive defense. Mm -hmm. Even if there was something better for Rapport that he missed, we don't, I mean, we, you know, we can look at it later. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah. I find it insanely difficult to play the rook and, and games. After yeah. having studied like maybe millions of hours, like yeah. I still don't know a thing. I have this feeling. So, wh wh which feeling specifically? It's, like, it's very difficult to play this rook yeah. ending. I don't know. Like, like yeah. if the, I feel like uh, if I have an opponent up, I will make a draw, and then like if yeah. I'm defending, I will lose. You know. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a very unpleasant feeling. So. Um, well, he took a lot of time on that move. He's taken. He's, he's actually, in hindsight, managed his time well, even though he was under time pressure, Almira. How impressed have you been with his nerves just at this point, right? I mean, it's only two games in. We, we may be applauding a rather brilliant active defense, which you were saying earlier. Dvoretsky always talks about active defense <laughs> versus passive. But, I mean, how impressed have you been with, with the young man's just poise at this point? Actually, like, just uh, to, uh, well, active defense also very often implies also sacrificing something. Like when you activate your pieces, you usually give up a pawn or something, yeah. but it's like sort of 
much better defense than the passive one. So for, for example, they have a material balance like until, until now. And uh, I, I feel that Eliriza still has to be very precise here, of course. So after rook g6, I was thinking about stalemate ideas, but I cannot create two crazy rooks. Yeah, you and, can't and, sacrifice and, yes. both rooks and the and, and at the, the same time. <laughs> at the same time. So, uh, the point oh. everybody, Almira, is saying, if you just took away all of black's pieces, it's a draw. <laughs> the king is stalemated. Um, so. But you can't get rid of everything at once, so you have to play a very precise move here. And, okay, moving the rook, just, let me just make, a, this makes because sense. Because it makes sense because we want to play g3. Yeah. Uh, I, either either rook e2 or mm -hmm. rook e1 both make sense because you're threatening rook f1 check, first of all, mm -hmm. and d3, right? So, so I'm expecting him to move his rook to either e2 or e1. They both threaten kind of the same thing. Um, and so the question is... Uh, maybe rook e2 is a better option because you want also to take the pawn. Ah, okay, like, so yeah, so, so now like, we have a reason to favor yes, this one. So we favor uh, rookie two because it has a third threat. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Well, at least when you're weighing the options, probably this yeah. is the most rational one. I don't know if it loses on the spot or not, so... And then uh, the question is, where does the rook go to deal with this threat? Again, we're not considering lots of checks mm -hmm. here, everyone, because Rapport has a draw if he, if he wants. That's not what we're going for. The question is, is there some other way for him to coordinate what if I save my rook and guard the b-pawn at the same mm -hmm. time? Okay, d3, that's now my D3. idea. So like... Oh man, this is going to be so spicy. It's a spicy one. So uh, if you're not taking a draw here, it might be too late. Uh, exactly, that's, what, that's why I said that. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. uh, maybe now it's time for me to just check my way into a Okay, let's check. try. No, but we cannot, like, d2 is coming. Like, we, there is nothing we can do. No, I mean, seriously, you might just, you might just take a draw with checks and note the king is held back by the invisible fence. Mm -hmm. Electric fences haunted me as a kid, as many people know. You ever been shocked by an electric fence? No. You ever like touched an electric fence? And like not know it's electric and get shocked? You know, we are not bearing arms either. You know, so. <laughs> okay, I, it's happened to me more than a few times. <laughs> guns, guns, I can't, it's it, like... Can't, it was a kind of an inside shout out to Fabiano and Hess. We talked about it at the World Championship. Uh, as, a, as a kid, I have a scarring memory of running away, playing tag, and jumping onto a fence because I was going to climb it and get away. And I jumped onto an electric fence and was like blown off of it. Yeah, it's a real thing. It happens. It happens when you're trying to keep out wild animals. Don't judge me. We're moving on from this conversation. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, reminder everybody, there are still two games left. This one here with Rapport and Ali Reza Perugia. But I really like your suggestion, so rookie two and then d3, so there is nothing you can do against this. Yeah, I, I think rookie two is a great move from, from Perugia, and... Uh, he didn't play it yet, it was like we were supposing it. Yep. I think so. Let's back out real quick and, mm -hmm. and take a look at all four games as they were. Ooh, I like, I like this view, this is my favorite view. This is fun. We got the players, we got all four games, we got results on the board. Hikaru Nakamura. Yeah, this is this is all right. So we want to go over that game with Hikaru. Let's do yes, it. Yes, let's have a look because let's uh, do it. Knight of three, King of seven, Rook D eight happened. Okay, so how does this improve the position? All right, so I, I made predictions that Hikaru mm -hmm. will win. Now it's time for me to put my money where my mouth is. What? What is a plan for White? Exactly. So like. Like what? <laughs> how are you improving it? Yeah, Rajabov <laughs> has really shown how coordinated Black's pieces are, which is kind of where I left it. I was like, oh, bishop guards everything? Yeah, and now this bishop and the rook on e4, it prevents you from playing a4 and having a pass pawn. So the, like... the rook guard, it keeps the knight imprisoned, keeps the king at bay, prevents a4, guards the bishop. Like, this is, you know, very, you know, well planned. Maybe, uh, maybe he fell into it a little bit, who knows, but either way, Rajabov's defensive setup is, is looking genius at this time. Well, one idea behind rook d8 is, of course, to play rook d4. And, well, there is nothing you can do. You cannot exchange the rook, so you would have to, to leave this e4 yeah, square, see. so the fourth rank. So I think that uh, that's what Hikaru wants to, to do. He, he might go for that anyway. That's why he played rook e7. Yep. Uh, I but, like that idea. Okay, and then... Uh, but now you're also threatening rook c7, maybe. 
And you will so be you're thinking rook d4, rook a7, just attack the pawn, mm -hmm. and also you can't play a4 again because I've got. Yeah, you have both rook c7 and much. rook a7 as well. So I was not so so concerned about rook a7 because I always had rook d2, but rook c7, rook d3 is a little bit awkward already. Now, uh, that's another good defensive threat. Mm -hmm. It's really important, just like macro view, to appreciate that how well placed Black's pieces are here because if this pawn were on a5 like if he if he had broken through the barrier this is going to be a winning end game mm -hmm. right but everybody is perfectly preventing any way for hikaru to use the extra pawn although there is one move we haven't talked a lot about yet and that's c4 yes but i want to take with a piece on c4 you see that's like if i if yeah, i could play yes mm -hmm. I see. that's uh, that's very important that's why i wanted to play rook d4 c4 but you're always going you're you're going to prevent me for doing so mm -hmm. That makes sense. And maybe that's why he's going for something like this. As slow as it looks, maybe this is the plan. Actually, the more I, I think about that, like, how do you stop that? That's interesting. That's a very slow, but... So, so Almira's point, everybody, is when c4 is played, if, if you take with the pawns, you've given yourself split targets, right? And the bishop is actually still very perfectly placed to prevent both. But if you can take on c4 with the rook, for example, you have two connected pass pawns. Mm -hmm. And connected pass pawns are way more powerful than split because they protect each other as they move up the board. And step by step, they're, they're almost impossible to stop without some sort of counterplay or, or awkward, awkward blockade. So, so as slow as this is, threatening to play c4 and take with the rook, and, and Almira, like, if you get this mm -hmm. and, I, and I threaten it, can you actually trade rooks? No, no, no. You no, can't no, trade no, rooks, no, so that's is, a really important point. This end game, this end game will definitely be winning for white. The extra pawn, <laughs> you know, you're activating the king is too much. So my, the reason I, I was showing that mm -hmm. is because the point is, if you can't trade rooks on c4, how are you mm -hmm. stopping this idea? You have to put your bishop on f7. So then, well, I uh -huh, force okay. you to play, to take with the pawn. So let's see, does black have time for that? So king moves somewhere, back to g6. Somewhere, let's see. And, and then rook c2, bishop f7. Uh huh. Very nice. And this would this would mm -hmm. force me to take with the pawn. And then I can attack your pawns. Yeah. Now oh. now we're back to a position mm -hmm. where black is in a much. Okay. But at least there's been weird progress, right? Because with the bishop on this diagonal, what have you left behind? This guy. Yes, but your rook is on c2 now. Of course, I am adapting. Okay, but know? but now here I go. Now I'm now I might go for the race. No, rook e5. No 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 no. Rook e5 no? first. Rook e5. Okay, you're not going to let me go for the race? Yes, we've been there before. Maybe rook e2, rook... Ah, rook e2 now, rook c5, and rook e3. Okay, maybe you're gradually improving. Yeah, it's weird. Like, I'm just gradually mm -hmm. pushing. And once I'm here, by the way, what mm -hmm. did we highlight about the rook on e8? Kept the king out? Not anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Now the king is threatening exactly. to get in, or even this way. So, Hikaru... Hikaru has found a plan. I guess that's the point, right? I think Hikaru has found a plan to at least challenge Rajabov's perfect geometrical setup, right? We mm -hmm. were highlighting all the pros and cons of where Black's pieces were to hold things, but that was that was under the circumstances where, where White was trying the other stuff we were looking at, you know, knight d4, or the rook was behind the pawn. So this is a new idea. I think Rajabov sees, sees how hard this position is about to be to hold. Um, well, this position is... As hard as it is, <laughs> you know, I, uh, even if you feel like you found the perfect, perfect defensive setup, yeah, there's always a way which, to improve. Which was another reason why it's like I was again, openly, willingly acknowledging I'm suffering from Hikaru bias itis, you know. But it just I'm like looking at the position, looking at the flexibility he has with the with the piece dynamic, knight versus bishop, the time on the clock, and it's just you know so. Maybe Rajabov spends 10 minutes here, Elmira, and comes up with a new defensive setup. And it, it might exist, right? But that doesn't mean White has committed to anything, right? And now you continue to like, maybe there's another way. And so these positions are just so much harder to hold than they are to keep pressing. Yes, because it takes you so much time to find those setups. Yeah. Then you have to come up with a third setup. And yeah. then the position will uh, change slightly. Let's say we create yeah. a pass pound, then you will have to calculate uh, in a time trouble. Yep. As Beesman93 just said, this is exactly when Nikaru is this good, right? 
with this type of slight advantage to convert where he can press and sort of poke and prod, kind of uh, play with his food a little bit, if you will, right? He's gonna play with his food. Didn't your mother ever tell you not to play with your food? Right? But he's poking at it, right? He's just playing with it, moving it around the plate. He'll eat it when he's ready. Well, you know? I've been traumatized in different ways. <laughs> in different ways, okay. <laughs> well, I had to solve, like, I don't know how many chess puzzles, you know, a day. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I didn't get to eat. <laughs> well, I don't know how many chess puzzles a day either, but I do know we've had two draws today thus far. Earlier, the two former winners from round one and two former candidates winners drew their game. Fabiano Caruana and Yanda Pomashi. Dina caught up with Fabi for a few minutes after that game. Fabi, thanks for joining. Uh, when you saw Nempo took a pause, in a way got surprised, what was happening in your mind? Did you have like some kind of confidence boost? Well, I, I knew that Night G4 would come as a surprise. Um, I don't know if many people have analyzed this move. It's, it's a novelty. Uh, I played the position myself against Wesley So in, in a blitz game or rapid game, I forgot. And I played Knight H7, which is a common move. And Knight G4 is borderline losing. Um, it, it was a huge gamble. It's not losing. It's probably not even very bad. But it, it's, it's definitely a very dubious move. Um, but I was kind of counting on the surprise factor. And I also thought that he would go for what he did, which, which is the most natural way, uh, putting his knight on g3 and everything. And then he shocked me with this rook a3 move. I didn't, <laughs> didn't see that one coming. So that was like a cold shower for you? Uh, well, you, you expect at some point that you're going to be surprised. And that was the moment when I had to start uh, thinking very hard. But uh, I thought my position was very good at some point. I thought I was much better but I, I couldn't find the way to exactly coordinate my pieces because I'm up a lot of material, but he has this very lasting initiative. My king is weak. Um, I thought there should be some way to prove an advantage, but I just couldn't find it. So now you're waiting until you get to the room to find what was the right way to finish him off. <laughs> I don't think I'll check the game. <laughs> Pretty fascinating comments there from Bobby. As far, I mean, that, that was fascinating, right? He's like, he knows he played a bad move at the candidates, the most important tournament in chess, right? And everything he said he thought would happen, happened. That's experience right there. No, it's also, it shows you exactly what I told you, that because this first place justifies everything. Right. So, like, you have to go for it. Yeah. But what surprises me the most is just that Fabiano, and even here in the studio yesterday, I felt that he was so tired. and that, yeah. But he's, uh, like, such a darling, you know, when he talks to you, everything is, like, uh, so soft. And then, yeah. But when you sit across him, like, on a chessboard... Not, not fun. Sort of serial killer. Yeah, I mean, he played knight g4, a, a dubious move, then predicted how Jan would respond, and predicted kind of the further response. Eventually said rook a3 kind of took him by surprise, and of course, huge shout out to Nepomrishi, that's why he's also one of candidates, right? Because he was surprised, but kept his cool. The game never got away from him, and ultimately it ended in peace, as you can see here on the boards before you, between the two tournament leaders. Uh, they, will, they will remain the two tournament co-leaders, because no one... Well, okay, Rajabov could win and catch them, but Rajabov isn't going to win this game. Nobody, nobody else could catch them to tie for first, even if Hikaru Nakamura was to go on to win this endgame, he's much more likely to do so than Rajabov would be to win. So let's dive back into that game. Hikaru and Rajabov are uh, where it's at, right? Rajabov is still on the clock. And uh, what's he thinking about? Well, we don't know who is helping to Timur Rajabov either. You know, it's like we are, we are not even close. You know, to finding out who are the seconds. You know, of the of the players during this tournament. That's true. That's true. So, I, I know a couple, but I don't know. Anyway. Is there something that we um, uh, we like didn't find out at the opening ceremony? Like, uh, who who else? Is there something new? A new information that? No, I didn't find anything new at the you opening have. ceremony, but just like other things I had, I had heard. But, oh, you've heard. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, because no, Rajabov did not have any one at the opening ceremony with him. No. So. It's always funny when a second is revealed at an occasion, at a party, right? I mean, I think maybe sometimes they, they bring their second because maybe people already kind of know. But I think it would, it's a funny story when, like, you know, someone is spotted on the site for the first time, right? 
um, and before that, you weren't sure who their who their seconds were, right? So there's some funny stories there. No, we wanted to say that uh, I think the main uh, Richard seconds is his wife, Giovanna, yes. who is a very strong player. Yep. Like and. Uh, I actually had a question for him, so hopefully he will come to to studio. I wanted to ask him if he shares, you know, his preparation with his wife. You know, when she like needs it? or he not only like when uh, shares like ask her for an advice. Right, right. You know, so it's uh, it's very interesting for yeah. me, like to find she out. She would be more than more than capable of giving it. So, of course. All right. Well, uh, we still have two more games that are going. Um, they will likely be going here for some time, as particular players try to. Try to get a win. We're going to see, of course, how these matches play out. Don't go anywhere. More from Chess.com's coverage of the 2022 candidates. We are live in Madrid when we come right back. Want to play chess online or learn how to improve? Join us at the number one chess destination in the world, Chess.com. With thousands of people playing at any moment, you'll quickly find a game with someone at your level, whether you're a beginner or a grandmaster. Chess.com makes learning fun and easy. Sharpen your tactics with puzzles and enhance your strategy with our lessons by top masters. Learn from your own games with our easy-to-use analysis tool. Chess.com has everything you need to take your game to the next level. Signing up is free and easy. Join Chess.com today. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the opening ceremony of the World Chess Championship Candidates Tournament. No stranger to the candidates, Fabiano Caruana stands as a pretty popular choice for winning it all here in Madrid. Fabi won this prestigious tournament four years ago in Berlin. In his challenger match against Magnus Carlsen, Caruana came just one endgame moment away from his first world championship. I wasn't, uh, wasn't playing my best chess today, and Magnus, uh, I think, played, played very well. Soon to be 30, Caruana's chess resume is matched by few in Madrid. Born in Miami with dual citizenship, Fabi became the youngest grandmaster in U.S. history at age 14. A decade ago, he made history at the Sinkfield Cup, winning seven straight games on his way to a 28-44 rating, the third highest of all time. Precise calculation and deep knowledge of opening theory are Fabi's calling cards. The Italian-American used both to great effect in the FIDE Grand Swiss to qualify for this event. Caruana now aims to become the first player since Vichy Anand to win the candidates in non-consecutive years. But perhaps more importantly, Fabi looks towards another shot at the world title. How many brilliant moves have you played? When do you play your best chess? How many games have you won by castling in the end game? How many opponents have you played from New Zealand? 
And most importantly of all, how many Botez gambits has Alexandra Botez played? Find the answers to all of these questions and many, many more at chess.com slash insights. Our new tool that lets you dive deep into all of the fun and instructive data behind your chess. Try it today. Madrid, civilization here is almost as old as the game of chess. Some claim the queen was given her powers to honor Queen Isabella. That, my friends, is a chess legacy. Passion for chess continues to thrive in Madrid. For the first time in 30 years, Spain's capital plays host to the candidates, the most important tournament in chess. At the Palace of Santona, the stakes are high. Eight of the world's best players competing for the right to challenge for the most coveted title in chess, the World Chess Championship. The candidates is grueling. The winner requires mental endurance and unbreakable focus. There are those familiar with the biggest stages in chess, yet still chasing unfinished business and others from the next wave of stars with little patience for yielding to those before them. Mis amigos, the next challenger to the world champion of chess must come through Madrid. Like Queen Isabella before them, the candidates is all about leaving a legacy. Almira, you talked about you talked about how I would play in such a beautiful scenic location. How would you play in such a beautiful place? Well, I would be looking at the ceilings. <laughs> it's like you're in a 16th chapel, you know. Yes. This is absolutely uh, um, well amazing, and uh, how um, how privileged are we yeah. actually to 
to cover the tournament in such location. So one of the, I think, one, one of the most important, I think, elements of the Greek tragedies is like the settings. You know, we have the, the characters, we have yeah. the drama, right. but we have an absolute the setting. perfect setting, right. I think. So like, yeah. let's see. No, that's a that's a great point because uh, you said the character, right? The plot, yes. Right, but then it's it's why like when you see a movie, the epic sword fight happens, you know, in like a stormy thing and like a you know castle or whatever, right? <laughs> it's like we've got we've got a uh, a scene that is worthy of the gladiators who are here before us playing some incredible chess. This has been another amazing drama packed day here, day two. Uh, no decisive results yet, but still a couple of games that maybe could be. Um, Almira. If you had to guess one of the two games that would end decisively, which would it be? Well, um, it's not that I have to guess. I'm pretty sure that Hikaru is going to win. Okay. You, oh, you, you never said you agreed with me when I said that. So oh, I it's because... <laughs> I like. I love to disagree, just to like uh, for the pleasure of yeah. disagreeing with we, you. We, so. we do. It's good. It's better. It's better content when we disagree. That's just the truth. No, no, no. But here I'm like I'm. I'm really confident that Hikaru yeah. is going to win this, and it's. Uh, uh, well, we know that it is not easy. Yeah. But I think that Hikaru is well is greatly improving. Although now they are repeating a little bit, so he is yeah. like. Shuffling? Shuffling. Shuffling. Right. You can shuffle, shuffle all day, right? <laughs> I, I could listen to that Spanish jam all day, by the way. Do, do you like the break music? Yes, like of course. The, da -da 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 -da. Like, if, off camera, show you guys know, we're just like, we're just sitting here like playing air guitar because it's oh, awesome. Hey. You know? the, uh, the, the, Span the Spanish riff on the guitar is No, is but awesome. we, we need this because, you know, while you're watching the five sets, you know, on the yeah. tennis court, you know, like sometimes we like, oh, all day. Yeah, sometimes you no exactly like it's I mean, baseball the American bo the boring sport of American baseball. Oh my gosh, I said it. Okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, invented like did they invent the weight or no? No. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know actually. Just... But um, if we could get the fans downstairs to do a wave at some point, now that would be interesting content for a chess tournament, first time ever. But all right, we uh, we know we have a couple games going. I think, I think we're going to head back here to the Nakamura Vajabov game, um, like you said. With... I dare you to do this in the playing hall. You know, it's like the silence is like religious silence. You know, you're going there, the arbiter is watching, you know, yeah. like at every possible suspect, you know, everyone is a criminal there. Yeah. So you're going there and you're doing something like, like you're dancing. It's funny because when, <laughs> when I was still playing, I had, I had, I had like fantasies of doing that at some point, like going to the top end of the room. Cause you know, these like epic ballrooms, like the grandmasters are always playing at the top of the room, right? So it would be a long way to get out, right? Of but getting course. all the way in there and then like having like a boom box, exactly. you know, just like, like press play and just super loud music and do something kind of crazy and, and funny. But it's like a flash mob. If you could organize a group of fans to get in the playing hall and then everyone does the wave I'm at the in. same time. No, I mean, yeah. Like okay, so spin. we'll figure out a tournament. <laughs> to someday secretly organize the largest chess flash mob of all time. It will happen at some point on a major tournament. Hikaru nodding his head there. I think he thinks a victory is going to happen here, right? He's like, that was... So there's two, there's two duck lips for Hikaru. Like, one of them isn't quite. One of them is kind of just... just kind of purse, and then there's... like, kind of like, frowning on his opponent's move, and then there's... like, I got this. Like, that's, that's the very well-known one that's basically a meme. Um, for him, so. So let's have a look. Okay, uh, Timura Jabov is down to 17 minutes. Okay, is this the moment where, you know, where Hikaru has to, well, to start something concrete, you know, right. like a very concrete operation. So probably uh, rook d4 now, once again, to kick this rook to the seventh rank. Yeah. And then uh, to proceed with c4, is this possible? It's By the funny way. because he, Rook d4, rook e7, c4. It. He didn't go for it before, could he? He can go for it right away. Could he have gone for it? No, 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 because the rook was on d2. And yeah, rook d2, so. rook e4, rook mm -hmm. d5. Okay, so now there's an opportunity. Yeah, let's let's bring up an analysis board mm -hmm. when we can and just show this line real quick because I think that it would be helpful to show that, again, this whole plan we established of rook d2 is to come here, trade the B pawn for the C pawn in a way that allows white to maintain the two connected passers. So Rajabov defends against this with the move rook e4. But that was my point is rook d4 could have been played here, but he didn't. Instead, he, 
he hits the h5 pawn, forcing the king to g6, and that's why I was skeptical, I mean, or, the, or what was going on, because I, I don't see what white gains in that scenario. But uh, either way, Amira's point is true, that you can play rook d4, and the point is now if the rook avoids the trade, you can finally get the goal we've been waiting for. Which yes, is we, we have trade. to be careful. I was thinking about the if we are not losing the a2 pawn, so that's maybe the point. So c4, uh, maybe rook a7. Uh -huh. So a little... And rook d2, and then yeah, he forces then you, you to take. take with the pawn. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's the, the idea. idea perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, uh, that would make sense. Then rook d4, rook e7. Mm -hmm. Once again, so there is no perfect way for us to execute this. We cannot go knight d2, knight e4. Because you simply play rook a7 once yeah, yeah, again. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can't even defend mm -hmm. the a pawn, yes. so that's a okay. problem. Okay, you cannot improve the knight. Well, again, shout out to Rajaba for setting up an, an, a deceptive way to defend. So sometimes we think of defense as like pure blockade. The other form of defense is the best defense is a good offense, making threats, right? So Rajaba didn't, he couldn't defend the c4 push with an ideal blockading setup of the rook and bishop, but he's preventing c4. Because by doing so, you would allow counterplay against the weak pawn, and that's not something Hikaru can afford, because having to defend it would allow the split of the pawns, and we've already established, and the eval bar agrees with us, this is not a recipe to a victory. So, No, but now I have, now I understand, like, what is the idea also behind the move rook d5, king to, to g6. The king? Okay, I'm, no, I'm the, glad you do, because I don't. So what no, is the idea? I, well, because there are several ideas. Um, is that you need to exchange the rook. So you need to play rook d2, rook e2, and the bishop is not protected. So that's the idea ah. behind the rook d5, uh, rook, uh, like king g6. So now, yes. the thing is, like, the moment you will play rook d2, that's why Hikaru played it, like, he will go back king f7. So that's sort of... Uh, it's funny, he played a3 first, which is also an interesting little way to put the pawn on a different square. Wait, I, I'm and you also the thing is that the key to this position is also that the rook, the black rook, should stay on the e-file. It's not like attacking the h4 pawn. It's like you cannot yeah. bring your king to, yeah. the, to the queen side. Yeah, that's this, the, this is that's a very you're, important you're moment. So, on, yeah. so is there any chance for us to play rook? Well, he played a3, of course, but to, to play rook d2, rook e2, and then king e3. But then probably uh, you will attack this, like the c-pawn. Yeah, that's why I'm confused about it, because from, from D2, uh, sorry, yes, from D2 and E2, the mm -hmm. rook could establish the threat you talked about mm -hmm. and defend. You can't do that now. If black slides the rook back to either E6 or E7 and starts to, to renew this threat, Hikaru must have some other plan. I think he's changing plans again. Um, your idea of inducing the king to g6, let's, let's bring back the analysis board, because again, that was, that was super awesome. I'm just going to show it. Rook to d2 was the idea that Almira had. And if the king had gone back, that's maybe the, why he didn't do it, because then what am I doing next? I'm just repeating. No, if but, the king would be on g6, let's say. But if say. the king makes some other move, yes. maybe now we can play this, given that the situation is... You'd have to, although now the king's so active, maybe it doesn't work anymore. I saw the eval bar slip, and I'm like, it's probably because of just a super active oh, yes, threat. Now so the black king, so of actually, maybe that's another reason why. But okay, this is uh, fascinating stuff for Hikaru to throw in a3. I want to go back to the first question you asked, and then we got lost in chess analysis, which was, is now the time to strike? Because speaking of time, Rajabov is now down to 15 minutes, mm -hmm. right? And at some point, even if you haven't established what the what the clear winning plan is yet, at some point you have to cash in your chips. Of if you're the person, if you're the aggressor, right? You have to go for some sort of plan to capitalize on your opponent's time pressure where they might blunder. Is now the time, right? Is at some point he going to do something that objectively might be a draw, but forces forces for job of hand? Look at this. Like he glanced he at his opponent more. You know he uh, he glanced at Hikaru. And he's well. He, it's like, he's trying to find out what is what's yeah. the idea behind. He's confused about this movie. Movie. Yes, exactly. And I think that so, might be genius by Hikaru. Exactly. Just take a couple more minutes off the clock. 
You know, I know, I, I know I'm not going to win. I, I know I'm not objectively winning on the board. I've been unable as of yet to prove I have a clear plan. So let me just, let me just get you under time pressure. That's why it's a game. So once again, he's not going for anything con concrete yep. because like he's main maintaining the pressure and he's waiting for the time trouble. So 10 more moves to go. I like it. I like it a lot. Sometimes I slip into an Australian accent. Uh, this is Australian? So should they say something in German? Absolutely. Like, what? Uh, Something in German, like the... <laughs> you don't have to. No, no because there's... Absolutely. <laughs> Things about to go on a walkabout. This um, is, no, this is wunderbar. What was that? This is wunderbar. <laughs> this is uh, wonderful. Uh, was well, that a Buenier German accent? No, wunderbar is like... Uh, this actually, Buenier is using it in, uh, in the okay. song, like, but they're saying like he is uh, dancing wunderbar. So. <laughs> I like it. We can, we can just start speaking in, in different accents. I don't speak too many languages, but I do speak... I am fluent in over 72 different accents, so, um, all right. Wow. Well, um, for, for those wondering, there's, uh, there's still two games going. There were two games in the book. Sorry, I was just having a, a mental reset of where we are. Where am I? I'm in Madrid. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, two, two games have finished, and uh, two games are still going. While we wait for Rajab up to make his next move and decide how he's going to deal with Hikaru's A3, let's take a look at the career he's had to get here. Remind you in our chess.com player profile of who the other boy from Baku is. The oldest player in Madrid at age 35, Timur Rajabov is competing for the third time at the candidates and for the first time in nine years. Once ranked in the top five in the world, Raja qualified for the candidates two years ago, but was unable to compete due to COVID concerns. For this year's tournament, Fide offered Raja a wild card, which Raja accepted. Born in the same Azerbaijani city as former world champion Garry Kasparov, Raja beat Garry Kasparov at age 15. In fact, he has never lost to the former world champion. One of the peak achievements of Rajabov's career was his victory at the FIDE World Cup. In that tournament, he defeated the top seed Ding Liren in the final to qualify for the 2020 Candidates Tournament. In Madrid, Raja hopes that he can lean on his experience at the Candidates to post some impressive performances even though expectations for him here are not as high as they once were. You know, it was a funny last comment in the video that Danya says expectations on Rajabov are maybe not as high as they once were, but you think he feels that way? You think Rajabov feels that way? Well, I don't know, like I'm not in, like in John Malkovich's mind, so not in Tamer's mind, but uh, I remember this game actually when he was 15 and he beat Gary Kasparov and I was so impressed because to beat Gary Kasparov in Linares, you yeah. know, at this age, you know, first of all, it's like you're the mystif like you're killing the myth, yeah. you know, and showing your strengths at the same time. So, yeah. uh, so I believe this is also maybe a question of motivation, because like, what else is there to win? So the right. the, the candidates tournaments. So once again, I, uh, I repeat myself, but I think that he is. Um, trying really hard at this tournament yeah well it's interesting because we keep talking about it you know he was a child prodigy and i mentioned the other boy from baku and no disrespect to rajabov but literally gary kasparov is the boy the boy from baku and rajabov was kind of anointed as a young prodigy coming out of azerbaijan and maybe the expectations are different because he's just been around for so long but we keep talking about the fact that if not for the fact that he stepped out because of COVID, he would be the other player here, like Fabiano Caruana, competing in his fourth candidates tournament. Yeah, so, so this is his third candidates yeah, appearance. It's his third, but it's, it's mm -hmm. his fourth that he's qualified for, I guess, in a weird way. Although, I guess that's not totally fair because he was given the spot because he didn't play there. So, but it, it's funny because if he had played half that tournament, he'd be able to say that, oh my gosh, we have a big change. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is exciting. All right, we have liftoff, everybody. The question we've been asking, would Hikaru Nakamura at some point cash in his chips? A3. 
You don't have rook h2 and rook e2. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, now, and now Very he nice. took the pawn. Of course, that's the idea, okay. He prepared everything to take the pawn on b5 to yep. transpose to a rook game just in case, and there is no rook h2, rook e2. And here he goes. Okay. Now we he puts know. Puts the knight on. back on d4. He's going to try to advance the a pawn. And I really love this idea because, all right, let's, let's go full screen here. We'll be able to analyze it in, in just a moment. We've got, the, the point is, Previously on Mira, we weren't liking ideas where you took because there were not just checks that won the pawn, but checks that got drawing chances. But mm -hmm. notice the bishop is worse off here. Yes, exactly. There's no, there's no way to, to keep the king corralled. You could check him into safety, but that's a very different story. So this is, this is a fascinating change. If, if, if everyone remembers the variations we were looking at, something like this is not just going to you know, end in a draw anymore. Oh, okay, actually, LOL. I was kidding. I'm not going to walk into that. But... But there are other ways to maybe get out of the checks too, and the bishop is not in a super active spot. That was my point, is that now this is going to become a pure race position of some kind. Although this still comes with risk, at risk right? Uh, he, but what did we say? This is, this is why Hikaru is doing it now. He could have done this exact same thing when they both had more than 40 minutes on the clock. No, but what I wanted is just to point out that, that on a, a rook h2, you, you might win a tempi by playing king g3. And you don't, you cannot take the pawn on a2. Yeah. So there are just king g3 here. Uh, we'll go, we'll no, go king g3. g3 yes. sorry, mm -hmm. the mouse slot, yeah. So that's, uh, I think that's the uh, the point behind the move. So there is, the perpetual is not here. Well, you have still have to defend. And you can't attack the c2 mm -hmm. pawn. Because the bishop is no longer on the uh, h3 c diagonal, so you cannot give these checks and. Uh, Wow, that's amazing. If you go to a2, you can play a4. If you go to b2, you're not threatening anything because mm -hmm. the knight guards it. And you can't go to c2 because the knight prevents it. So... And once again, uh, Hikaru has chosen this moment while Timur is in the time trouble. Yep. Yeah, and again, that's, that's how you win games. That's why I made the, the comment. It's a game, not a science, mm -hmm. right? It's not a perfect thing because even if a position is objectively should be able... Uh, you should be able to hold. Holding it is a whole other whole other question, especially when you don't have a lot of time on the clock. And try to hold it against Hikaru. Against Hikaru Nakamura. That's not something I ever want, you know, or get excited about. So here so we've got uh, Mirage's they... pawns have momentum too. Okay, actually that's an interesting comment, Almir. What, we'll come back to that mm -hmm. from Bo Bozen, Bozen Burr. Raja's pawns do have momentum too. Um, and we'll talk about why I don't think they're going to be as fast. But uh, what were you about to say, Amir? No, no, just a like, pure question. Like, if you were given a chance facing Minotaur in the Labyrinth or defending this position against Hikaru, what are you choosing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of them maybe involves, <laughs> involves death. Unless, unless it's like a safe word. <laughs> if there's like a safe word that I can get out of the Labyrinth, then okay, maybe. Uh, there's always a way. Yeah, but uh, the question is coming in from chat, and now my head is kind of spinning with calculation. How can Black's pawns compete? And, and, and so I think, first of all, just for the educational takeaway, one of the biggest differences is that White's king is in a position to deal with Black's pawns. Black's king is not in a position to deal with White's pawns. So just quick high-level snapshot why we like White. It's not even necessarily because White has three pawns versus two, because in an endgame like this, it's not how many pawns you have. It's who's going to get a queen first that matters. So. The, 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 the quantity being greater is not the deciding factor of White's advantage, but it's the fact that White's king is in a position to slow down Black's pawns. White's knight and rook are in a position to help that, whereas it's not the same for Black, right? Black does not have any, any sort of ideal way. It's like Black's position is this. It's just a matter of time. It's not if but when these pawns will get rolling, whereas with these pawns, it's not totally clear how to advance with the king. Is that a fair reason why we would... Well, yes, and then while uh, I was thinking rook h1 or rook d2, and Timur, yes, played rook d2 because he's uh, threatening the immediate rook d3 yeah. and taking the pawn. So, like, I'm so but, sorry, but I was even, calculating even, as well. No, no, at the but same even, point, even this so. is, is now possible. But rook h1, on the other hand, uh, was keeping uh, the option of playing h4 in the next move. That's why I liked That's it. Why but your I was move not sure was maybe at all. better, actually. I, I was not sure because then. Your king is on g6 knight, uh, now, so yeah, I could play knight f5, knight h4. 
in case if I wanted yeah, and, to and capture this spell. Well, I'll just show that real quickly because it's a, it's a good example of backing up what we were saying. Like White's king and knight are coordinating. So something like this maybe mm -hmm. could be met by this. And Elmira's point is the knight and king are preventing progress, whereas there's no coordination by the pieces happening to prevent the progress here. It's just a question of can the pawns eventually get rolling? And here they go. Hikaru plays c4. That's the... I was talking about rook c5, but why not push it, right? This is the most aggressive way to defend the pawn. Rook d3 check no longer wins a pawn because the knight defends it. And c4 protects also the rook on d5, so like... Uh, so now you can move the knight. Yes, you can move the knight and uh, uh, maybe knight f3, knight h4. So like you see, the king on g6 is actually very vulnerable. Yeah, uh, it's actually a bit of a precarious spot, not, not a spot you're happy about. There, there are concrete threats now. White is threatening to move this knight to either one of these squares. Mm -hmm. An exchange of rooks probably is not good. The knight comes to f4, and Hikaru might even be targeting these pawns. Okay, well, first of all, how big would this be for Nakamura, right? I know I ask it and ask it. Thanks, Captain Obvious. Yeah, it'd be big, right? It'd be a big <laughs> win, but even more so because he lost the first game, right? It would really show whatever it is about his... His perseverance, not just on the board. We talk a lot about that. He's resourceful, he perseveres, but perseverance off the board, right? Keeping your cool. All right, I lost to Fabiano. I was black. NBD, bro. No big deal. But did, like, like I, I'm afraid to make, the mistake, to make a mistake, but I think he started with the loss at the Grand Prix and he won it. Did this, like, I have no idea. Like, I know he lost to, yeah, didn't he lose to Levon in the first game? Like I mix up now all the results, but I think that's uh, that's a clear, probably example of how you are winning the tournament. There's been a lot of chess this year, so forgive us. <laughs> but I know he did come <laughs> from behind. Very Everyone tired, knows yes. he had to come from behind. He had to win on command, which was part of the drama of that day. Um, so yeah, Hikaru had to come from behind in the Grand Prix. He did so, and uh, in, in doing so, he punched his ticket to get here to the candidates. So rook d3. Well, rook mm -hmm. d3 is played. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this real quick. We're going to quickly get to, to report versus Ferrucia because even though... Wait, something has happened here. What happened? We left it and mm -hmm. Ferrucia had been... He, he was close, we thought, to equality, but where did the game go? So after no, rook f7 he, check... Yes, he played rook e2. Mm -hmm. So this is what we predicted. Yes. And by the way, the computer also likes this for black. It was the best move. e6. Mm -hmm. And here we were looking for d3, or? Oh, he did. He played rook e8 instead of d3. But okay, computer mm -hmm. says you're still holding. So what was what was the mistake? Rook f to f6. But on the other hand, uh, did, well, d3, e7. Like, okay, so j just to have a look the, the at this position, it's a crazy. The crazy line would be d3, e7. E7. Oh, the what idea. I'm just I'm just looking at the computer here shamelessly. The idea is this crazy rook d4 check. And what does like? Because if you go up, I can just perpetual. No, no. But if I go king f3. Now d2. Ah, oh, okay. So after rook f8, okay, you control, and then d1 is going to be there with check. Okay, now I understand. Of course. Yeah, just so. we'll mm -hmm. finish the line so no one has to do it in their head. If you go for this, in fact, it's actually Ferruja mm -hmm. who would go on to win uh, with this. So, so he. He must have calculated something that he didn't like because what he played in this position was not only not d3, but he went for a, a very passive blockading setup here with the move rook to e7. And this is the one that the computer is saying uh, no. What? Oh, this happens even among the best players in the world when they don't have the benefit that we have, not only of the eval bar, but the engine variations. If we even want to check them, they're right there. So, report plays... But why is it so clear, like, after rook e7? Because I still want to... R report plays b4. Apparently, the winning move was king f5. So, compared to the variation that we had, d3? Okay, let's calculate, you know, so it's just... What do you do here? Well, uh, the first move that comes to mind is rook f8 check. Mm -hmm. King h7. That, that doesn't look... Yeah, this looks fine. This. So there's something else here. I think that one of the biggest issues, though, is the mating net for the Black mm -hmm. King. So some sort of idea like Rook G5 to come over is interesting. Or maybe no, but I can check you maybe then. Rook G5, Rook F2. Yeah, Rook G5, Rook F2. So I'm trying to create a net. 
right? Mm -hmm. So again, yeah, something like this actually. Because uh, now you stop the pawn and you threaten mate. Okay, now and, and yes, and if rook f two, yes, then and okay, and the e six pawn is protected. Yeah, yes, yeah, of course. So rook g one is like is a very beautiful move. Okay, rook g one threatening mate. Well, or yeah, not not rook f eight. Rook g one mm -hmm. threatens mate. It's not and yet mate. You still have rook h seven. Okay, my but apologies. then but then my king is close, simply yeah, closer, yeah. and I'm keeping. Uh, okay, we have we have a move from Ali Reza. Mm -hmm. It was d three after b four and. We're back to a position that the computer says should be held. In fact, what a critical tempo that b4 is to lose because the fact that the pawn is not protected, Almira, mm -hmm. means you can't do any of that stuff. There, there is no rook down because you lose the pawn. So, so king f5 was a massively important move. And but on the other hand, uh, Alvarezza didn't play d3 like for two moves. So yes, he, for sure. So no, no, it's hard to. No reason to paint the storyline like it was a one-sided Rapport blew it, but the point is he did have a win there with that interesting king of five idea. But what a, these positions are some of the hardest in chess. Like from from my perspective, like the open board, multiple pass pawns with rooks. These this is like these positions are just impossible for humans to calculate because it implies so many variations, yeah. like in a very di direct sequence of moves yeah. where the whole board is like uh, open yeah. once again. So like pawn end games. Yeah. Very difficult to calculate. Uh, like rook versus pass pawn, those positions where you're trying to make a decision. If you can queen, your opponent's going to give up their rook for the queen, and then are you able are to you get in back time? in time, yes, right? Of course. Like these are the positions that give chess players anxiety because the engine here will, will, will make it look easier than it is. This is a super difficult position to calculate, and obviously, as we saw, um, in the open board with all kinds of checks, all types of racing going on. You're knee deep in the weeds, and it's it's hard to see your way through the forest. So, I think um, it's going to be a draw now. I think the d3 is just in time. I think uh, we don't be surprised if we see the bailout. Meaning he he just he plays he brings the rook back, and we just get a big exchange. There is there is one okay. There's one outside thing though. If the rooks are traded on e6 and white wins d3. Yes, but they're that good. that end game, <laughs> that end game is actually winning for white. Yes, but because the king is too far from the b pawn. The thing is, like you have to deal with my d pawn, like d two d one is a real threat. Of yeah, course, so you, you okay. Let, let's let's just show it real quick. So if rook to mm -hmm. g three, mm -hmm. the move has to be d two probably. D2? I, mm -hmm. I'll show the line because if rook takes, this is the point. If you take, everything gets taken, and then you take. Wow, the table base says this is a draw. Uh, initially looking at this, I would think this is a winning endgame for white because you're putting the rook behind the pawn and you're pushing. But I guess black's, black is just in time if you try this stuff. The king gets to f6 and you blockade. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was, I was assuming it was winning, but the king is actually just in time to shoulder the white king. Okay, wow. So that really says this is going to be a draw then. Because if you can't go for that, what are your winning chances if you're report? Rapport? Report? Rapport, report. the Colbert rapport. <laughs> I, I keep putting different emphasis on a different like, syllable uh, each time. Richard Retzi, you know, so Richard, Richard rapport. I apologize. It's, it's a, it's a. Well, in French, you know, they would say Richard rapport. I, I don't struggle with so. with like Jinji Hashvili or Napomnishi, but then like it's rapport, easy. rapport. No, no, rapport. but this is easy. Okay, these are easy. Well, yes. you're Russian, right? I'm not, so like learning to. But Jinji Hashvili is Georgian as well. Okay, like. okay. I apologize. You're right. Um, but uh, anyway, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. I'm just going to apologize to all the rapport. And also, like I'm like half Ukrainian, half Armenian. <laughs> Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, and, and now he's Romanian. That's right. Well, he's playing for Romania. No, he, no, I mean me. Like, oh, I, like you, you, yes, yes. yes well. Like, I'm, I'm this crazy mix. You know, he put this like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, it's not officially represented in this event because it, it, FIDE would have to acknowledge and, and approve the federation application to change before it becomes official. But uh, Rapport mm -hmm. has. Uh, requested to change federations to Romania rather than Hungary. So, interesting. Well, um, I have a question, like, because yeah. like, I had some thoughts on this. Uh, do you think that the number of times that uh, the player should be allowed to well, switch federations should be limited? 
That's an interesting question. Because I think that this is a very important decision for me and uh, and for the players, I suppose. So uh, probably uh, there is a moment in life where they have to take this difficult decision and to represent like another federation. That could be marriage. You know, you're changing the country. Right. So, but how many times? Could, Could you, you be allowed to do because, it? Because, like, I was thinking maybe it should be limited to two times. That would make sense. You know, you don't want someone bouncing around and kind of leaving leaving a, a trail, you know, behind them. and Because and there's a lot that goes into that, right? It, especially for top players. It affects the Olympia team. It of affects course. all kinds of selections. You you know, when you change federations, you affect the top players in that country. If you're, you know, there were, there were all kinds of controversies that I won't speak of, you know, when, when certain players switch to, switch to U.S. federations, right? Young, up-and-coming, talented Americans weren't totally thrilled about that in some ways, right? Denying them the opportunity to maybe compete, you know, for, on Olympic teams and these sort of things. So there's a lot to it. I think it's, I don't think a player should be denied the opportunity, but I think it's interesting. I also think that we should get back to the okay, Hikaru let's game. Have, um, let's have a look. By the way, it looks like, uh, okay, Rook G3 was played by Rapport. I think we're going to have a draw very soon. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to switch back to the Hikaru game as soon as we can because the advantage has gotten bigger for Nakamura. Mm -hmm. uh, so he went with his king to h4. Okay. Yeah, so after we mm -hmm. left it, it was Rook D3 check, mm -hmm. king h4. It's funny because if you could put the bishop on this diagonal, Mm -hmm. Checkmate. Anyway, that's not a thing. Bishop of seven, rook d8, and now rook d1. And again, what do we have? Less than five minutes. Okay, five minutes for how many moves? Uh, yeah, we should we should actually check into the format of that. I think it's it is move sixty, so it's two more moves. Mm -hmm. Two more moves. Yeah. So at two, in two moves, he will get more time. And we quickly remind everybody that. 60 minutes was added after move 40. Another 15 minutes will be added. Plus, we finally have an increment uh, on the clock at that at that benchmark. So, reaching move 60 is a huge threshold for Verjavov to hold this because once you start getting 30 seconds back on the clock with every move, you know, not to say that the position might be losing, but at least the clock is is way less of a, of a stress. To be, to be honest, I find this uh, this time control like very logical, especially like when you're adding the thirty seconds only at the uh, last stage of the yeah. game. So because like, what was the purpose of the increment initially? So like, you wouldn't lose it when you're a queen up. So we convert to win an end game. So like, it's not to assure that you that would be such a easy way through a time trouble. Yeah. So I think if you if you see it yep. in this way, so this for me, this is very logical. Yeah, it makes it makes every one of the time control moments, the time pressure moments, more exciting and more dramatic. It obviously puts more pressure on the players to manage their clocks better, as as our as our partner Hammer was saying, right? So I, I, I agree. I think it's I'm coming around to it. It's it's interesting and, and a little different than what we've seen for the last two decades of of or even three three decades of top level feed HS, but it makes sense. And again, as Dina, as, not Dina excuse me, I'm, I'm reading Dina because we have an interview coming with Dina soon, but not right now. So <laughs> as Almira was saying, um, the whole purpose of increment initially was to kind of get away from the rule we used to have of insufficient losing chances, right? Where a player couldn't just get flagged, exactly. right? Oh, and that was a big thing because before we had digital clocks, we had big analog clocks. I've been flagged before in a drawn position. It doesn't feel good, right? And so increment was designed to ensure that what was on the board would ultimately be the deciding factor. So and to avoid this kind of absurd situation right. and probably not fair as well. And, and, and so uh, Almira's point is great that it only really makes sense that you have to have increments should the game go to very long extent. Like after move 60, when you're in an endgame, I, I agree. It makes a lot of sense. Um, insufficient losing chances is a, a rule that is so unique to chess. Um, all right, rook h1 check. The king quickly moves to g3. Here comes h4. Shout out to our, our Twitch user who said, well, what about black spawns? Well, here they go. The problem is that now we'll see king g2, I think, with tempo, or do you just, do you just go to f4, actually? f4? Hmm. I like king f4 better because I just want to point out something funny, that if you play king f4 and black plays h3, black isn't even really threatening h2 because white can just come back to g3 and black is stuck. Right? Yes, yes, I agree with it. It's like uh, I was considering king g2, of course, naturally. So uh, uh, king f4 is probably 
more active, I don't know. Like if this works, H3, King, G3. Mm -hmm. mm. But our chances of getting dimmer, dinner are slimmer. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm normally the host who forces unnecessary rhymes onto a show. <laughs> well, I, I was not even sure that was a rhyme before. It's like how, ti <laughs> how chances tired. Chances of a winner is slimmer. That's, a, that's definitely a rhyme by today's modern standards of the urban <laughs> art form known as hip hop, R&B, and rap. Um, yes, I would believe that uh, a winner and slimmer rhyme. No, it was actually dinner. Oh, you said dinner? Dinner. <laughs> dinner also rhymes with both. Um, all right. Well, we've got, we've got these two games going. By the way, I think we're probably moments away from a handshake in, in, in Ferrugia Rapport. But while we wait for these final moments, we're going to squeeze a few seconds. And uh, we mentioned, of course, there was a draw earlier between Jan Christoph Duda and Ding Li Ren. We saw one interview uh, with Jan Christoph Duda. Let's see what Dina uh, and Ding Li Ren got up to earlier in the afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Please take us through your emotions during the game. Oh well, it's a uh, it's a quite game, but uh, quite interesting. Uh, I think at some point I thought I was better, but uh, he played a very good move rook b1. I think that's a, a very good idea he found. So it, it looks my move g5 is not that good, but I don't know where where I went wrong. It turns out. My position is slightly worse in the, uh, the final final position, I think. But but I don't know how to uh, process for white. At least comparing to yesterday, uh, yesterday I played I think one of the worst games recently in my career. Uh, but today I feel uh, much better. I think uh, the draw is a quite good result for me. So you're going like between ink. After a loss, a draw is a good result. Uh, yeah, especially after yesterday's defeat. And do you think for your opponent, draw was also a good result, judging that you had the three times repetition afterwards? Uh, at first, I thought he is slightly better, since uh, maybe he can try for more, but uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, on another note, uh, we were wondering, what were your first thoughts when you realized you actually could be the candidates, that you actually had a chance to, to be in the candidates, what were the first things you thought about? Uh, well, at first, uh, she told me that I only need to play 30 games uh, to, uh, to qualify. Uh, uh, even if I lost all the games, I can still play the candidates. But then uh, somebody told me that it depends on the uh, average Ratings. So I need I not not only need to play 30 games, but I need to get a quite good results. So I feel uh, not. I'm not sure if I I'm going to play these games. But after uh, in the end, uh, yeah, they they convinced me that I had good chance chance here. So I just. Uh, mm, um, so you didn't accept immediately, but you had a thought. Yeah, but in the end, I, I, I take the challenge, yes. Do you... He sticks to the challenge. He's so sweet. He is, he's the sweetest, right? Yes, it's, but at the same time, once again, he's one of the strongest players in the world. He's the top seed in this tournament, and I'm actually glad he did. Yeah. He, he was... Like, so he's, he qualified for this tournament and he has a chance. When you look at the rest of his, his matchups, and we know how strong he is, we know he's trying to right his own ship, right? Uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is ahead for him? Well, I have to look at the biggest, uh, at the bigger screen, so... Oh, that's disappeared. <laughs> I can barely well, got, see the results, yes. A uh, great score against Caruana. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, we already mentioned this, yes, especially that it would be uh, tough for Fabi. He's a very tough opponent yep. for Fabiano. So I think um, this is something that uh, he should count on. So, uh, what, what, what do you give to the, uh, speaking of Soviet chess school, the, the theory of you never lose two games in a row, right? And he talked with Dina. Obviously, we all know he got off to a tough start. Of course, again, we will update that record as we go, reflect that he lost mm -hmm. to Napomnishi, but... 
How, much, how important do you think it was for Ding to come into this game and just stop the bleeding? No, it was very important. Of yeah. course, if you can, it's probably he, if the position would allow he, this, he would play on. But I think that uh, to make a draw with black in this tournament is very important. And mm -hmm. so you uh, focus on your preparation. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very important psychological moment as well. Well, and he did it. Ding Li Ren delivered with, with the draw, stopped the bleeding, right? And then, of course, he remains in the hunt. Uh, we have Ali Reza Faruja on camera here. We have a game that I believe is, is about, to, about to end in a draw. <laughs> Table base announces a draw. Um, similarly to what we were looking at, although it was even a draw if the rook was in front of the mm -hmm. pawn. Typically, this is not the ideal spot for the rook, but as we saw, even that was a draw. Here, Faruja points out that he has a different plan. This is the ideal setup for the black rook, of course, where you can stop the pawn from behind and uh, put the put the opponent's rook in a bad spot to have to defend it. So, Well, you want to bring your king, of course, closer to the b-pawn, like yeah. with black, but your rook is also cutting the white king. So you're combining both ideas. So yeah. when the rook will leave the d-file, your king will come closer. Uh, so I think it's it's a very easy draw. Yeah, very easy draw. Sometimes when the king is cut off this many files, right, you actually have very good winning chances, but the big problem is this king is also cut off that many files, right? Uh, if you took the white king and just put it over here, this is a winning endgame for white, because the king and pawn can work together up the board inch by inch, and this, excuse me, this rook, this rook can't stop them by himself, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the king would have to get over there. So the point is, because this king has cut off so many files, but white's is also cut off, it makes this, makes this a pretty easy draw. Well, and you will have to defend the b-pawn in a way. So you will have to play either rook b2, rook d4, rook d6, or rook b6, and then yeah. so. Yeah, makes sense. So I think Perugia knows it's a draw. I, I, the only reason I'm like focused here is I had I have this feeling we're about to just see a draw offer and just see the final mm -hmm. moment, you know. But okay, it, it may not happen. And the much, the much more exciting game for sure is the, um, the Nakamura battle with Rajabov. So, uh, I don't think we're about to see a final result. I don't know. Body language not saying so. So why don't we why don't we head back over to the game that has a lot of spice to it? Hikaru did not play. Hikaru did not play King f4. He played King to g2. Yes. But yeah. I told you that was the first move I was considering. It's a, it's a very human move, King yeah. G2. Like the, the much more human move, for sure. So King G2, well, what to do here? Rook B1, Rook D1. Uh, so let's just say you come mm -hmm. over. Rook D1. Mm -hmm. Let's say we continue. Hikaru played A4, A5 now. So what, yeah, can, what, what can you do here? There is no way for you to stop the A pound. And if you, if you check me a whole bunch, you're just checking me mm -hmm. back. Or, or actually, just a 3 even better. Yes, here I can play uh, d2, king h3, of course. So uh, It's actually a serious problem, right? Can you bring your king for, like king g5, for example, to play something like this? Or, I uh, know, knight f3, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. you're so, so, no, okay, it was a bad, bad try. Then maybe king h5, okay, that's the wrong square. Oops, <laughs> so rook d1. King H5. Yes, I want to bring the king to G4 and push A3, so yep. that's my only chance, of course. So, what can I, I do? I, A6, push. of course. Just, so. Why hold back? Okay, now I have to play. Uh, okay, then, but then maybe not Rook G1. Rook A1 was the more stubborn okay. difference. I don't know. Like, uh, you see how difficult it is to defend this position. Yep. So, so you put the rook on A1 because at least this slows down the pawns. But now we push the other pawn. Oh, yes, c5 is coming. Okay. Really important that this bishop cannot get active. Mm -hmm. That all of white's pieces are perfectly placed. Okay, then this is, uh, this is a very easy win because... Yeah, I mean, this is... You right? cannot advance. Yeah, you, you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. Rajabov may have gotten 15 minutes back on the clock as they reach move 60, but he hasn't gotten a better position. And that's that's a problem. <laughs> so he's he is facing a very uphill battle right now in this game with Nakamura. What a huge win it would be for the American. And by the way, we we do have a mm -hmm. result, as we can see on the live screen, the Kings put on the squares E5 and E4. That means we had 
a peaceful, peaceful result. So, you know, what would what what would you be doing emotionally if you're in Richard Richard's camp, right? Do you look at this game and say, especially once you turn on the computer, that that I messed up, that I, I had a win? Or do you feel like, okay, this was very complicated, unreasonable that I was gonna solve this, and a draw is a draw? Well, I, I would certainly analyze, but I wouldn't draw all these conclusions. I think that, okay, you, you had some winning chances, you missed it, yeah. but I think that it was uh, very complicated, first yeah. of all. And once again, you have again, you have a game tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, it's very important to focus your, on your next challenge. So you have dinner with your wife. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what I you think do. So. You have dinner with your wife. Yes. And then you, and it's, then you it's, uh, think about it. No, it makes sense. You have I mean, a romantic dinner. Like, it's uh, much more important than to analyze with computer. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's just interesting because for those just tuning in, there was a very exciting moment in that game where Verugia took this active defense that was at the time looked like a decision that might cost him the game and ultimately it proved much more difficult right mm -hmm. to convert and so it's hard it's hard to beat yourself up i, I would agree fiuja is uh, here with his family yep. his whole family came to madrid yep. so now probably they well they they will have a well deserved celebration yeah well a great draw on a great birthday so i guess this because this might be our last chance to talk about it happy birthday Dolly Razor Perugia, a good present you gave yourself defending what looked to be a tough spot uh, in, in some moments. So he is still, still in a great position with two draws to start his first ever candidates campaign. So, all right, let's, uh, well, we're gonna have one more game and that's where our full focus is gonna be. Let's give a quick shout out to our Chess Kid team once again, here doing amazing stuff in Madrid, if you can hear me downstairs. But Chess Kid is excited to announce the first ever FIDE and Chess Kid unrated girls only tournament. Girls only in this event, the tournament is free to attend and takes place on July 10th, 2022. There will be two editions of this event, an Eastern edition and a Western edition. You can join at chesskid.com, visit our main website for more information and uh, sign up your, your young lady chess player today. Or if you are a young lady watching this, go, go sign up yourself. So shout out to Chess Kid for that event with FIDE and shout out to this last game remaining. We, uh, we gotta get back to it, I saw, I saw you you, you pointing. What were you? What were you excited about there with, with King G? No, 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 no. So I was, I was actually uh, excited about the events. I think it's a wonderful initiative. So, but I wanted to get the board. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll to, dive in here to get to, back uh, to the board. So. What can Rajabov do? What are his last chances? Let's let's dive in and and see. So, we have. King on g2, attacking the rook on h1. So we have to find the way to sacrifice this bishop, you know, for at least two pounds and maybe, like, should be. We tried rook d1, it's losing. Yeah. Rook a1 is losing. Maybe rook b1. Okay, let's. Yeah. Is there uh, any can, way? Can we get the analysis board here? We, uh, mm -hmm. we need to pull up the big board so we can take a look. Uh, we've got king g2, so now you're saying rook b1. Mm -hmm. Well, we tried it. All so that's yeah. the only move which is left. The nice thing about that move is, I guess if you play c5, I can take maybe. Yes, I yes, ex yeah. no, that's exactly what I was hoping for. But you're probably going to play a5 here. A5. Mm -hmm. And also, it allows me to bring my king without being checked on f3. So maybe that's like because we've tried all the variations. So maybe here I can play king g5. Yeah. What do you think, Penny? King g5? If okay. knight f3, then I, I still have king g5. This, this mm -hmm. looks mm -hmm. like you're getting aggressive. This yes. is not what I want, right? So I don't, I don't like knight f3. And the pawn on b3 is like... Is I, I just want to push face. until I learn mm -hmm. that I can't. Um, okay, now you're forcing me to play rook a1. Mm -hmm. And now... Now that my b-pawn is no longer attacked, my knight is free to do some... But can you push c5 here? I oh, know, a6 is like hanging. Wait, wait, wait. Well, it's not totally crazy because, I mean, it's not how many no, pawns no, you have I left. It's I'm threatening to take on a6. We forget. Like, with the rook? Yes. No, but I, I, no, I, I agree. The thing, I'm saying it's not a crazy idea in the sense that mm -hmm. in the end, it's not going to matter whether you have any pawns left if you get mm -hmm. a queen. So it's kind of a funny line, like c5 takes, c6. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that's all. I, I, I agree with you. I, I saw it was hanging, but it's interesting. I think more likely you should try to do something like defend the pawn, 
and then look to give like some sort of check with the knight or something. I okay, but now that's what I wanted to achieve. I will play king g4 and I want to play to push h3. Yeah. That's okay. the only chance I have in this position. The hardest part of the situation is it's easy for us to analyze, you know, two brains together, an eval bar with it, right? Rajava only has eight minutes on the clock. And uh, it's not going to make his task easy at all. Here it is, big moment. And he, he actually... Where? He chooses rook to c1, okay? So... Ah, but now we know that... Uh, now we already know that a5 yes, is... Yes, Hikaru can play a5. Yeah. Wait a second, but did we... Um, what was the difference between rook b1, a5, and did we try, like, we can still try rook c1, a5, king g5 here. What is the difference exactly? Uh, that the b-pawn was hanging, that you couldn't play? Yeah, so that what if you is the, the difference? Knight, the b-pawn was hanging before. Although this is, this, is this is not clear to me, yes, because king g4 is still a threat, so I don't see what is the difference. Because we didn't try king g5 in this variation. Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. When the rook was on d1, we tried mm -hmm. it, and then it was a blunder yes, of a check. Of course, I was blunder. So you're right. So. This is mm -hmm. uh, definitely not something we've totally analyzed yet. So king g5, what does white do? Do you just push a... So what happens if I just push a6 again? Just mm -hmm. push until I learn that I can't. Well, I... Rook a1, I have no other option. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. we're back to that same scenario. Hmm. And... So, we don't want to push... Push too far away. So maybe rook c1 also works. So it's the same, the same idea. Yes, it was the same idea mm -hmm. that you had with rook to b1, but mm -hmm. preventing the move c5, I guess, made a lot of sense. and. Hikaru is, he was about to move there, it looked like, right? But now he's pulled back and he's reconsidering. So what if I play check right away? My idea is that now you have to go to g4, because if you move elsewhere, I think I can take the pawn, now that your rook is in here, I think. Ah, yes, and that was the difference, of yeah. course. So, and, uh, and now if mm -hmm. you play here, I also have rook to d4, right? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I changed the move order. Okay, then knight of three, king of four, Oops, of so course. Knight of three, yeah. I'm probably uh, uh, losing here four. anyway. I'm given this pawn, but I'm coming with my king. So now I simply check. Okay, yeah. where do you go? Yeah. I, if I go here, you win. It would be a very, very good birthday present. For all Reza Perugia. Um, so, you would love to see that. Mm -hmm. So rook c2. And where do you go now? I, r I run here. Ah, yes, we run here. Okay, so... I have to attack. I will have to sacrifice my my bishop at some point. I, you know, I'm obsessed with this idea, so I can give up my bishop. And but uh, I have to stop. Okay, rook a2 now. Bishop c4 doesn't work, I think, because you will have time. Okay, rook a2. Rook a2. If you give some sort of check and you walk mm -hmm. this king up, you're actually maybe getting yourself in trouble. Knight e1. Knight e1, mm -hmm. king e3. Mm -hmm. There's no check made here with the knight on e1, but it doesn't feel good <laughs> to be in this spot. Well, and you can give, you can still give rook d3 check, but it's, well, it does yeah. not achieve anything. But you also anything. have to guard the a1, mm -hmm. right? You cannot protect it, right. So I think, I think if we back up, I, I think Hikaru is, this is not an ideal winning plan, right, to go for this pawn. Once again, we're going for the active defense. We're like giving away yeah, which everything. Yeah, that, that's how you want to defend these positions actively, and don't let your don't let your opponent Hikaru Nakamura grind you down to where you end up beating yourself on the clock. Okay, eight minutes left. Eight and a half minutes left. Twenty six mm -hmm. minutes. If you're just tuning in, all three other games in round two of the 2022 FIDE Candidates Tournament have ended in draws. Uh, which means that uh, should this game prove victorious for Hikaru Nakamura, it would be the only decisive game of the day. So, and, and a, long, a long day, what? No, 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 because I, uh, like, 
we're in, we know that this is a new function where you can predict the results now on the yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, how many people uh, were right yesterday? I wanted to know. Do we have the statistics? Uh, we'll pull it up as we go. I, I, I don't have it. We do. Mm -hmm. We do. And, and, and I know that our community team, shout out to everybody working hard on that, is gathering that stuff. So we will have standings and an update of who's leading the, the, the vote on the results thing um, as, as we go. So it's good that you are not doing this for a living. As well, yes. I am not <laughs> guessing. I am not gambling or guessing on chess results for a living. That is for because sure. Because, like, you know, you're. Yeah, my not job is close. to be wrong on camera. That's my job. So I just, hey, Danny, go be, go be wrong on camera. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, thankfully, my job is not on the line by, about whether or not I predict the results correctly. But, uh, okay. You see, I'm feeling like third day, so we will be even better. So. We will be even better. At some point, I, I do think you get a little better when you're in the flow of it. You're no longer just guessing for content. In the beginning, I'm kind of just guessing for content. Like, hey, although I did predict a Hikaru win here today, for the record. Well, OK, this, uh, this is your lucky guess. It is, it, is, it is my lucky guess. I don't remember what I predicted in the other games. Um, I predicted a win for the birthday boy. I was wrong about that. So, but I think the other games I predicted to draw, so. All right. We know so many fans are tuning in from all over the world to watch Hikaru Nakamura throughout this entire event. And right now, of course, they'd all like to see him get the dub. So while he thinks about how he can continue to maybe press his advantage, let's remind everybody of uh, who Hikaru Nakamura is. His community doesn't need a reminder, but it's fun to see their star highlighted in our next Chess.com player profile. In qualifying for the candidates, Hikaru Nakamura ratcheted up the level of interest in what is already considered the most important tournament in chess. With millions of followers as a popular content creator, Hikaru brings along his sizable community while also attracting more casual chess fans. Although once ranked number two in the world, most believed Nakamura's best days competing in classical chess were behind him. That changed when this Japanese-American Grandmaster leaned on his exceptional calculating ability to win the FIDE Grand Prix. The unexpected victory earned him a bid into the candidates for the first time in six years. A five-time U.S. champion, Hikaru has stayed sharp of late by dominating in speed chess formats. Nakamura is currently ranked by FIDE in the top two in both Rapid and Blitz. A chess giant on Twitch and YouTube, Hikaru brings a special buzz to a tournament that already holds the keys to becoming the next world champion. And there are certainly those who have yet to rule out Hikaru from catching lightning in a bottle here in Madrid. I have definitely not ruled out lightning in a bottle for Hikaru Nakamura to win this tournament, for sure. I mean, he's, he's playing arguably the best chess in his career right now. Shocking as that might be for those who, who thought he literally didn't care. Almira, he does care, right? And uh, what, what would be your thoughts on his chances, especially if he rebounds with a victory here? Well, first of all, I think that his motivation is very different. He wants to win this tournament in order to like to bring happiness. You right. know, this is absolutely incredible. So it's, uh, it's something which motivates him more than anything. Yeah. E even probably when he was the number two in the world, we, we should not forget this, yeah. that he has achieved everything. Yeah. So it's probably, and now he has another show that like at, at the candidates and probably like at the world title. So yeah. it's interesting, and, and and you know, yesterday you talked about it, and I agree. He has he's playing for more than himself, right? Exactly. And that's not a knock before. I mean, chess chess is a very individual game. Players for a long time are playing for their own ambitions to prove to themselves and get as good as you individually can. And that transition that happens in anyone's life here, it's it's almost like having a family, right? Hikaru has this community, he has a family, right? And he feels like the, the love and joy that they have from his success. And I think that's what you're saying. He wants to bring that joy to everybody who's cheering for him, right? Yeah, it's, this is something much greater than, right. well, just, uh, just a game. So, uh, I'm, well, I'm looking forward, you know, to, uh, to the end of this one. Someone in chat asked, do you think he sees A5? I think... I think he does see a5. I think Hikaru, at this point, is using his clock as a weapon. Um, shout out to John Bartholomew, who often talks about that, chess content uh, and streamer. The point is, when you have a clock advantage, 
you manage it by play quickly when you know it, put pressure on them, think on the opponent's clock. That's the best way to get ahead is you actually work hard on their turn. And then in the critical moment, make sure you pause and go as deeply as you can before you commit to a line. Of course, no, no, I was just, I was looking at how much time does he have right now. So he has uh, 20 minutes left. And yeah. while well, his opponent is down to eight minutes. But I was thinking, could he possibly bring it like to the moment where like he has like f five minutes left. So he like he would play quickly as well. It's interesting, right? So I think that I, I would argue this. I think he knows that. He doesn't want this game to slip into forcing variations mm -hmm. while Raja still has eight minutes. He wants that to happen when Raja has four minutes, right? So I think it's important that you don't just play A5, A5, okay, he played A5, but the point is if he had just played A5 fast and we get in this bam, bam, bam forcing line and maybe Raja had already calculated it, he did himself a disservice, right? He needs to make sure that if you're going for a forcing line, you better be winning. Otherwise, keep this game going as long as you possibly can to get your opponent into time trouble. But once we again, like, what did we, did we look at King G5 here, yes? Yeah, that was our main thing. Uh, black can play King G5 mm -hmm. because there is, well, there is Knight F3, but there's no Knight F3 winning a rook mm -hmm. like, like one of the first lines we looked at. So. Um, I, think, I think King G5 is the most logical move. Mm -hmm. You can also play Rook A1 right away, by the way. Well, you could, but then, uh, Actually, did we analyze? No, this? we didn't. We didn't. <laughs> no, we analyzed. Well, what happens on rook a one right away? Because you can't you can't play b four without c four falling. Right, the bishop mm -hmm. is on it. No, but I think we had ah oh, c five. Then you take, but you you like you. you I, were did, analyzing I did analyze some. It was line another you, sequence c five c six. You know, so. I, I don't I don't know that it works, but we can try. Okay, we'll try it. C five. Mm -hmm. Ooh, the computer likes it. Okay. Yeah, that, that was why when you first suggested and you were saying, oh, but the pawn's hanging, I was like, actually, at some point, that might be a key point for white winning, is you have to give up your pawns, because all that matters is who gets a queen here, not not how many pawns you have left. And But wait, now, can I sacrifice the bishop? So bishop d5, check, I will take the pawn, and can I win the b3 pawn? Mm. No, rook a3, rook b8, or rook d3, or, or rook even, d3. yes, okay. So white's, white's in time, mm -hmm. so... So it doesn't work yet. But okay, rook a1, c5, rook a5, mm -hmm. c6. Bishop d5 is forced. Is it? Can you play rook c5? Or bishop d5 is forced? Well, I want to. I, I want bishop d5, but I was, I was trying to do it without sacrificing. No, but rook c5, uh, b4. Sorry, say that again? B4, before, simply okay. because I want to play before anyway, before B5. So. Ah, okay, that's that's very clear. Okay, you're right. So yeah, Rook C5 would allow B4, and again, everybody know that there isn't even a check here, which means you're moving the Rook, here comes B5, and two pawns are too many for a job off. So, so Bishop D5, King to... Hmm. H2, okay. H2, let's, we'll mm -hmm. just say get the King out of the way. In fact, I think that's important because I think I made a blunder when I played King H3 because now that I see it, then my Rook C5 works. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because now you actually are threatening to give up the bishop and check and win the pawn. Okay, so like King H2 is... So you play King H2 mm -hmm. to avoid that. And if Rook C5 now, you can still play B4 and go on to win. Mm -hmm. So so that's actually really key that the king is on H2. So I will sacrifice. But then if you're keeping the B pawn, you're completely winning. So let's see. Uh, can I uh, play something like, no, rook c5, knight d4, protecting the pawn? Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the, the point is that white is just holding. Mm -hmm. And remember, everyone, the reason we're fighting so hard to keep that pawn is because rook and knight versus rook is not a forced win. It is actually a, a draw, um, which, which is important. So you, you have to make sure all these variations, if you're Hikaru, end with you keeping that pawn. You can't allow this bishop to give itself up for two pawns. And I think that we have a move, or king h5. So he like he's using the same idea, like as king g5, king h5. He wants to play yeah. king g4 and create but, some. But I think it's just way too slow. No, 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 not here. Like it, we have the king h5 on the board. Oh, we're back. Mm -hmm. We're back to the game, you're saying. OK, yes, yeah, so he, sorry, I misunderstood. King h5 was played, just like king to g5. It has a threat. Mm -hmm. 
and the variation that we analyzed started with the A6, rook A1, like sort of similar, and then C5 that you proposed. Rook, e rook A1 and C5 here, that was the variation that you proposed. So. Yep. Oh, big moment for Hikaru. Still has a time advantage, right? Up 10 minutes on the clock, but is he going to win and quickly write his candidate's ship? What do you think, chat? Let's ask chat. You know, on a rare occasion, chat knows all the answers. No, I'm kidding. Chat, chat there's a lot of people in chat, so they often come up with, uh, with good answers, and, so and I'm curious. So it's like this, uh, you know, wonderfully big computer, like where we can ask him about the sense of life, yes? Yeah, the yeah. meaning of life. The, yes? the meaning, what is the meaning of life, chat? That's a different show. But okay, seriously, not just two. whether Hikaru <laughs> wins this game, but I'm curious if, if, if people have a feeling about whether you think he can catch lightning in a bottle, so to speak. Or maybe you don't even think it's lightning in a bottle. Uh, we, know, we know how talented Hikaru is and, and how much he wants it. So let us know what you think about his, his potential to not just win this game and, and turn things around. But we'll, we'll read some of your questions on air. So they got it. They put 42. <laughs> oh, a lot of win. Yeah, we see a lot of comments coming in. Give us a thoughtful answer. Get read on air. Who knows? Maybe I'll go full Oprah and start giving away diamond memberships for good answers. I do that sometimes. Really? I just like give away. I just like you get a diamond membership, then you get a diamond membership. Kids, it's good to know. Yeah, everyone said, so do you want a diamond membership? Uh, well, I think I have I, one. I know. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like another one, just let me know. Um, okay. What so, are the perks coming like with the diamond membership? What perks come yes. with the diamond? Yeah. There's a lot of perks, but you know, but we won't get into that now because then I'm, then I'm shilling. Right now I'm having fun, but I don't, I don't need to show you. You should know the perks of a diamond membership. There are so many, chat. Anyway, um, all right, king h5. a6 allows rook a1. Mm -hmm. So we've been here before, and we keep playing a6, and the computer keeps saying that that actually is not helping our winning chances after rook a1. Not that, not that you can't play it. But that means there must be something else that the computer thinks is the best move in this position that we haven't found yet. Is it? There's no reason to check because you don't want the king to go here. Exactly. So um... we got our first one right there, Almira. Oh. I don't think Hikaru will win the tournament, but he seems to be in a great space mentally, and that can do wonders. I agree. For your physical health, emotional health, spiritual health, it's good to be in a great space mentally. I agree. No, but jokes aside, he does seem to be in a great space. Here comes the flower power. <laughs> we had this from yesterday. We love it. Spam the flower power. If you are a Hikaru Nakamura fan or a subscriber to his channel, you probably have plenty of emotes to spam. Hikaru had this, I think. Hikaru has this, I think. It's a complex end game, but I think the time crunch is in his favor. I agree. I think Hikaru is going to get this one. I, 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 will, be, I will be surprised if Hikaru doesn't win this game. The whole candidate's another question, right? Rajabov will resign after Hikaru's pawn. B pawn gets to B7. Now that's calling your shot. That is an awkward call because the B pawn is far away from B7. So let's let, let's if that if Rem, Remy ZA ends up being right that somehow Rajabov resigns after the B pawn touches B7, you are getting a lifetime diamond membership. Okay? I just gave you like that's like a lot of value depending on how <laughs> old or young you might be. So because that is a Babe Ruth call. You're telling me Rajabov resigns the moment Hikaru plays the move pawn to b7. If that happens, you get a lifetime diamond membership. Booyah. Okay? Can we try it once again? Like, just leave the king on g4, so maybe a a6 once again. Okay. a6. Yes, rook a1, of course. So now, like, uh, how did we continue here? c5. We played rook d6 one time. The other time we yes, played c5. c5. Mm -hmm. So but it doesn't work here. It's not because it? of rook a6, I think. Rook a6, we get yes, similar so lines. Like we're winning, it's winning. because of this move. And here we come with h3 and rook h2. And if you're not careful, by ah, the way, of course. if you're not careful, like you might even, you know, okay, apparently it says why it's winning, but I was thinking maybe there's like a, a mating net here or something. No, no, you still have knight f5 here. Oh, knight f5. Yes, okay, so it's h3 no, no. check first. h3 check first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. So g4, c6, h3 check. So basically, this is a very 
brilliant defense. You know, we were thinking about this, like bringing the king to g4 and, well, to threaten h3, active defense pays out. It's like he created some difficulties yeah. for Hikaru to convert. Well, Hikaru knows he's, he's, he's got to be accurate here. He's, he's focused and serious, but this isn't the same kind of frustration from yesterday, yesterday's game. This is, he feels poised, I think, to get this one. We got another good comment here from Danny Mac, 2794. Hikaru should not be underestimated in this tournament. He has a knack of going on winning streaks. It's for sure. We've talked a lot about Jan Napomnesi being the streaky player, Almira. But Hikaru is also one of those guys who, it doesn't matter who he's playing. He's his own worst enemy and his own greatest asset, right? He's either on a roll based on whether he's in form or not in many ways. Well, I've seen people making illegal moves against Hikari. Like, basically, there's so much tension and pressure. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, like... Uh, Ooh, by the way, Hikaru plays this move King F2, which... Oh, my God, this is such a great move, actually. You know, like, first of all, the king is no longer on G2 because he's anticipating this King G4, H3. Yep. He is not, uh, well, defining the position yet. So, well, uh, well, what if Black just... By the way, this clearly must have been. We, we stopped looking at the engine move here. We're using the eval bar. I want to see how it plays out. But this this was clearly better than what we kept suggesting. We mm -hmm. kept suggesting a6, and the engine kept saying, no, this but is not if, what you want. Then what does he have in mind after king g4? So it's the same. Like, Yeah, that, that's what I'm wondering. Like, mm -hmm. What's the difference if king g4 is played? So, Why is this better? So can we play... Oh, I think I have... Ah, I, we no longer have the check with the bishop d5, so maybe a6 is good now. Is it, is it possible? So a6? a6, mm -hmm. rook a1. Mm -hmm. And c5 here? Or it doesn't win at all? I don't know. I had a different idea. Okay. I had a weird idea that because the king on g4 isn't threatening a tempo, and the king has left the bishop behind, you now have ideas with rook f8 to go just win another pawn. Ah, oh, we completely forgot about and, this. And you yes. can't, you, it's not a threat if the king's on h5. Ah, so now if king g4 after king f2, you simply play rook f8. And yeah. you're collecting another pawn. So Wait. king f2 sort of like, kind of like stops black in his tracks. So, hold on there, power ranger. King g4. <laughs> Rook f8, bishop c4. Can I sacrifice it there? You're sacrificing? You're obsessed with the sacrifice. Yes, but I want to make a draw. I don't it's know, it's like... okay. It's dynamite on c4. You're allowed to sacrifice mm -hmm. on c4 because it's explosive. Sorry. I, 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 I'm i sorry, chat. I'll be here all week. I, yeah, there you go. Explosive <laughs> sacrifices on c4. Rook takes c4. But okay, this is this has got to be winning, right? Yes, yeah. a six. Okay, yes. Yeah, and you can actually mm -hmm. take and defend at the mm -hmm. same time. Exactly. Yes. Okay, it's, it doesn't work. Wait, what? That didn't work. Oh, because the rook takes d four. Ah, yes, the you gave me the knight. <laughs> so what was what was the move? Oh, you have to play rook a eight. But this is not so. This is hilarious. Obvious, yes. And then you play a seven. Ah, and rook g eight check, of course. And you have rook so. g eight. Oh my God! Sorry, that but was hilarious. But you see, this is not. It's so obvious. It's like, not so obvious, know. and the table base shocked me back into my, shocked me back into my body here. I was, I was, you know, it's a long day. I'm kind of leaving, leaving it here, and here we go. It's uh, that was a very, very forcing line. Wow. Of course, it doesn't work. It, it is like uh, it's a sort of um, psychotic, you know, sacrifice. Like. Yeah, but we 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 have a very critical moment and a very nice idea from Hikar mm -hmm. that he found, and now Verjabov is down to four minutes. We're gonna we're gonna quickly sneak in a call a call out here. We haven't taken a break in quite some time, and we're not taking a break because we're gonna be here with all of you to the end. But uh, we had we had uh, an opportunity to remind you that you can compete in the Chess.com Global Championship, play alongside the world's best players, be a part of history, entering the largest tournament we've ever done. Qualifiers have player have hundreds and thousands of players every Saturday and Sunday as people qualify for their chance. All the way through July 31st, you can compete in these events. Also, to take part in cash prizes, head to go.chess.com slash CGC2022. Um, funny announcement. Uh, 
as we as we come back to the game. Sorry, head to go.chess.com slash CGC2022 for more info to sign up today, get verified, and start competing in the chess.com uh, global championship. But funny announcement, we, we have we've had these great king walks today. Lots of king action. We actually showed on the on the monitor if you missed it earlier, the legendary Nigel Short King walk up to H6. Fun fact, I'll just spoiler alert, Nigel Short accepted one of our wildcard invites, so he's gonna be playing in the chess.com global championship. Oh. We actually okay. made an effort and I won't reveal all the names that have accepted. I am so excited to announce the field when we get to the round of 64 because 32 players will qualify in the global championship. 32 are invited. And we didn't just do a one through 32 of the current list. We went to some of the champions and some of the players that people will be absolutely thrilled. <clears throat> Kromnik is another player who's accepted to play. And there are many others, and I'm not gonna reveal more, but Short, Kromnik, and many others are gonna be competing. It's gonna be epic. So just... seriously, the round of 64 is gonna be bananas. It's not just a, a current list. Not to say there's anything wrong with the world's current 32, we like them. But I'm very pumped about where we're headed with that. So, oh, Rook F8, was that on the board? Yep. Okay, or, so, well, now he, well, he, he did it. He did it, so he, he will win this game for sure. But what a nice, I mean, we couldn't solve it. We didn't, like, we kept trying a six, right? We were beating our head against the wall here, and he plays this really subtle king of two. What a trick, right? You get the king to, to G4. leave g6, mm -hmm. and when you do, and especially like you, like it's not under attack. Like h3 is not coming yep. with check. So king g4 and now rook f8. This is very subtle and I, I really love this idea. Super, super instructive and, and just super accurate, right? This is where Hikaru thrives. There was a comment earlier from Twitch chat that Hikaru thrives in these sort of slight edges that he can grind, get his, excuse me, get his opponents under time pressure. And guess what? That's exactly what he did. I just hope that I will not be the last one standing here. Like, <laughs> we're losing people. <laughs> we're losing people? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, well talk. I don't know. They promised Robert Hess to me. You know, you used it as a token, you know, to... <laughs> yeah, well, 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 we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's obviously a lot going on with, with uh, players, people wondering where Hammer is. But uh, anyway, we have, we have a lot going on here. We have, we have this final game here. Uh, who knows? Whether I don't think we'll have an interview with with either of the players. I'm being told no, we won't have any any post game interviews. But either way, we'll definitely catch the final moments of this game. So, man, what a bounce back victory this is going to be, Almira, for Hikaru. Well, I, I'm super excited. You know, yeah. it's like uh, this is such an interesting tournament yep. from like many points. Like if I. Just I, I was waiting for a move, so he was leaning towards the H pawn. So H three was played. Mm -hmm. He plays H three. So he's just giving uh, giving up the bishop. So he's, after Rook takes bishop and H two, mm -hmm. I guess Hikaru will have to give up the rook for the pawn. But no, first of all, I will give a check. Maybe I can. Oh, do you have you a, Do you have a square? In. Because if you go to four, then knight e two. Oh yeah, knight e two. And knight g three, maybe. Yeah, he takes the bishop. Mm -hmm. After h two, he's going to play check on g seven. And if the king touches down on f four. Because you cannot go to the h file, then I will check you. Yeah, yeah. If you so. if you go, yeah, just show that mm -hmm. real quick. Yeah, if the king goes to anywhere on the h file, the rook gets here with tempo, mm -hmm. and now you're stopping the pawn because when the when the king moves, you simply simply go corral it. So indeed, Hikaru sees it already. He's given the check on the board. And after king f4, we will see knight e2 check. Mm -hmm, and g3. The knock and nod, never a good sign to the opponent. Agreed, <laughs> agreed. That is a uh, knock and nods to himself, that he sees it. Knight to g3 comes. This protects the h1 square. Black is obviously would, would be happy to, to promote, but not, not if the queen is immediately taken. What a game, you know, how yeah. many difficult moves uh, Hikaru found, like yeah. a3, king f2, you know, not even mentioning, you know, the, like uh, the, um, the opening phase of this game. So um, he, yeah. he fully deserves not only this victory, but even like... Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you lose and you bounce back, yes. you get a win, right? You are a half a point behind the lead. It doesn't matter how you got their scoreboard, as the kids say, right? All that matters is what the score is. 
and it is still anybody's candidates. And what an entertaining first two rounds we've had, right? The show has delivered, the chess has delivered, and uh, will Rajabov resign or will he uh, play it out? I, I don't quite know. I mean, at this point, okay, he's, he's hoping for one trick. There's one way to go wrong here. If you put the king anywhere but g2, there was rook takes g3. Mm -hmm. I'll just show it, right? And then you get a queen, and that's a problem. So, uh, but Hikaru, of course, already aware of that, puts the king on g2. And after the next check, if it happens, oh, he took b3. If he checked again, the king could put itself on h1. Okay, a6, even. What? We can even play a6 here. Yeah, a6 looks good enough. Hikaru agrees with Almira. It's nice when the players agree with you. Right? From time to time. From time to time. <laughs> From time to time, it feels it's good. So, it's so polite, you know, on their behalf, behalf yeah. feels, you know, it's like... Yeah, when they're <laughs> winning and they agree with the moves you're suggesting, it feels good. <laughs> okay, A6 is played. I think I think we're going to get a resignation here from Rajabov uh, in just moments. And, you know, I, I want to I highlight one of the storylines to this game that could be forgotten because it, it... Of course, we'll probably get distracted here in moments with the resignation and the congratulations, but... Before we let this one go, we should definitely highlight that we were talking about Rajabov, who had this incredible career, as he has not won a classical chess game in three years. He's drawn a lot of classical chess games. It's really important when you consider the fact that in this game, he might have had a chance to put some pressure. There was a moment where Hikaru slipped a little bit mm -hmm. in the middle game, and rather than going for the forcing line, he played not to lose. Right, And we were talking about the psychology, how you could almost classify every player as those who love to win and those who hate to lose. And you know, obviously there's still plenty ahead in this tournament, but Almira, how much do you think Rajabov is, kicking, is, get, has, is going to be kicking himself about that? I mean, at some point, you have to push yourself in those critical moments to take a risk. As you keep saying, you have to bring it all to the candidates, right? And uh, what do you think about that? Well, I'm pretty sure about this, that uh, he will, well, he will, of course, analyze this game, but yeah. um, he will regret this bishop c6. Yeah. The moment where he could seize the initiative, probably. Like, I, I'm not sure, like, you know, once again, the, uh, we didn't analyze it deeply, so uh, maybe uh, the computer analysis will prove us wrong. I don't know. I mean, we were on the position for a while. There were many other... It wasn't just bishop c6. There was also rook d5. Yes, rook d5. There were three possible moves. There were three possible course. moves, and, and he, took, he took on a position willingly that only Hikaru could win. Now, he did so thinking he can hold. Nobody goes for a position they think yeah. they're going to lose, right? But you get what I'm saying, right? He took on a position that he thought he was going to hold, but he didn't have any chances to win, and it's just... It's an interesting decision, right? Because there was a moment where he could have been the aggressor, and he didn't take the opportunity, so... But, of course, it would have been unclear. I'm not saying he's winning, right? But it looked dangerous for Hikaru, and certainly it would have kept pieces on the board. So. And Hikaru, once again, is taking his time. Yep. So he's, he's completely winning. And he, he simply wants to be sure, once again. Yeah, you have to be, because there is an outside scenario of horrificness uh if you're Hikaru, where Black wins this pawn and then suddenly gets here and then rook takes pawn is a draw, right? So Hikaru has to be accurate right now. So how do you win this, Amir? Do you get the knight in to help? Yes, we, we need to have the knight. We, we need to, to bring the knight into right. play. So uh, how to do it? Uh, first of all, we have to secure that the king doesn't come to b6 as well. While our king is guarding the h pawn, it's OK. We can always play king h1 So on the check. So uh, knight f5, for example. Yeah, he goes Okay, he, he did it. Same idea, and after mm -hmm. takes, I think that... We cannot allow king b5, king b6. Yeah, this is a draw if black can take the pawn. So how do we do this? So you could actually play rook b7, and if king c5, knight to e7, and there's no way to get mm -hmm. king c6. So that's one way. I don't know how you went from there. Maybe it's knight to c8, knight b6 or something. Uh, where eventually you try to get a queen. But when you play knights, okay, let's have a look at this position. It's a very interesting endgame. 
Okay, so, oh, by the way, he does. So he does play rook to b7. I don't want to take us away mm -hmm. from the live board. So okay, if, let's uh, yes. We're waiting here, but yeah, we, we'll analyze it real quick with mm -hmm. with king. C5. King C5. I think mm -hmm. it was 97. Okay, 97, yeah, the computer agrees. Course, so that, yeah. that stops King C6. You know, black, black can make some moves. Mm -hmm. You know, you check and, you know, whatever. Maybe King D6. But the point is, I think the knight eventually comes to C8, which guards the pawn, and then you can play Rook B8. That's it. Okay, so that's the clear plan. The knight is going to complete its journey on the C8 square where it protects the pawn and allows the Rook to move forward. What do you think? You buy it? It's perfect. Perfect. Okay, our job here is done. Let's drop the mic and get out of here. There we go. We did it. Game over. Game over. Hikaru has the plan. He's as uh, he said, like once said in an interview. So like, finally, you could have as many seconds as you want. But the players are well playing the game, and yeah. they are working the magic. It's true. And, so and um, this is purely like this game. Especially in the end game, this is a pure magic. Yeah. Like, King F2 is probably the most difficult move in this game. That was a that was a brilliant move. I agree. King F2, and it was just a few moves back. We have the analysis where I'll show it. This this was the move of the game for sure, and a move that we were we were really struggling to come up with the right the right way to approach it. And he found it. And now we're back. I'll, I turn on the engine. Indeed, that was the engine best move. And he took a lot of time and found it. What a crazy find. And while we're, while we're bouncing back and, and have the analysis board up, I'm just going to leave us with that, that thought that we had. Again, it was, it was this position here, the decision to play queen to d5 for Rajabov, rather than the engine suggested best, bishop to c6. So that was a suggestion by the computer. Yeah. It's still unclear. But the, the computer, now that we're here, is suggesting that white just has to give back the pawn if you play it. And maybe that's what Rajabov didn't like, was takes and queen to b7. But, but here's the computer line, is that like the back rank is guarded, mm -hmm. and black has some, some pressure with this bishop. And if you just look at it from a practical point of view, this just doesn't look good for Hikaru. So OK, obviously, we're just speculating, and certainly the no, but I don't like it at all. You know, it's like white, I right? would be worried. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, it felt it felt scary, and because remember, we were kind of critical of the cards d6. Rook d1. Now that we're here, we can confirm was also the engine's best move. So you were right, Elmir. Rook d1 was the right move. And anyway, so it's just you know that critical decision to, for lack of a better way to summarize it, and you know our job is to edutain, educate, and entertain, and add a little drama. But it's a talking point for sure that he played not to lose. I mean, that's the truth. Yeah, it would be also interesting to, well, to find out, like, what Hikaru thinks about, yeah. like, all these choices and, um, well, to have his insights. So Din is Dina going to, um, to have him for an interview? Probably not. And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that later. Yeah, but the, uh, the situation, we're not sure, actually, with some, with some different news going on, so whether we'll have an interview or not. Uh, if we can, of course, we will. But we, uh, okay, we finally get 97. And will, when will Rajabov realize that there's no way to stop this plan that we highlighted of knight c8 and rook b8? Oh, right now. He I asked the question. Mm -hmm. Ask and you shall receive the answer. Both players smile. Rajabov has asked Hikaru a question. Here you are. The arbiter is staying on the other side of the board. By the way, look at that. They got the cue. So I, I, I wasn't crazy to say it out loud. Someone was watching the show and maybe asked the arbiter to go to the other side of the cameras. Thank you, mythical person who was watching the show and delivering messages downstairs. We appreciate your efforts. But. To come back to my question, I think you would have better chances against the Minotaur. Than Hikaru yes. in a slightly like in, worse position? No, in this position. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I, uh, that's an insult to my chest, but I will take it as a, as a compliment to my ability to run for my life from a Minotaur in a labyrinth. To fight. Wow. Well, um, huge win for Hikaru. We cannot understate this moment, right? He lost game one. 
in a game that he played well, right? I mean, he played really well against Fabiano at one point, was maybe even a little better as Black, uh, took a risky decision, ultimately lost, but it didn't knock him down. He perseveres, he's right back in it, tied for second with a number of other players with plenty of chances to become the candidate who competes for the World Chess Championship. So, clean win for Naka, as chat says, completely agree. Uh, a start to finish victory. Naka is so happy right now. He should be. He should. This is this is a. It's and not to say you wanted to lose game one, Elmira, but how big is it to win after you lose, right? Well, first of all, I really liked the way he played yesterday. Uh, we we talked about this yeah. game and uh, how complicated it was. And once again, like the level of like what is he showing, like yeah. is uh, really incredible. Yeah. Well, anyone can lose against Fabiano with Black, yeah. you know. But so. he came right back. Well, and he was even better at some point once again. So. Wow. Well, huge win for Ricardo Nakamura. You see, he was the only decisive game today in our four board view. And now you see it in the results table before your eyes report. And for Ruja Drew, that was also a very interesting battle. Shout out to the birthday boy for holding that endgame. Nakamura beat Rajabov. Nepomnishi and Karwana also had an interesting game due to Dingley Ren. Almira, your thoughts? The game of the day, obviously the decisive game, but any other thoughts here? Well, I nurture some regrets about the results of Nipomneshi against yeah. uh, Caruana, so I, I really want to have Fabi's uh, thoughts on this one, so yeah. he will certainly analyze it, and so uh, maybe we can ask him if he was considering the exchange sacrifice yeah. or like what is the computer evaluation of this position, so... Uh, for sure. This was such an interesting game, and it's like it, we didn't have we didn't have a chance like to uh, well to go through it till the end. So I, I feel like something something is clearly missing. Yeah. No. And for those who don't know the moment, there was a very interesting opportunity for that game to not end in a draw. Ultimately, they did choose to repeat moves to Pomashi and Carwana. So sure, surely we'll catch up with them at some point about that game, but. Uh, we see the results from today. What does that do for the standings? Uh, and where do the players now sit? Let's move over and take a look at our co-tournament leaders, Jan Nepomneshi and Fabiana Caruana, but followed closely by several players at one point, Almira, including the only winner of today, Hikaru Nakamura. Well, anyone can win this tournament still. Yeah. Once again, the race is open and... Uh... We are going to be here tomorrow. We, we surely are going to be here <laughs> tomorrow. And uh, let's, let's talk, about, talk about Sunday's matchups, right? Yes, I mean, I think, I think at the standings, it's weird to have Hikaru as the one on the bottom of all those tied for third, just because he was clearly the man of the day. But again, the tie breaks at this point are irrelevant uh, because what matters is that there are plenty of players with chances to win. Our head-to-head -head matchups for tomorrow, as well as their lifetime records against each other, are before your eyes. Well, all I have before my eyes is Firuja Nakamura. You know, this yeah, is... This is uh, oh, man, you're right. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is the game. I think, I think also Carwana Duda, from the perspective of, look at that 3-0 score. Of course, of right? course. But by, by the way, how sh let's, let this sink in real quick. Fans watching all around the world, from Twitch to YouTube to everywhere you are. Firuja and Nakamura have never played a classical game of chess. I knew that coming in, and it was one of the talking points, but seeing it now, before it's like dawning on me, because I have commentated on Ferruja versus Nakamura games so many times, right, over the last several years. These, these are arguably the two best bullet players on the planet. Okay, all due respect to Magnus Carlsen, right? They've had incredible matches. Uh, you know, at one point during the peak of, like, the, the, the chess boom and pog champs, I mean, Hikaru was just streaming random matches with Ferruja on a Wednesday to 36,000 viewers. It was like People love to watch these two throw down. Ferruja and Nakamura is, is the epic battle of titans, and we have never seen them playing classical chess. I, I want to go to bed right now so I can wake up and tomorrow comes faster. <laughs> I'm like a kid, a kid on Christmas here. That is going to be epic. Cannot wait. So, are we done? I think today? we are. Almir, you, you did an amazing, amazing job. Uh, we'll remind everybody real quick of when it will be. Of course, it is 3 o'clock local time here in Madrid, 6 a.m. on the West Coast, almost midnight if you're in Sydney, Australia, down under. 
I only slipped. I only slipped into that accent a couple times today. I want to have a few countries yeah. like added in this memo. Okay, like let us know if you have if you have countries you'd like us to add. We definitely will. Almero Moldova, for sure. Moldova, like the country where I was born. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we will. So we'll add some countries. But either way, right now, just mark whatever time zone you are closest to. And for my for my partner here, Almira Skripchenko, for myself, International Master Danny Ranch, and everyone working super hard here every day. We're going to continue the coverage. Round three for the Madrid 2022 Candidates Tournament. We'll be here tomorrow, and we will see you then.